Welcome to this class. This is a class on the sciences of the Quran. There's a text out there uh, called Erdem al Quran uh, by a German scholar named von Denfer. I highly recommend um, that you obtain a copy of this text. Uh, it's not required, but highly, highly recommended. If you don't have it today, that's okay. So, uh, the text that, the, the seminal text in, in Ulum al Quran, the sciences of the Quran, the most famous text is by Imam Jalaluddin al Suyuti. This text is called Al Itqan, Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran which is uh, translated as the perfect guide to the sciences of the Qur'an. And it's been translated, uh, Hamid Algar and others. I think it's in two or three volumes, but it's quite robust. It's a little difficult to follow. So what von Denfer does with this text, Ulum uh, al-Qur'an, is he really tries to make a good abridgment of that text. That's easy to follow for students, for, uh, for students at, the be at the beginner's level. So he's done a service. Uh, for us in that regard. Uh, when, when we say sciences of the Qur'an, we're not talking about like you know, geography in the Qur'an, biology, we're not talking about these, these natural sciences. We're talking about the word science um, uh, in Latin means a knowledge, knowledges or different aspects uh, related to the Qur'an. So, for example, today we're talking about uh, the concept of wahi, of revelation, right? So it's important to understand what is revelation, what is the nature of wahi. And then uh, our next meeting, we're going to be talking about, inshallah, the compilation of the Qur'an. When was it compiled? Um, how was it done? Who did it? What are the early uh, masahif or uh, codices, or manuscripts of the Qur'an? And then we also talk about things like Asbab al nuzul which is um, basically the historical contextualizations of many of the ayat of the Qur'an. So why was a certain verse revealed? What is the immediate cause of this ayat? Asbab al nuzul And then we talk about things like Nasq, or abrogation within the Qur'an. And this is something that is controversial, but most of the ulama say there are certain verses in the Qur'an that cancel other verses, right? So we'll talk about that, the extent of that, and why that's even in the Qur'an. <coughs> so today we're talking about wahi. And wahi, wahyun, wow, ha, ya, logatan, linguistically, right? So words have definitions, logatan, and fil istilah. Linguistically and technically. So, wahyun, linguistically, means to signify something quickly. To signify something. Wahyun. So, for example, if I do this, I've signified something. What have I, what have I signified? Peace. Peace. Good. So, it's immediate signifier of a concept or a meaning. Right? If I go like this. Anyone? Hang loose. Hang ten? Is that what I was going to say hang loose. And this? Okay, or? Perfect. Huh? Perfect. Perfect. Or it's a, a satanic symbol as well. 666. Yeah, so you'll see people that are, and it's a real thing, the Church of Satan. It's headquartered out of San Francisco. It's one of their hand. There's another thing they do, but it's a, it's a curse. I'm not going to do it, but... So this is, this is the linguistic definition of wahi. To do something with your hands, or with your body, or with your eyes that signifies some sort of meaning quickly. And this is how it's used in the Quran. If you look at Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 11, we are told, فَخَرَجَ عَلَى That Zakaria alayhi salam, when he was given the Bushra, the good news of Yahya alayhi uh, salam, he took a vow of silence, which is something that they used to do in the previous uh, Umam. Uh, and when he came out of his sanctuary, فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ He gestured to them somehow, uh, signifying them or commanding them to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening. Right? Now in the Quran, 
Auha, the verb auha, which is form four, a causative form, also means to teach or inspire or reveal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in Surah Nahal, verse 68, 1668, ila nahli buyuta, that your Lord inspired the bees. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring, is giving wahi to animals, to bees, to build houses uh, in the mountains. It also denotes satanic or demonic inspiration in the Quran. The same verb, awha, is used. So for example, you see like one eye symbolism everywhere in pop culture. You know, this isn't some, you know, conspiracy that all these actors are involved in. This is probably satanic uh, inspiration of some sort. That's why the one eye is so prevalent in our pop culture. And of course, the Prophet says that he said that the Antichrist is awa, is one eyed. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is Surah uh, An'am, Surah number 6, 121. Inna that indeed the demons uh, inspire their minions uh, to uh, dispute with you. Right? So same verb is used. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, will use this verb awha in the Quran when inspiring non-prophetic people, non-prophetic human beings, so people that aren't prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah uh, uh, 111, that remember when I inspired the disciples of Isa alayhi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave wahi to the disciples of Isa alayhi but these are non-prophets. Why are they non-prophets? Because the Prophet وسلم, says in a hadith that is rigorously authenticated in Bukhari about Isa السلام, he said, Laysa baini wa bainahu nabiyun. There is not between uh, me and him a prophet. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this verb awha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, 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 about the mother of Musa السلام, in Surah Al Qasas, ayah number seven, ila ummi Musa an and we inspired or we revealed to the mother of Moses to nurse him, to nurse Musa alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa taala says, Awha to the mother of Musa, and she's called Ummu Musa. The only woman named in the Quran is Maryam alayhi salam, but according to the Torah, her name is Yahoved. Allahu alam. Uh, and there's an opinion uh, that she's actually a prophet, right? There's a minority opinion, but it's an opinion that Imam Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Hazm, that there are female prophets and she's a mother. <coughs> now, technically, fil istilah, what is wahi? The ulama say, the technical definition of wahi is kalamullah al munazzalu Kalamullah al munazzalu So the sent down, literally, sent down speech of God, the speech of God which has been sent down, ala nabiyyin min anbiya'ihi, upon a prophet from his prophets, upon a prophet. The speech of God which is sent down upon a prophet. This is the technical definition of wahi, we say theological definition of wahi. However, the ulama, they do make a, dis a distinction between wahi, wahyun, which is revelation given to prophets, and iha'un. There's another word called iha. So, alif, ya, ha, alif, hamza. Iha. And iha is non prophetic revelation. So in the Quran, for example, and both of these concepts, both of these are uh, infinitives, both of these infinitives are denoted in the Quran by the verb awha, 
So they share a verb, but they're different concepts, right? So when we read the word wahyun, right, uh, it is referring to prophets, prophetic revelation. Wahy is only for prophets. Iha'un is for non-prophets. Um, another word for iha is ilham, ilham. And we'll talk about uh, ilham. Uh, but again, both of these concepts are denoted by the verb awha in the Quran. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, going back to that ayah in Al-Ma'idah, وَإِذْ أَوْحَيْتُ إِلَى الْحَوَارِيِّينَ أَوْحَيْتُ That we inspired or revealed to the prophets, this is uh, to the uh, disciples, this is إِحَاءٌ or إِلْهَامٌ This is not prophetic revelation. This is not wahi. The ulama say, wahi is only for prophets. This term wahi. <clears throat> the ulama also mentioned that prophetic wahi, so revelation given to a prophet, may be religious and theological in nature or not. Right? There may be some element of as some sort of worldly affair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to reveal to a prophet. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, fulka bi a'yunina wa wahyina to Nuh alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, build the ark under our eyes, which means under our protection, and under our inspiration, under our wahi. So Nuh alayhi salam was given wahi as to how to build a good ship. Right? Because he didn't know how to build a ship. The ulama also mentioned that Dawud alayhi salam was given wahi as to how to make uh, uh, armor or chain mail. And other prophets were given wahi uh, with respect to things like medical science or mathematics. Allahu Akbar. Now, um, the ulama also say that there's three types of wahi. There's three types of wahi. Again, when I say wahi, I'm talking about revelation given to prophets. Okay? Prophetic revelation. Broadly speaking, three types. The first type is called internal perception. Internal, or you can say interior, interior perception. This is when meanings, meanings, ma'ani, meanings are perceived in the heart of a prophet. Okay? No voice is heard. And then the prophet, him or herself, will choose the words to articulate that meaning. So there's no literal dictation here. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the Prophet to marry a certain woman. Right? So he'll have meanings descended to his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But no, no kalimat, there's no words. So when he awakes from his sleep, he knows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is giving him this type of wahi, internal perception. And this is done either with an angelic medium or without. Either through Jibreel alayhi salam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place meanings, ma'ani, directly into the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself. Internal perception interior perception. The second type of wahi is called interior locution. Interior locution. This is internal auditory dictation. So, and this is also with an angelic mediation. So the angel, Jibreel will come to the Prophet and he'll give words to the Prophet the Prophet will hear them internally, the words of the angel. And these are specific words. They're not just meanings. They're actual words. And the Prophet will remember these words and then recite them. This is called interior locution through angelic mediation. Interior locution through angelic mediation. Again, this is when the Prophet is when Jibreel comes to the Prophet and gives him an internal auditory dictation. So the Prophet hears actual words internally. And when he uh, comes out of his state of receiving the revelation, he will repeat the words. And then scribes would eventually write them down, and it becomes Quran. 
Now, another type of interior locution is without an angelic mediation. Without an angelic mediation. And this is the, the highest, most exalted type of wahi. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives words, actual words, to the Prophet sallallahu without an angel. And uh, the ulama say that this happened a, a couple of times. The most famous is when the Prophet Sallallahu was at the base of the Arsh beyond the Sidratul Muntaha on the night of Laylatul Isra and Mi'raj where Jibril Alayhi Salam did not pass. So he's in, beyond the seventh heaven at the base of the throne. Jibril Alayhi Salam could not pass. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى I inspired my servant whatever I inspired without an angelic mediation. So Allah gave him words. What are these words? Ibn Mas'ud mentions Khawatim al-Baqarah, the end of Surah al-Baqarah. The last two ayahs of Surah al-Baqarah, Aman al-Rasul. This contains the essential aqidah of the Muslims. Right? These two ayat were placed directly into the heart of the Prophet sallallahu without Jibril alayhi salam. This is called interior locution without angelic mediation. Another word for it is mosaic theophany. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would speak to Musa alayhi salam. So any type of mediation. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا There's something very special. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Nisa, Ayah 164. There's something very, very special about how Allah spoke to Musa. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Taklima is a infinitive maf'ul mutlaq, which is stressing the verb, very special way, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also spoke in that way to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam on some occasions. And there's other occasions as well we'll talk about. Okay, so again, interior perception, going back to the first kind of wahi, interior perception, the, the Prophet is not receiving kalimat, He's not receiving words. He's just receiving ma'ani, meanings, right? Meanings. I need to do this. I need to do that. This is what Allah is inspiring me to do, right? And then he will articulate to his sahaba what he needs to do, what Allah is commanding him to do. So this is not Quran. This is hadith, right? But interior locution, with or without angelic mediation, is when he's actually receiving kalimat, Allah is giving him words, actual words. Right? And the Prophet وسلم, will repeat those words, and Allah is ordering him, Jibreel is ordering him to recite these words in prayer. And this is the Quran. The third type of wahi is exterior locution. So we have interior perception, interior locution. Now we have exterior locution. And this is always through an angelic mediation. It's always through an angel. This is when an angel comes to the Prophet So this is exterior auditory dictation. An angel comes in the form of a human being to the Prophet and says, Quote, say this, and the Prophet repeats. Right? Oftentimes the angel would come um, in a form that was seen by other people. Sometimes the angel was not seen by other people. We'll talk more about this in Uh Sometimes the angel would come to the Prophet in his actual form, on rare occasion, in his actual form. There's a verse in the Quran, Surah 42, verse 51. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشِرٍ أَيُكَلِمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا It is not befitting for a human being that Allah should speak to him except by Wahi, and the ulama say here, the meaning is interior perception, the first type. Aw, or min warai hijab, or from behind a veil. And the ulama say this is interior locution. God is veiled, right? God is veiled, but there's no mediation. Aw, yursila rasulan fa yuhiya bi idnihi mayyasha. Again, chapter 42, verse 51. The first part of the ayah is talking about interior perception. The middle part of the ayah is talking about interior locution. 
in the last part of the ayah, or we send to him a messenger, meaning angel, who inspires him by his permission, whatever he wills, exterior locution. Any questions on these three types of wahi? The latter two are Quran. The first one is hadith. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Can you just repeat the ayah that you referenced? Yes, verse 42, verse 51. 4251. So that's a shura, verse 51. Yes, sir. Are there any more examples of second type of internal locution without an angel? Yeah, we'll talk about that, fellow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I just had a question. Interior locution with angelic mediation and exterior locution. What is the difference between those? Exterior locution is when uh, an angel would come okay. in human form. So the Prophet oh, okay. would hear with his ears. Right? It's external auditory dictation. Like in the cave. Iqra. Ma'ana biqari. It's external locution. Right? We'll talk more about this in a minute here. So these methods of wahi are indicated in the hadith. Is Hadith al Bukhari, Kitab al Wahi. The first book of, of Bukhari is called Kitab al Wahi. There's 97 Abwal in Bukhari. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahyanan Ya'atini, he's talking about the Wahi. Ahyanan, Ahyanan Ya'atini, Mithlu Salsalat al Jaras, wa huwa ashadhu alayya, Fayafsimu anni wa qad wa'itu ma qal, wa ahyanan yatamathalu li al madaku rajulan. So he says, sometimes the revelation comes to me, like the ringing of a bell, like the ringing of a bell, and that's the most severe on me physically, until it abates when I understand what it is saying. And sometimes it comes to me, sometimes the revelation comes to me in the form of an angel taking the form of a man. So the first part of the hadith is interior, right, locution. The second part of the hadith, an angel comes exterior locution. So what is this ringing of bells? So there's actually, according to Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, there's 46 ways in which the Prophet ﷺ received the wahi. 46 different ways. One of them is the ringing of bells. <clears throat> Some of the ulama say this means, this is how he described it, sallallahu But in reality, it was the fluttering of the angel's wings. This is an opinion from the Urdama. Ibn Arabi says it was continuous, it was coming from all directions, but it's something he's hearing internally. Right? We'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, inshallah. And some of the Urdama say that uh, the huruf al muqatta'at, so the disjointed letters, right, like Yasin, Hamim, Kafaya, Ain Saad, that one of the practical functions of these letters was to focus the Prophet when he's receiving internal elocution. So you can imagine the Prophet is very busy in his life, so Allah wants to focus him. One way of focusing him is to bring in a human being in front of him who introduces himself as an angel. And quote, say this, okay, he repeats, right? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him these letters to focus him. Hamim. So he hears this initially. So it's, it's, it's vibrations that turn into words, and he understands that it's revelation. Now, why Hamim? Why Yasin? Allahu Akbar. Right? There's different theories about that. Nobody really knows. It's one of the mysteries of the Quran. There are some ulama who have ta'wil, mystical exegesis, explaining what these letters mean. But all of them say, Wallahu Akbar. Nobody really knows. In the hadith of Aisha and Bukhari, she says, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ يَنْزِلُ عَلَيْهِ الْوَحِي فِي الْيَوْمِ الشَّدِيدِ الْبَرَضِ وَإِنَّ جَبِينَهُ لِيَتَفَصَّدُ عَرَقًا She said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ receive the revelation on a severely cold day, and indeed his forehead was dripping with sweat. So, <coughs> there was a, a physical manifestation. Uh, physical manifestation. There were things happening to him, uh, obviously, physically, when the revelation was descending. So he would sweat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would turn pale, sometimes begin panting. Uh, some of the 
um, Orientalist said that he was having seizures. This is um, obviously false. When someone has a seizure, they fall to the ground, they're shaking, they're foaming at the mouth, and they don't remember anything. I actually had experience with this. Not me having a seizure, but I had an elderly boss when I was working at a place called Mailboxes, etc. I think it's called the UPS store now. This is way back in like before Y2K. <laughs> And my, it was like, you know, we're closing, and my boss, she starts shaking, going into a seizure. And I actually caught her. She was about to like, on the side of the, the table and everything. So I caught her. I put her on the ground. She was shaking. She was foaming at the mouth. And then the ambulance, can't call the, the ambulance. And uh, I remember they asked her, do you know this guy? And they pointed to me, and she said, no. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what year is it? She said, oh, I, I know this one. Can't even know the year, right? So these are not. This is not you know, epilepsy. This is, he's not having seizures. Some of them. You don't have a seizure and then you come out of it, and you're reciting Surah <laughs> Rahman suddenly. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. But there were some physical things that were happening to him, right? Because the weight of the wahi, right? Inna sanulti alayka qawlan taqila. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran that this speech is very weighty. Right? And he said, mm-hmm. You know, he had some gray hair, not a lot of gray hair, not like me, a lot of gray hair, but his chemical imbalance. Uh, but because his constitution was so perfect physically, I mean, at 60 years old, he looked like he was in his 30s. But he had a little, in his 60s, he had a little bit of gray hair here on the temples. And even Hermas says 11 or 18 hairs. But he said, I got these gray hairs from the weightiness of the revelation of Surah Hud, Surah Hud, which talks about the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroying these city-states that disobeyed him, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very weighty for the Prophet sallallahu and other, he said, well, akhawatuha, and other, like his, his sister surahs, others that describe the, the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he would receive the revelation, if he was sitting on a conveyance, the conveyance would kneel. He was sitting on his camel, the camel would kneel. Uh, one time, Abu Bakr said that um, he was sitting next to the Prophet وسلم, and the wahi descended upon the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr's leg was under the Prophet's leg. And he said that, I thought my leg was going to be crushed under his leg. And Zayd said something similar as well. In the hadith of Ahmad, uh, he said, it feels like my soul being extracted. Sayyidina Umar said he heard the humming of bees coming from his face when the Prophet was receiving revelation. So Umar, he was very close to the Prophet when the wahi descended and he heard, he said it sounded like bees humming. And, and Sayyidina Umar is special. I mean, he, he's, uh, he has a, he's very, he's very prophetically attuned, Sayyidina Umar. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu said in a sound hadith in Tirmidhi, if there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Sayyidina Umar. In fact, on one occasion, and some say two occasions, the Prophet ﷺ is receiving wahi, uh, Surah Al-Mu'minun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the creation of the human being. And the Prophet ﷺ is repeating this. Before the Prophet can get to the end of the ayah, Sayyidina Umar would finish it. The first time it's revealed, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ And the Prophet said, yes, that's the end of it. This is how in tune Sayyidina Umar is with the, with the wahi. <clears throat> so you have the ringing of bells. Another method or another way would come to the Prophet It is an angel coming as a human being. We talked about this, this form of exterior locution. Sometimes the angel would take the form of a companion named Dihya al-Kalbi. And this has been the object of much you know, ridicule by you know, Orientalists and anti-Muslim polemicists. You know, and they say, well, this guy was obviously pretending to be an angel. But why Dihya al-Kalbi? It's because Dihya was extremely beautiful. Extremely beautiful companion. And other forms as well. If you look at the, uh, the hadith of Jibril uh, this, uh, Sayyidina Umar said, وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ Jibril alayhi salam came into a form of a human being. We did, no one, none of us knew who he was. He was an unknown to, to any of us. <coughs> the dominant opinion is that uh, the angel that brought the wahi to the Prophet ﷺ was always Jibreel ﷺ. And 
That's the dominant opinion, based on the ayah of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 97, 297. قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِجِبْرِيلَ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلُهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Say, whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, for indeed he brings the revelation, uh, or brings the revelation to your heart by the permission of God. Some scholars also say that during the Fatra, so there was a, a span of time in which the Prophet ﷺ did not receive the revelation. Right? Uh, some say it's 15 days, some say up to six months, right? Allahu alam, the exact length of time. Uh, some say up to three years. The ulama say during this time, Israfil would come and visit the Prophet ﷺ. And Ibn Hajar says that he would give the Prophet wahi, but non Quranic wahi, just for consolation, just to give him the peace of mind, just to reassure him that everything is okay. That Israfil would visit the Prophet. <clears throat> the Prophet said that this method of exterior locution, wahua ahwanuhu alayya, this is the most this is the easiest for me. So when it's exterior locution, it would be easy for the Prophet physically. But when it's interior, it would it would be tough on him physically, especially certain suwar of the Quran. That's describing the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the only things that, you know, that um, um, considerably you know, aged him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, he's in perfect physical appearance. <clears throat> and it's part of our aqidah to believe that he's the most beautiful of human beings, even more so than Yusuf alayhi wa <clears throat> Now, uh, as we said, Ibn Hajar said, there's 46 methods of the wahi. So we mentioned ringing of bells, an angel coming as a human being. Um, another one uh, is an angel in original appearance. So this happened again two or three times where Jibreel salam, would give the Prophet salam, wahi in the form in which Allah created Jibreel salam. So the most, one of the most famous is, you know, the very beginning of, uh, towards the beginning of the, uh, right after the bi'atha, the commissioning of the Prophet Sallallahu came to the Prophet Sallallahu in his true form and gave him wahi. And again, during the mi'raj, during the mi'raj, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala manifested Jibreel Alayhi Salaam in his true form. Another method, the fourth one, true dreams. Arubya as-sadiqa. The Prophet said that when he said a true dream is one forty-sixth of nabuwa. Right? A true dream is one forty-sixth of nabuwa because there's forty-six ways in which prophets receive wahi. One of them is arubya sadiqa. The believer has arubya sadiqa. It's not prophecy. It could be ilham. Ilham or Iha, as we said before. But we don't use the term Wahi unless we're talking about a prophet. And the truest of dreams are at Suhoor time. Astaqarru'ya bil ashar, Just before Fajr. The truest of dreams, according to the Prophet Sallallahu They heard him say because that's when the Prophet Sallallahu was born, during this time. And you should, if you have a good dream, you should write it down, because you'll forget. Write it down immediately and have it interpreted. There's a science of dream interpretation. <clears throat> okay. So a true dream. And he would have dreams, true dreams, before and after the bi'atha. The bi'atha is his commissioning as a prophet on Laylatul Qadr when he was 40 years old, right? On Jabal al Nur, the episode of Iqra, right? That's that's when he was commissioned as a prophet. But even in his thirties, or even earlier, he would have true dreams, which is an indication that he's already a prophet before age forty, just not commissioned as a prophet. And in the sound hadith, when did you become a prophet? When Adam was Bain al Ruh like Jasad. When did you become a prophet? 
when Adam was between soul and body, I was a prophet. <clears throat> okay. And of course, there's miracles attributed to him, even as a child. These are called irhas, irhas, you know, pre-prophetic or pre-bi'atha miracles, like the story of Bahira, the monk, when the Prophet ﷺ was with the caravan and Bahira noticed that trees were bending to shade him, right? A pre-prophetic miracle. Um, so the dream of a prophet is always true. The dream of a prophet is always true and it's always wahi. For the rest of us, a dream can be one of four things. A dream can be from the nafs. It's called nafsani or egotistic dream, right? So, you know, if you if you read some something haram or see something haram before you go to sleep, you probably see it in your dream. This is from the nafs. If you go to sleep very, very hungry, you probably see some food. You're very thirsty. You'll be in a waterfall, you go swimming. <laughs> this is from the nafs. Uh, then you have something called um, an angelic dream, or uh, malakani, coming from an angelic presence. And you have shaitani, right? Something coming from a demonic presence. That's why when you go to sleep, you should sleep with wudu, you should sleep on your right side, and there's certain ad'iya, prophetic invocations of the Prophet. They're very, very short. Uh, if you want to be more ambitious, recite Ayatul Kursi, uh, recite Qul Huwa Ahad three times. Just while you're falling asleep, recite and fall asleep in that state. And inshallah, have, and have a good intention. Have an, make an intention uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you a ru'ya of the Prophet sallallahu in your sleep. <coughs> And then there's uh, divine Rabbani dreams. Rabbani. Like if a believer sees the Prophet sallallahu this is Rabbani. Right? This is a, is a true dream. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift to a believer. Right? Shaitan cannot imitate the Prophet sallallahu There's even an opinion that Shaitan cannot imitate any Prophet. So any Prophet you see. Um, <laughs> Some of the ulama even say, if you see someone that doesn't look like the Prophet but introduces himself as the Prophet, and you have a strong inclination that it is the Prophet, then it's him. He's trying to tell you something. Like one of my teachers, he saw the Prophet uh, with a long white beard. I mean, he didn't have a long white beard. One of my teachers saw him with no beard. Right? And he was disturbed when he woke up, he said, you know, he didn't have his, his sunnah, where's was the beard? So he got it interpreted and he said, the Prophet is trying to tell you to follow sunnah because a believer is the mirror of a believer. He's reflecting a fault in you. He wants you to see it on him. Because the mirror never, you never get mad at a mirror. It just reflects the truth. It never insults you. It tells you the truth. Right? If it's straight and it's clean, it'll tell you the truth. Right? So the Prophet wasalam, is trying to give you a message be in the But the dominant opinion here again is that no, um, he, if it doesn't look like him, it's not him. It has to look like him. <clears throat> okay. Um, so true dreams. And Aisha said, "Awwalu ma budi'a bihi Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam al wahi al ru'ya saliha fi nomi fakan la yara ru'ya illa jaat." She said that the first type of wahi that came to the Prophet ﷺ was true dreams in his sleep. And then she said that he never saw a dream except that it, uh, except that it came like the break of day. In other words, it always came true. And you can count on his dream coming true as much as you can count on the sun rising in the morning. His dreams would always come true. It was a dream that informed him of what Labid. Labid was a Jewish mage. A mage is a uh, practitioner of black magic, called a mage. So the Prophet ﷺ had a, a dream, Finnaum, in his sleep, of what Labid had done to him, and also Allah inspired him, gave him wahi, 
as to how to deal with breaking uh, what he had done to him. And this was obviously after the Beratha. And this story is controversial as well. There's not a lot of strong hadith support for the story. It's mentioned in Sirah literature. But it, it seems to come into conflict with Wallahu ya'asimuka min al nas that Allah gives you ismas protected you from the people. So there seems to be some problems with the story. <coughs> but apparently, uh, this mage had gotten some of the hair of the Prophet. And the Quran does talk about those who blow on knots, right? The last two surahs of the Quran are called Al Mu'awid, Al Mu'awid the Tain, right? Um, and these, I, these two surahs were revealed on the occasion of this, of this episode, according to the Asbab al Nuzul literature. He got some of the hair of the Prophet and he tied seven knots into it and he threw it into a well. And the Prophet said, after blowing some incantations upon the hair or upon the knots, something that is mentioned in his, in his, in this, whatever this text was that he was using, this mage. And so the Prophet said, he noticed that you know, his, his memory was failing. It played with his memory a little bit. And then he told Sayyidina Ali to stand over the well and recite the last two surahs of the Quran. Surah Al Falak wa Nas, and there's um, uh, there's seven ayat. No, there's eleven ayat. Sorry, eleven knots, eleven knots in the air. And there's eleven ayat in these last two surah. And eleven sort of a it's sort of a, a a sacred number for the practitioners of black magic. So we use the number to sort of counter that. So we do things 11, you know, 33, that's to counter the evil, the satanic evil. We use it for a different way. So numbers are like a sword. Uh, you could use a, or a knife, I should say. You could use a knife to pair an orange, or you can to kill someone. Numbers are the same type of thing. So some of the Arunama, they caution against getting into gematria, which is like the science of numbers, and using numbers to do things to people. <coughs> anyway. Okay, and then we have direct discourse. We talked about this. So what is direct discourse? This is interior locution without an angelic mediation. And the brother asked about, are there other instances in which the Prophet ﷺ was given karimat by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without Jibreel alayhi salam? We mentioned one, Khawatul uh, al-Baqarah. Imam al mentions Surah 93 and 94 also were given by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet <laughs> without an angelic mediation. And then the one that comes after, And these were given to him by Allah when he was asleep. Imam al mentions. And these two surahs are always recited uh, together. Ibn Mas'ud would always recite these two surahs together. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Prophet وسلم, he said, Inna inna ro ruh al qudusi, inna ruh al qudusi nafafa fi ro'i. Indeed, the spirit of sanctification inspires my thinking. So here he's talking about interior perception, inspiration in the heart uh, with a medium interior perception. So these are, again, ma'ani. Indeed, the spirit of sanctification, most of the Urma say, Jibreel alayhi salam, inspires my thinking. His thoughts, right, are a result of the wahi he's receiving. His, even his thinking process is wahi. Eventually, everything he says is wahi. Wa ma yantiku anil hawa in huwa illa wahi yuha allamahu shadid al quwa Everything he says is why. <clears throat> now let's talk about the types of iha un. Iha, or we said, um, uh, iha is non prophetic revelation. Non prophetic revelation. <coughs> the first type is called kashf, kashf, kashfun. This translated as some sort of disclosure or unveiling. Right? Mukashafa, the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation is called Al Mukashafa. 
So the ulama say that kashf relates to something, relates to sensory abilities, something directly visible, right? Um, for example, Sayyidina Umar one time was giving a khutbah, and uh, in the middle of the khutbah he said, Ya Sariya al-Jabal, Ya Sariya al-Jabal. And everyone kind of looked around. Who's Sariya? Well, Sariya's not here. And then the, the tradition says Sayyidina Ali was laughing because Sayyidina Ali knew what was happening. So they asked him after and he said, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a vision of the army I had sent towards Persia. The leader of the army was a man named Sariya. And I was warning him that on the other side of the mountain there was people waiting to ambush them. Right? So this is kashf. This is a type of unveiling. Right? Something that's related to sensory abilities. Something you can prove by a discovery of some sort. So this, these are given to saints and righteous people. Right? An example from the life of the Prophet ﷺ is one day he walked out and his camel was gone. Uh, so a Jewish man passed by and he said, look, look at your Prophet. He doesn't know where his camel is. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, I only know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells me. And then at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately told him, he said, ask for my camel, it's in such and such place, and it's, it's next to this tree. And he described it perfectly. So, kashf, and then the second type of iha is called ilham. Ilham. Fa'alhamaha fujuruha, fujuraha wa taqwaha, qad aflaha man zakaha, qad khaba man dassaha. Ilham. Ilham uh, is intuitive knowledge, intuitive ilm, which is infused upon the heart. Right? But Khidr alayhi salam, Allah says, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا So ilm al-laduni, ilm al-laduni is a type of ilham, knowledge that's given to a non-prophet. That's true knowledge, true knowledge. So the ulama say that, that ilham is higher than kashf because it's closer to the station of a prophet. Ilham. Ilham is a type of ma'rifa that's given to a saint. Ma'rifa is gnosis of God, true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's given to someone as a gift without reading books. Allah infuses it upon the heart of a wali. Some of the other stories of the awliya. There are some awliya that were known to never study books, but they teach classes. They asked them, when, when did you study? Said, in my sleep. In my sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me shah, opens my heart, gives me knowledge. This is possible, mungkin. <clears throat> okay. Imam Shadri, he said, this is according to Imam Sha'rani's Tabaqat al Kubra. Imam Shadri, he said, if your unveiling, if your kashf contradicts the Quran and Sunnah, then hold fast to the Quran and Sunnah and ignore your unveiling. Or if somebody else's unveiling contradicts the Quran and Sunnah. Why do you say that? Because there are, there are ways in which kufar, you know, um, seem to replicate kashf. It's called shamanism, right? Calling on jinn, for example. Jinn can give you information. There are secret societies whose goal is to uh, you know, domesticate, if you will, jinn, to bring them things, do favors for them. They have certain passwords that they use. This is real. These are educated people. These are people in our government that have these meetings on how to control jinn. This is absolutely true. Right? Um, so we have to be careful about, about that. Uh, Imam al-Jilani, he said, if you see a man flying through the air or walking on water, la tusadduqubi, don't believe in him, unless you check his istiqama to the kitab and the sunnah. And don't believe in someone who can do some sort of... And these are khawarik al-adat. These are breaks of natural law. Even breaking natural law 
So don't believe in him unless you see that he has istiqamah, uprightness in the Quran and the Sunnah. But if he's lacking there, be aware, because there's ihana, there's istidraj, you know, there's, there's different types of miracles that are given to false prophets. Istidraj is, you know, an apparent miracle. You know, so, you know, something that you can learn if you really wanted to. <laughs> but why would you? For example, you know, Buddhist monks that can stop their heartbeat. And you learn how to do this through meditation. 30 years, a waste of time. But you think, well, it's a miracle. Or you can, there are these, you know, these people, if you stab them with a sword, they can move their organs around and evade the sword. And you think, well, that's a miracle. It's not. You can actually learn how to do that. But it takes like 30 years. Well, why do you want to do that? It's a waste of time. <laughs> so it's called istidraj. You think, well, it's a miracle. It's really not. There's no tofik in something like Who cares? Right? <coughs> Okay, we have a few minutes here. So, like we said, at some point, all of the Prophet's speech became wahi. And the textual proofs, as we mentioned, Surah al Najm, 1 through 5. Wa ma yantiku anil hawa. Ma yantiku, ma is negating, yantiku is a fi'l mudarir, is an imperfect tense. When ma negates a mudarir, it means never. He never speaks from Hawa. Hawa means from himself, from his own caprice, his own desires. Right? Everything he says is wahi. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah 59, ayah number 7. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Whatever he gives you. Ma means whatever. Here it's not negating. Right? Here is relative man. Whatever he gives you, take it, because it's good. Many times in the Quran, obey Allah, atir Allah, atir Rasul, ba'alakum turhamun. Obey Allah and obey the messenger. Obeying Allah means obey the Quran. Obey the messenger means obey what the Prophet is saying. Obey his words, because it's also wahi. In the Quran 1644. We sent down upon you the dhikr, the Quran, in order for you to make tabiyin, bayan, in order for you to explain what was revealed to them. The Quran was sent down in order for you to explain the Quran to them. That means that the Prophet is the first and foremost mufassir of the Quran. The explainer of the Quran, the commentator of the Quran. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ And concerning the ni'mah of your Lord, and almost all of the Ramama say the ni'mah here is the revelation. Concerning the revelation of your Lord, فَحَدِّثْ Give some hadith. Right? So we follow hadith. We follow sunnah. There's a difference between sunnah and hadith. A hadith is a statement or action that is attributed to the Prophet Whether it's true or false, something attributed to him is called a hadith. But sunnah means the authenticated hadith. The sunnah is the normative practice of the Prophet which is derived from sound hadith. Right? So there's some hadith that are forged. There's no doubt about it. And we reject those hadith, but we accept sunnah. We have to accept sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولَ لَهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of God a beautiful sunnah, a beautiful example. <coughs> Whatever he gives you, take it. Whatever he gives you. We revealed this dhikr in order for you to explain it. Okay. We also have an example of what's known as non-Quranic wahi. Reference in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا نَبَأَتْ بِهِ وَأَذْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضٍ So one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu hoped to conceal something from the Prophet sallallahu Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet what was happening. 
So she told the prophet as well. And it says the prophet affirmed part of what she said and repudiated part of what she said, or rejected part of what she said. And she said to the prophet, Man an ba'aka Who told you this? Qala nabta'ani al-alim al-khabir. He told me, the one who has omniscience and the one who knows the unseen. So what was that actual thing? What was the wording which Allah told the prophet is not mentioned in the Quran? Right? So we know that the Prophet ﷺ is receiving wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is not recited in the Quran. Right? Because the specifics of what was said are not there. Also at the Mi'raj, at the Ascension, <clears throat> we reveal to the Prophet whatever we wish to reveal. So the end of Baqarah was given to the Prophet, but many other things were given to him through wahi that we don't know about. For example, Ibn Mas'ud also mentions the, the promise of Jannah for the Ummah of the Prophet. Are they praying, Isha? Okay, we have to stop. About the, uh, the form, the style, and the themes of the Quran. And then, inshallah, we'll begin on the, uh, the compilation of the Quran. So, the, the smallest division of the Quranic text is called an ayah. An ayah means literally a sign. 6,236 ayat in the Quran. Um, Van Denver makes a comment here that the term verse is not appropriate since the Quran is not poetry. But for lack of a better term, we can refer to it as a verse. Um, so that's okay. But many of the ulama prefer not to call it a verse because verse in Arabic is bait, bait abyat. In the Quran, they're not abyat. The Quran is not poetry. And the Quran uh, expressively, ex explicitly um, repudiates itself as being poetry. It's not poetry. Right? And we'll talk about um, what, what the Quran actually is. It's a form of Arabic prose. So there's two literary genres um, that are prevalent at the time of the Prophet One is called Nathar, Nathar. Nun Thara, Nafa, which is prose. That's what the Quran is. And there's different types of prose. Mursal, straight prose. Saja, rhymed prose. Prose is non-metrical. So we'll talk about that later. And then there's something called Shi'r, which is poetry. The Quran is not poetry. So the poet has license to myth-make. The Sha'ir, right? He doesn't have to stay true to history. He can invent stories to teach a true lesson. The Ibrah is important. The Quran is not myth-making. The stories in the Quran are true. You know, the flood, the exodus, right? The story of Adam and Eve. We believe these stories are true. In the Hada, that what Qasas al Haq, these stories are true. The poet can invent stories to teach a lesson. The poet also has license to break rules of grammar for the sake of the rhyme, for the sake of the qafia. So one of the greatest poets of uh, Pre-Islamic Arabia, who actually became Muslim, Labid, he said, "Ala kullu shayin, ala kullu shayin ma khalallaha baatilu." So it should be baatilun. You should have put a tanween at the end. But he said baatilu for the sake of the rhyme. That's okay. He's a poet. He can do that. The Quran does not break any rules of grammar. It's consistent within itself grammatically. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the tahdi. The Quran issues a tahdi. Tahdi means a challenge. And it's an open challenge, an objective challenge, not subjective. When most Muslims are asked, you know, what is the challenge of the Quran? They say, well, to produce one surah like the Quran. They say, well, what does that mean, one surah like the Quran? Something as beautiful as the Quran. So that's not the challenge. That's very subjective. You know, you can read Arabic poetry that's very beautiful. But that's not the challenge of the Quran. The challenge of the Quran is objective. We'll talk more about that, inshallah. So 6,236 ayat, we'll call them verses for lack of a better term. Uh, and then there's 114 suwar. Suwar means uh, like fence, surah, or 
called Fasl. In the, in the Bible, they're called Fasl. Quran calls them Surah. The shortest is three ayat, 108 Surah. Uh, surah 108, Kothar, is three ayat. That's the shortest Surah. The longest Surah is 286 ayat, Surah Al Baqarah. What's also noteworthy is the term ayat and Surah is in the Quran itself. Tilka ayat al Kitab al Mubin. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبْ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاكُمْ So these terms are in the Qur'an. The term Qur'an is in the Qur'an. الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان So these, these terms are Qur'anic. Um, all of the surahs, all of the suar, the plural of surah is suar, begin with the basmala, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, except Surat at tawbah Surah number 9. And there's two reasons for this according to the ulama. Wallahu alam. There is an opinion that Surat at tawbah is actually a continuation of the previous Surah, Al-Anfal. And that is really 113 Surahs of the Qur'an. Because if you look at the first few Surah, they're extremely long. Right? This is how books were pretty much arranged in the pre-modern world. Longest to shortest, like the Bible is like that. Longest books to the shortest. The Talmud is like that. So Baqarah 286, Ayat. Ali Imran 200. Al Nisa 176. Al Ma'ida 120. An'am 165. Al A'raf 200. Then you have Al Fal only 75. And then Tawbah 129. So there's an opinion that these are actually. The same surah, which would make 204 ayat, because the, the theme is the same. You know, al anfal is the major theme is spoils of war, and surah so Tawbah is dealing with rules of engagement in war. That's one opinion, not a very popular opinion. The more popular opinion is that surah Tawbah lacks the basmala, because Allah subhanahu wa taala in this surah, uh, he means business. That's a point. So the surah Tawbah. If all you had of the Quran was surah Tawbah then you'd have a very strange perception of the message of Islam. Surah al is dealing with rules of engagement. How to deal with khiyana, for example, treachery against the Muslim polity. Right? So there's no basmala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to stress his majestic qualities. Right? His, his qualities of, of, of rigor. Allah wa um, the names of the surahs are often derived from important or distinguishing um, uh, characteristics or themes within the surah. So, Surah Al-Baqarah is called Al-Baqarah. Because the story is that Musa a.s. ordered the Bani Israel to slaughter the Baqarah. And then instead of immediately obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they began asking a series of questions. Now, how old, what color, what, what is a Baqarah? You know, all these different types of questions. So the ibra is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is important because complete faith uh, entails total submission. Right? Even if it seems like it's something that's beyond our intellect, something supra-rational, not irrational. You don't have to believe in anything irrational, anything that can be falsified. You don't have to believe in that. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that he took his servant on a journey by night from Masjid al-Haram to Aqsa. We don't sit there and try to rationalize it. Well, you know, maybe there was some warp in the space-time continuum or something like that. Allahu a'lam, maybe there's some rational explanation for it. But سَمِعْنَا وَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. It's a super rational transmission that's given in, 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 uh, in text and scripture. Right? So... Ida'an, Ida'an, and Qabul need to be there as part of faith. Ida'an in Arabic means submissiveness. And Qabul means to accept. Ida'an and Qabul. So this is why Shaitan is a Catholic. Shaitan certainly knows that the Prophet is a messenger of God. He certainly knows that. Ibn Kathir mentions that when the Prophet was born, Shaitan started screaming. Why is he screaming? Because he knows that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of God. He's accepted the rational proposition that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of God. But he's not a Muslim 
because he doesn't have ida'an and qabul of the Prophet There's a difference. Uh, Heraclius, the emperor of Byzantium, he interrogated Abu Sufyan ibn Hawq. And Heraclius was sort of a freelance biblical scholar, if you will, who's the emperor of Byzantium. So he said to Abu Sufyan, you know, describe him to me. And Abu Sufyan describes him. And then Heraclius says to him, you know he's a prophet. You know he's a prophet. So you should follow him. And he says, soon my dominion will be underneath his feet. This is what Heraclius said to Abu Sufyan. But Heraclius did not become Muslim. Because no idaan and no qabul. He didn't go to Medina and seek out the Prophet Make bay'ah to the Prophet Begin following the Sharia. Begin into implementing the Sunnah. None of these things happen. Right? So complete faith entails submissiveness and acceptance. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّبُكَ فِي مَنْ شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجْدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا By your Lord, they don't really believe unless they make you a judge in all of their affairs and they find no resistance in their hearts against your judgments and they have total taslim to you. Total taslim. <coughs> so this is part and parcel of faith. So Baqara, the, you know, some people, why is it called the heifer, the, the cow? The lesson there is total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have surah, uh, some surahs have multiple names. Surah al-Ikhlas, according to Fakhruddin al-Razi, has 22 names. Sometimes it's just called Qul Allahu Ahad. The Prophet sallallahu referred to it as Qul Allahu Ahad. He said Qul Allahu Ahad, ta'adilu thulath al-Qur'an. This surah has the weight of a third of the Qur'an. But it's also called, according to the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, Surah Al-Asas. Surah Al-Asas. Asas means the foundation. And the foundation of theology. It's also called Surah Al-Ikhlas. Ikhlas, of sincerity. It's also called Surah Al-Tawheed. The Surah of monotheism or oneness. These are just some of the names of the surah. And then you have a juz, and the uh, plural is ajza'un, ajza'. This is one thirtieth of the Qur'an. One part, one out of thirty parts of the Qur'an is called a juz. So the Qur'an is divided into thirty equal parts. This is post-Uthmanic, after the time of Sayyidina Uthman. And this was done for uh, Ramadan recitation, that it's... Traditional to read, a little over one juz a night takes about an hour. And then you have a manzil. A manzil is one uh, seventh of the Quran. Also a post Uthmanic division. So juz and manzil are not mentioned in the Quran, but ayah and surah are mentioned. So seven parts of approximately equal length. So each manzil contains about four ajizat. Right. And these are sort of divisions that. The early scholars um, um, developed in order to facilitate hifz of the Quran, basically. The language of the Quran is Arabic, obviously, may not be so obvious for some Western scholars who claim that the Quran is in Syriac, very strange, uh, sort of radical revisionist opinion. There's a German scholar named um, Christoph Luxemburg. And that's his pseudonym, pseudonym, it's not his actual name, because he's afraid like Muslims are going to kill him or something. But uh, his claim is that, and no one takes him seriously, but he, he's, his claim is the Quran is written in Syriac, is a Syriac text, written in Arabic letters. But nobody takes his uh, opinion seriously, as I said. Even someone like Patricia Crone, who believes the text of the Quran is totally unreliable. She doesn't take Luxembourg seriously at all. Um, the Quran describes itself as Arabiyu Mubin, Mubin. So Mubin does not mean that the Quran does not contain foreign words. It does contain foreign words. So sometimes anti-Muslim polemicists, they'll say, look, Mubin means, you know, pure, unadulterated Arabic. That's not what Mubin means. Um, it's interesting, there's, you have these uh, satellite uh, stations, and you have these sort of, Persian channels, and some of these Iranian guys are totally anti-Muslim. And one of them actually, <laughs> and he talks about politics, one of them has a rule, if you call my show, you can't use any Arabic. 
right? He doesn't like Arabic. So if you call and you say, Salam Alaikum, he'll hang up on you. You have to say, Durud Bar Shomal. And then he'll say, so no Arabic, no Arabic. Then he starts talking. You know, he's like, Taklife ma darim dunya. Everything he's saying is Arabic. He doesn't know it's Arabic. Half of what he's saying is Arabic. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what does Mubin mean? Arabiyun Mubin. It means Arabic which reveals clear truth. Mubin is from Abana Yubinu, form four. In order to make something clear, this is Arabic that that demystifies things, that makes it clear. It doesn't mean that it's pure Arabic and there's no foreign words. That's impossible for any language that is a living, breathing language to stay pure, right? If you go into the English dictionary, into the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll be amazed what you find in these dictionaries. You'll find the word alcohol, which is Arabic. You'll find algebra. You'll find jihad. You'll find fatwa. These are English words. You don't have to italicize them in academic papers. If you write the word fatwa, you can leave it unitalicized because it's an English word and there's an assumption that the reader knows what it means. Right? Oftentimes they don't know what it means though. They think it means like a death sentence or something. It just means a legal ruling. Most fatwas have to do with food. Can I eat gelatin? Let me see if I can get a fatwa. <laughs> So the Quran contains, and this is, you know, Imam Tabari al Baqilani, Imam Suyuti read, wrote a short treatise called Al Mutawakili, where he says there are 118 expressions in the Quran that contain foreign words. Um, and that these words were used by the Arabs prior to the Quranic revelation, according to Imam Shafi. Um, for example, uh, and there's uh, six different languages in the Qur'an. The Qur'an borrows from six or seven different languages. So the word Injil, for example, Injil is a Greek word. It's Arabicized. The Arabs were using it, so it's Arabic. If you study the Ajrumiya, Al-Kalamu, Wal-Lafku, Al-Murakku, Al-Mufidu, bil is the beginning of the Ajrumiya. It's a very famous treatise on, uh, on grammar. You know, speech is uttered, it's compounded, um, it's uh, mufid, it's useful, it has meaning, and it is, it is used by the Arabs, it is placed by an Arab placement. The Arabs are using it and it's recognized. Right? So the Arabs are using the word inji. Right? It comes from iwangelion, Greek word made Arabic. The word ghassaq is Turkish. Illa hamima wa ghassaqa, it says in the Quran. Surah an naba ghassaq, Turkish. The word durriyun, durriyun, kaukabun durriyun, ayat nur. Durriyun is Ethiopic. It's another Semitic language um, uh, spoken in Ethiopia, al Habasha. Right? And kaukab, the word before, kaukab, kaukav is Hebrew. Right? And then sijil is Persian. Sijil, tarmihim bihijarati min sijil, sangogil. Sangogil became Sijji. There's no, there's no G, there's no G, right, in, in Arabic, unless you live in Egypt. Then there's a, there's a G, right? And people like to watch the show, Gay Leno. Gay Leno, Gay Leno. Anyway, sorry, bad joke. But uh, they say Gamal. Gamil, uh, Gamil, right? sort of Jamil. Right? It's Arabic, uh, Egyptian Lahaja. Right? But Sangogil became Sijil, like a stone made of mud. Right? <clears throat> um, and then other, there's Hebrew words, a lot of Sinin, Musa, Nuh, Ibrahim. There's Syriac. Syriac is a language of Isa. Isa. The word Tur, Tur, what Tur mountain is, is Syriac, Suryania. So you have these different languages. You have these different words in the Quran that either etymology are foreign, but since the Arabs are using them, they're considered to be Arabic. Okay. Um, let's talk about the themes of the Quran. According to Imam al-Ghazali and others, Imam al-Biqari and many others, there are about seven different uh, thematic types of ayat in the Quran. 
Every ayah of the Quran falls into one of these types, one of these thematic types. The first is called qasas. Qasas means narrative. Qasas, right? A qissa means a story. So, for example, the nativity of, of Isa alayhi salam, وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَانِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُبَشِّرُكِ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنْهُ إِسْمُهُ الْمَسِيحِ Right? The story of the past. So the flood, the exodus, the Ashab al-Kaf, the seven sleepers of Ephesus. These are all qissas. These are all narrative. Also references to events in the life of the Prophet وسلم, like the Battle of Khandaq, Laylat al-Isra wa al-Mi'raj, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. This all fun, falls under the thematic category of, of qissa or qissas, narrative. And then you have uh, another type of ayah, which is called uh, hukum, hukum. The plural is ahkam. So this deals with a sort of, some sort of legal ruling or judgment, right? Ahkam. So you have ahkam badaniya. You have rulings that deal with the body. Uh, so like ayat that deal with fasting or ablutions, or penal punishments. Right? What to do with the thief. When you stand to pray, wash your face, face wash your hands to the, the elbows. Right? So these are called ahkam badaniya. So these fall under the category of ahkam. So again, there's seven thematic <coughs> categories of ayat. The first is called narrative. Now we have ahkam. Within ahkam, there are different categories. Ahkam badaniya. Then you have ahkam uh, qalbiya or khuluqiya. So rulings or imperatives or injunctions that deal with ethics or spirituality. For example, i'dilu wa aqrabu taqwa Be just. It is the closest thing to piety. Be just. Right? And there's many types of these types of ayat. Um, or in Surah Al-Isra, ayah 32, zina innahu kana wa sa'a Don't even come close to zina. Right? Notice the wording. Don't even come close to fornication. So the Quran doesn't say don't fornicate. It says, don't even put yourself in a position where that, that can actually be possible, right? So like you're not allowed to be in a room with a non-mahram that's, that's locked or that's closed. There has to be sort of a fear of, uh, of being discovered, right? So mo most uh, incidents of, of zina in our culture, in American culture, uh, they originate in the workplace. You know, a man and a woman going out to lunch. Hey, it's just lunch. What's the problem, right? No, no big deal. They go and they talk and they get to know each other. And, or going out to, I'm going out to the movies with my friend's wife. What? What are you talking about? Yeah, you know, he's out of town. I'm going to take her out to the movies. What? And when we, you know, when we question these things, they think we're so strange. They think we're weird, right? I mean, you don't do that? No. I don't even shake hands with... A non -mah. what? What are you talking about? They think it's, that's okay. They think you're strange. The Prophet said, In the This religion began strange. It will return to strange. Glad tidings to the strangers. Glad tidings to the strangers. Every week they would come to my cubicle when I worked in the corporate world. They say, Hey, Ali, are you going to happy hour? Happy hour is when they go out and get drunk on Friday afternoon. Every week, and I said, "No, I, I don't. I don't drink." Wow, man, that's strange. Just come and listen. Just come and be with us. I said, "No, I'm not even. Gonna, I don't feel comfortable." Really? You're strange, man. <laughs> that's too strange. You're a, you're an extremist. Right? That's what I said. You don't drink alcohol is extreme. Nowadays, like praying five times a day for a lot of parents is extreme. Like a, a, a youth who wants to pray for, oh, that's you know, don't you're going to become Allah. God knows. I'm just praying. No, it is too extreme. Do we get your degree first. Degree? 
I have to get my degree to pray five times a day. <laughs> this is what I hear from people. My mom won't let me pray. She wants me to get my degree first. <laughs> I see your, your parents have a good intention, obviously. You know, they're very concerned about, you know, you sort of going down the wrong path. But praying is the right path, obviously. Praying is right. So that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and then you have uh, ahkam uh, that deal with ibadah. Ahkam or budiyah. You know, things dealing with prayer, right? And then ahkam maliya. You know, legal injunctions dealing with what to do with wealth. So that's the second thematic category is ahkam, rulings. And of course, you also have do's and don'ts. These fall under the category of the ahkam. Prescriptions and proscriptions. A prescription is you have to do this. A proscription is do not do this. And people think the entire Quran is a book of do's and don'ts. Less than 600 ayat out of 6,200 deal, deal with do's and don'ts. And most of those 600 are actually commentaries on the do's and don'ts. Just a few dozen ayat, ayat of the Quran deals with, deal with do's and don'ts. Right, so the, the Quran is not a, a purely you know, deontological book, you know, do and don't. That's not that's not what it is. By far, um, the most prevalent theme of the Quran is qasas, is narrative. So it's stories repeated over and over again. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to think about these stories and to draw out lessons and how to make them relevant for our times. And then um, the third theme is rububiya, uh, a theological type verses. Rububiya. Right? So, like Surah Al Ikhlas, that entire surah would fall under the category, the thematic category of rububiya. So, ayat that deal with the that, the essence, the sifat, the qualities or attributes, and af'al, actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the fourth type of ayah is called prophetological, Nabawiya. Nabawiya. For example, Surah Al Ahzab, ayah number six, and Nabiyu Awla bil Mu'minina min Al-Muslim. The Prophet takes precedence for the believers than their own selves. Right? And you might have one ayah that contains three or four of these elements. But every ayah at least can fall into one of these categories. At least one of these categories according to Imam al-Ghazali. Then you have, number five is called promise, wa'ad, and number six is called wa'id, threat, promise and threat. Wa'ad and wa'id, promise and threat. So oftentimes in the Quran you have what's known as tibaq, tibaq, which is a juxtaposition of ideas. You have a promise of jannah, and immediately you have a threat of the nar. Right? There's a story of the Prophet said them, the Sahaba were praying behind him, and they saw him during the prayer lean in and put his hand out in the, in, during the prayer, and then suddenly withdraw his hand. So they asked him after about that, and he said, you know, I was reciting ayat describing Jannah, right? And I was suddenly given a vision of some of the low-hanging fruits of Jannah. They reached my hand out. And then the Quran has tibaq. So when you keep reading, suddenly there's a threat of naw, of the fire. So when he got to those ayat, he had a vision of the fire and he withdrew his hand. Wa'ad and wa'id. Promise and threat. Inna a'atayna kal kawtha. You know, indeed, we have given you kawtha. This is a wa'ad, a promise. Wa'ad Allahi haq, wa man astahu in Allahi qila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he makes a promise, he says himself, he will never break his promise. The believers will gain salvation. This is a promise, and Allah will never break His promise. A wa'id is a threat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, Ayah 24, we talked about the nature of Surah Tawbah, that if any of these material things are more beloved to you, and he mentions like your wealth and your houses and your possessions, any of these, your families, any of these things, 
أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره. If any of those things are more beloved to you than Allah, His Messenger, and struggling in the cause of Allah, which has a martial aspect as well as an internal aspect, then just wait until Allah brings about His decision. In other words, if you don't want to wait, this is a threat from Allah. When Allah issues a threat, we should take it seriously. If a human being calls your house, <coughs> issues you a threat, you're not going to sleep all night. You're going to call the cops. You're going to move out. You're going to take it seriously. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens we take it seriously. <coughs> However, we know from our theology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that he may forego a threat. And this is something that is um, in the theology of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. The Mu'tazila, the rationalists, they, they claim that every single threat that Allah makes, he must carry out. Right? So the problem with that type of theology is that they're circumscribing or they're uh, limiting Allah's volition and agency and mercy. If Allah breaks a threat, that's a uh, demonstration of his mercy. Breaking a promise is khiyana. Breaking a promise is considered treachery. Right. Did I talk about this last time? Oh, I talked about this. I was in Australia. <laughs> Similar setup. So, for example, if there's a if there's a king who has a who, who's who's made a law in his land that if you kill any of the sheep of my kingdom, I'll hang you. Right. So they caught this little boy killing sheep. So they bring him to the king. Right. So the king says, "Well, you know, the law says." I have to hang you, so go hang him. Right? That's the letter of the law. Or the king could say, why are you stealing? And the kid said, well, my family's poor. So the king says, okay, that's okay. Here, take some more sheep. Right? So that's a function of the king's mercy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forego a threat. He can forego a threat. But we don't lean on that assurance. There's no assurance Allah will do that for any of us. It's mumkin. It's, it's just conceivable Allah can do that, right? That's why we have to be between hope and fear. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, where are the two sandals of hope and fear, right? So hope is called Raja, Raja. Raja means hope with work. It doesn't mean just fear without work, but hope without work. That's called Tamanna. There's a hadith, Al-Kayyisu, Man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'at al maut the intelligent one is the one who subdues his lower self and works for what comes after death. The unintelligent one is the one who puts his nafs in, in pursuance of its desires and just has vain hope in God. You know, oh, I hope I go to Jannah and he doesn't pray. I hope I told his brother one time, way back in the college days, we're praying Salat al Jummah, like right outside where this brother was. And he's Muslim. He said, You want to pray with us? And he said, In Allah Ghafur Rahim. God is He's merciful and forgiving. We said, Yeah, that's true. That's true. He's merciful and forgiving. Right? It's like when <laughs> when Shaitan came to Isa alayhi salam and said, Qul la ilaha illallah. And then Isa alayhi salam said, that's true, but I'm not going to repeat it because you told me to say it. <laughs> it's a true statement. <clears throat> so I said, you know, Allah is also severe in retribution. You know? um, so, you know, tamanna is just, you know, like someone who's sitting in his mother's basement at 40 years old. And his mom says, go get a job. If it happens, it happens, man. I, I hope I can become a doctor one day. He just played video games, wearing his flip-flops, eating Cheetos. You know. So raja, raja means to have hope coupled with strong effort. This is called raja. And there's tawfiq in that. Tamanna is to have hope with no, no effort. And there's, there's no tawfiq. Khidlam is forsakenness in that. So, be between hope and fear. Khawf. So, not too much hope, right? 
that you start to become arrogant, right? Uh, and, and then you start becoming lax on your Abba. Like some Christians, you know, they say, I have assurance of paradise. I'm assured of paradise. Many Christians have said to me, do you have assurance of paradise in Islam? And I said, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa whoever says la ilaha illallah with sincerity will enter paradise. So inshallah, I am that person who will say la ilaha illallah with sidq. And he said, no, that's not good enough. Do you have a personal assurance? Personal. You mean, you know, is there a hadith where the Prophet says, Ali Atahi will get Hulu Jannah? No, I don't have such personal assurance. Personal assurance is dangerous because it makes one lazy. If you're assured paradise, you know 100% that's going to happen, then you start becoming lax on your a'mal. That's a problem. Then you have the other extreme where people are full of fear, right? So they get into a state of qunut. Qunut means a despair. You know, like, what's the point? You know, I'm, you know how dirty my nafs are? How can God even forgive me? This type of mentality. La taqna tu bi rahmatillah. Do never, never despair of God's mercy. So you have to be between the two. Right? And nowadays, the ulama say, lean a little bit on the side of hope. Have a little more hope nowadays. Because there's so much doom and gloom and, you know, fire and brimstone. <clears throat> okay. So, wa'ad and wa'id. And then the last thematic category is called ma'ad or the hereafter. The hereafter. So any ayah of the Quran will fall into at least one of these seven categories. Of qisas, of narrative, sorry, of narrative, of uh, judgment or ruling, of theology, of prophetology, promise, threat, and ma'ad, hereafter. So if you look at juz, juz amma, the last juz, the central theme of the last juz is ma'ad. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is training Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't begin by revealing all these ahkam. Right? Those came in Medina, actually. You could be a, a town drunk in Mecca and be Muslim. And there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. After the Battle of Badr, some of the Sahaba, they had a party and they got drunk. It was mentioned in Syria. Because there was no prohibition of alcohol at the time. Right? So these things came later. So when we're into implementing the religion, we have to keep these things in mind. You know, we don't suddenly, you know, expect people to adopt all of these ahkam and sunnah. They should be encouraged, right? But I've seen people become Muslim and then leave the religion shortly thereafter because they find it burdensome. It's not burdensome, but it has to be taken in dosages. So our mother Aisha, she said. If, you know, um, prohibition, meaning non-allowance to drink alcohol, uh, was revealed initially, then very few people would have become Muslim. There's a statement attributed to her along those lines. So we have ma'ad. <clears throat> and then the final verse of the Quran revealed, according to Imam Suyuti, is Al-Baqarah 281. This is the final verse of the Quran. It's not al yawma akmatu lakum dinakum. That's not the final ayah. That was revealed Hajjatul Wada. Many ayah that came after. Some of the ulama say there are no ahkam that came after this ayah. But the final verse, yani, absolute final, is surah number two, verse 281. turja'una fihi ilallah. Fear the day that you will return, you will be returned. To Allah. So the Quran comes full circle. Ma'ad back to Ma'ad. Okay. <coughs> Any questions so far? Before we talk, yes, sir. Um, in terms of when uh, in terms of the tafsir of the Quran, and even in terms of the translation, there seems to be like difference. In Aqidah, in terms of Ashari and Maturidi, in terms of who can interpret the Quran and how there's a relationship, can you clarify like what are the main differences between the two, or if they're even like? Yeah, um, 
the, the two, the traditional definition of a Sunni Muslim is someone who follows the four schools of thought, one of the, one of the four madatib. Um, although it, most of them, I would say that there is allowance for mixing them as well. Um, and then also following one of the two schools of classical theology, which are Ash'ari, Maturidi, and some include the Athari, or the early Hanbali school as well. Imam al Tahawi's creed is Athari, right? It's non speculative, it's very ecumenical. The differences between Ash'ari, Maturidi, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah will say are negligible, they're not, they're not major. Um, so, um, you know, what to do with really the, really the difference, one of the major differences, and it's again not a major difference, one of the noteworthy differences is the role of the intellect. You know, so for the Ash'ari, the intellect really has to be aided by revelation to arrive at, at the true theology. For the Ash'ari, in other words, the intellect left by itself will not arrive at Tawheed. It must be aided by revelation. But as Maturidi will say, it is, it is possible. It's possible for the intellect to arrive at Tawheed without revelation. Right? Um, but parents in society will compromise the fitrah, compromise the aql. There's a hadith that says, Kulu mawludin yuladu ala fitrah. Every child is born upon a pure state in an innate disposition to accept the message of the prophets. And parents in society make that child a Jew, a Christian, a Zoroastrian, an atheist. Right? Um, <clears throat> and then with the um, Ash'ara, there, there tends to be more um, tendency to make a ta'wil of ayat, so interpretation of ayat that are with the shabi hat, ayat that are not clear in meaning, right? So a little more speculative. That's sort of the critique from the Hanabila or the Athari about the Ash'ari is that it's too speculative. Of course, the Mu'tazila theology is way too speculative and it's not even considered a uh, permissible position theologically. But some of the Ash'ari believe that it was uh, it was um, necessary to engage in ilm al-kalam, you know, speculative theology or polemical theology, because you have these other groups, you know, saying these very strange things about the Quran. Right? For example, Yadullahi Fokaidi, the hand of God. What is that? Some groups said that means a physical hand made of matter, that Allah is located in space, is sitting on a physical throne. So the Ash'aris, they had to clarify what that means. Yadullah means the power of God, right? according to those who made ta'weel. Right? So this is called ta'weel. Yes? So why is that the non Arabic names, such as like Ibrahim, Musa, Injil, Torah, popular in Arabic language because it's largely a paganistic society? So why were they borrowing these words from? Yeah, by and large, the, the Arabs of Mecca were mushrikeen, but there seems to have been some influence from Ahlul Kitab. And nowadays, scholars would say that there was probably more influence than we previously thought. Uh, in the Quran, um, it's interesting, in a Meccan surah, the mushrik, there's an ayah that says that the mushrikeen came to the Prophet and they said to him, you know, why don't you receive a revelation like Moses did? This is coming from pagan Arabs. So there is some familiarity amongst the Quraysh, the Mushrikeen of the Quraysh, uh, as to the nature of prophecy. And of course you have the Hunafa. You have a group of Arabs in Mecca, pre-Islamic Arabia in Mecca, uh, that did not engage in shirk uh, because they claimed to be in the tradition of Ibrahim So they're very conscious of their Abrahamic heritage. right? Um, so, and obviously there are Arab Christians that, you know, don't necessarily live in Mecca, but live in the south and north that pass through Mecca. You have Jewish tribes living in the north in Khaybar and Yathrib uh, and other places that would pass through Mecca as well. Um, 
So these names were established amongst them at the time. The Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula, it's interesting, they didn't use Yasua uh, for Isa. You know, Arabs in other, like maybe in Iraq, were using Yasua, but Arabs in, in Mecca were using Isa. So that's what the Quran uses. That was, the Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Quraysh. Right? The Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Quraysh. We'll talk about this more. We talk about the seven ahruf, ala sabati ahruf. It's a hadith that says, and this hadith in Bukhari, ten companions related to hadith. The Quran was revealed upon seven letters. What are these letters? These ahruf. One opinion is these are these are seven different dialects of Arabic, like Qurayshi and Hudayli and you know the Thaqifi and others. But the dominant opinion is that no, they're not seven dialects. The Quran is revealed in the Qurayshi dialect. But there's seven types of variations of the text. Seven types of variations of the text. So one type of variation is um, variations of the skeletal dots. You have you have a reading. Allah will teach Isa the book. In another qira'ah, we will teach him the book. You and Nu both are multiply attested to Atom. So this is a function of the ahruf. Or you have variations in diacritical um, vowel notations. For example, um, and we'll get into this later, I'm sort of going on a tangent, but the, the verse on the wudu, وَمْسَحُ بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبِينَ Right? This is, uh, means, and, and wipe your heads, and wash your feet to the ankles, because arjulakum with the fatha means it's mansub, it's accusative. So it's not referring to the closest verb, which means wipe. You have to go to the next closest verb, which which is rasala, to wash. However, there's another reading of this ayah where it says arjulikum genitive kasra, which now goes back to the wipe. And Sunnis they take from these all these qurat, right? There's seven or some say ten qiraat of the Quran. So the general rule is to wash to the ankle. But if you're wearing socks that are above the ankle, then there's dispensation to wipe over the khuf. The Shia, they only take the genitive reading. So they'll wipe over the barefoot. This is really the issue with praying behind them. There are some differences in Aqidah. They believe in twelve infallible Imams, right? The Ithna Sharia, right? Um, we believe in those Imams, they were great men, but Isma is only for Al Anbiya, so it's a mistaken belief. But it doesn't give kufur. The main issue is they don't wash their feet to the ankle. So there's a problem, Shar'an, with their prayer. That's why the Prophet said, Makru Tahriman, Makru Tanzihan, to pray behind the Not necessarily for a theological reason, although some of the Ulama also mentioned that. You know, their, their opinions of certain Sahaba do give kufr. For example, anyone who maintains the if about Aisha, right? And if you read their books, some of them actually maintain that, unfortunately. Um, so that's going against Dalil Qatari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, he says in the Quran, يُعِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ أَن تَعُودُوا لِمِثْلِهِ أَبَدًا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah exhorts you never ever to say anything remotely close to this about Aisha ever again if you are believers. Okay. So, some of the ulama, unfortunately, they maintain the ifk. I don't know how they you deal with that ayah, to be honest with you. But something like that is clearly kufur. <coughs> anyway. Um, okay, anyway. Yes? You mentioned the language theory. Yeah. Is that an ancient language which is not existing anymore? Yeah, it's considered a dead language. There, there are some remote villages in Sham to this day where they speak the language, you know, day to day. Uh, but other than that, and then the Church of the East, there's a church in Iraq called the Assyrian Church, also called the Church of the East. Their church liturgy is conducted in Syriac, but they speak Arabic. So they don't speak it as a spoken language, 
but in church, the literature, literature, church liturgy is conducted in Syriac. But basically, it's, it's like Sanskrit. It's a dead language. Akkadian, Ugaritic, these are all Semitic languages that are now dead. Nobody really speaks them anymore. Even Hebrew was a dead language for a while. And they revived it by looking at Arabic. There's a statement Imam al-Haddad mentions that in the lives of men, he says, on the day of judgment, the language of Yom al-Qiyamah is Suriyaniyah, is in Syriac. The proceedings on the Yom al-Qiyamah are in Syriac. Allahu Adam. The language of Isa alayhi The language of Jannah is Arabic. Um, and it's okay if you don't know Arabic. You should try to learn it, but you'll, you'll, you'll be initiated into the language of Shalom. All of us. <laughs> but we should learn it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Syriac is also called late Aramaic. You know, late Aramaic. It was a language of Isai de Sanan. <coughs> His spoken language. Okay, let's begin talking about the transmission of the Quranic revelation. So the Qur'an has been transmitted to us in two ways, orally and in written form. So on page 18 of Von Denfer's text, uh, Ibn Hisham relates, Ibn Hisham is a great um, historiographer. He wrote the Sirah and Nabawiya, three volumes of the Prophet Sallallahu He mentions that, that early in the Meccan period, um, you have uh, reports of Sahaba reciting Qur'an at the Kaaba. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the first of the Sahaba to go recite in public, and he was beaten, right? Abu Dhar al Ghifari recited Quran to the Kaaba, he was beaten. Of course, the Prophet said, would go, he recited, they put him in a chokehold, they throw garbage on him, right? They also mentioned that Abu Bakr al Siddiq would recite the Quran uh, at his house, and the Mushrikeen, and some of them used to come and hide behind his fence just to listen, right? So the Quran is very sweet. If you know Arabic well, it is mesmerizing. So you have you know, Abu Sufyan and others would come, and it must have been a very awkward moment when they'd go there and there's other Mushikim there. Like, what are you doing? Um, what are you doing? I'm just relaxing. And they're, listen, they're actually listening to Abu Bakr Siddiq's recitation. So the, the argument is then, why didn't they just become Muslim then? And the reason is because, you know, it's beyond aesthetics. It's not just, this is so beautiful, I should become Muslim. That's the mistake Muslims make when they deal with that tahaddi, as we said, the challenge of the Quran. It's not just make something as beautiful as the Quran. The reason why these people didn't become Muslim, uh, Abu Sufyan did become Muslim, but not until later, but Abu Jahl never became Muslim, uh, is because the Quran is calling towards a morality that's coming into conflict with their own nafs. So that's first and foremost what the Quran is doing, right? Um, so it doesn't matter how beautiful it is, if a person doesn't want to change, they're not going to convert. <clears throat> okay. There's a hadith in Bukhari, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنُ وَعَلَّمَ The best amongst you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. Another hadith in Muslim, Al-Qur'anu hujjatun lak aw alayk. The Qur'an is either a proof for you or against you on the Yom Al-Qiyam. Recital of the Qur'an is required, obviously, in the five daily prayers. Thus, the Qur'an was constantly heard and recited and memorized by the Sahaba. Right? So, this is important. The Qur'an that we recite was recited by Sahaba. The New Testament that Christians read today, the Gospel of Matthew, for example, was never seen by Esau and Son. The Gospel of Mark was never seen by Esau and Son. The Gospel of John, the Gospel of Luke, the First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, the Book of Romans, the Book of Revelation, none of the 27 books of the New Testament, the so-called Injil, were ever even seen by Esau and Son. They were written after his life. Right? But the Quran we recite today was recited by Sahaba and the Prophet We actually know which suwar he would recite at specific prayers. Our mother Aisha said that the Prophet would pray the two sunnah before the fard of Sukh in the morning. He would recite al-kafirun in the first rak'ah and ikhlas in the second. 
and it, and it was very, um, uh, he was very, um, what's the word, consistent in doing that. For, for sunnah prayers, you can have some, some consistency. But for fart, you shouldn't, you know, for fart prayers, you shouldn't designate a, I'm going to recite this in every fart prayer. It's Mapru in the Hanafi school. Although there is a report of man, the Prophet said, and he put him in charge of a group of Muslims to go out for an expedition. And this man would, every rakah would recite ikhlas. Even when he would recite another surah, he would, he would do ikhlas after. So they complained to the Prophet and said, so he's always reciting ikhlas, every rak'ah, ikhlas, ikhlas. So the Prophet said, he said, and why do you recite the surah in every rak'ah? Uh, and he said, no, he said, ask him why he does that. Ask him why he does that. So they asked, why do you do that? And he says, I just love how Allah is, is described in this surah. So they came back and he said, his answer was, he loves how Allah is described in the surah. And then the Prophet said, tell him Allah loves him. So, ikhlas is weighty. Um, and then like Surah uh, in, 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 uh, Salat al-Jumu'ah, um, there was some consistency with Salat al-Jumu'ah. Uh, Surah al-A'la, and then al-Ghashiyah al al in the second, 87 and 88. So we know which, which and then in a Fajr prayer, the Fard, he would, he would recite a longer ayat, right? It would be a longer prayer. In Maghrib, it was shorter. We actually know this from the Hadith literature. So it's extraordinary that we know this. So the Sahaba were constantly hearing and reciting and memorizing the Quran. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you know, this was an oral culture. An oral culture. It was, you know, or an auditory. It was Sama'iyun. So most people were illiterate. They didn't know how to they didn't know how to read or write. In fact, most pre-modern cultures were oral. Even uh, in Athens in the fifth century before the Common Era, the time of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, 90% of the general populace did not know how to read or write. In fact, Socrates himself was illiterate. That's why he never wrote anything. Everything we know about Socrates is through Plato. Right? So this was normal. Uh, everything was oral. So the Arabs actually excelled at poetry and at memorization. This is something they excelled at. It was the height of their language. The time of the Quranic revelation, it was the height of Arabic. And they excelled in, in hefif and memorization. So it's almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing them for the Quran and the Sunnah. They would memorize their lineage back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. They would memorize their horses' lineages. The horses. This horse is the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. So all the way back, generations for horses. Right? So this was something that was very important for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated the preservation of the sunnah and the Quran by giving it primarily, first and foremost, to the Arab. <clears throat> There are still oral cultures in the world. One of my colleagues went to Mauritania, West Africa, and he was 18 at the time, and he said that the children were laughing at him because he was not a hafiz of Quran, and he was so old. So what did you do with your life? You're 18, you're not hafiz yet? Right? <laughs> so an oral culture, memorization was something that was valued. There are people who have the entire Arabic dictionary, the Qamus, memorized. The people who have the Shema'il and Nabawiyah of you know, Timothy memorized, page numbers and everything. <clears throat> so the Muslim argument is that the order and arrangement was well known. The order and arrangement of the Quran was well known because of the, the constant, constant recitation of the Quran by the Sahaba. So that's an important point to make. The Prophet also listened to the recitation of the Quran by his companions. On page 18 of Montan, there's a hadith of Bukhari, where the Prophet says to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was known for his Quranic skills, he said, Iqra alayya, recite the Quran to me. And ibn Mas'ud said, how can I recite it to you when it was revealed to you? 
And he said, I love to hear it from somebody else other than me. So Ibn Mas'ud began reciting Surah An-Nisa, and he got to verse 41. Uh, How will it be when, when we appoint a witness um, against every people and we'll appoint you as a witness against this people? And then the Prophet says, okay, you can stop them. And Ibn Mesir looked and there was tears streaming down the face of the Prophet. Says, so there's evidence that so Sahaba would recite the Quran to the Prophet. Says, the Prophet also sent teachers to teach the Quran. Ibn Hisham relates the Prophet he sent Mus'ab ibn Umar to the people of Yathrib before the Hijrah to Medina to recite the Quran to them and to teach them the Quran. And they called him Al Qari, Al Qari, the, the reciter, the reader. <clears throat> Imam Sayyuti mentions in the Itqan. Over 20 well known companions who were her father of the Quran. These include the four caliphs Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, Abu Huraira, um, Ibn Hajar, he mentions over 40 names. names he names them. Oh, I think there's a. Oh, Five, seven, uh, Dr. Okay, next time we'll continue okay, with the transmission of the Quran and the Uthmani. Uh, the, Rahmani Codex and Chalm, so Allah said, Muhammad, he was a son of Muhammad, and he was a son of Muhammad. So last time we started talking about the transmission of the Quranic revelation. We said that the Quran has been transmitted in two ways, orally and in written form. We said that um, obviously the Quran uh, is required for the five daily prayers, so the Sahaba were constantly hearing and reciting and memorizing the Quran. This is something unique, uh, as we mentioned, um, in contrast to the Bible, at least the New Testament, uh, that was never seen in none of the books of the New Testament were seen by any of the Hawariyun of Isa Sunnah, according to the dominant opinion of historians. Certainly none of the books of the New Testament were known to Isa Sunnah. But we know that the Prophet uh, we know exactly what, what Suwak he used to recite at certain prayers. Uh, so we have a lot of reports. We also mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ listened to the recitation by his companions. We know that the Prophet ﷺ, he sent certain Sahaba to teach the Qur'an to different uh, tribes. He sent Mus'ab, as we said, to Yathrib, to the Ansar, and uh, he recited the Qur'an to them. We left off by saying, Imam al-Suyuti, uh, in the Itqan, fi al Qur'an, he mentions by name over 20 well-known Sahaba who are the father of the Qur'an. So these include the four caliphs, Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, Abu Huraira, and then women like Aisha, and Hafsa, and Musalama, and many others. Uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he mentions over 40 Hafad by name. In reality, there were hundreds of Hafad of the Qur'an, hundreds if not thousands of Hafad. There were also companions who wrote and collected the Qur'an during the life of the Prophet and this was sort of their main job. So Ubay ibn Ka'ab is mentioned, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Zayd. Uh, there was a group of companions that lived in the mosque in the surrounding precincts of the mosque called the Ashab Sufa. So the people of the bench, as it's sometimes translated. There's a there's an entire chapter in Martin Lings's Sirah of the Prophet called People of the Bench. You want to read more about them? Um, Suyuti puts that puts their number at 900. 900, not necessarily all at the same time, but during the 11 uh, year Medani period, there were some 900 uh, Sahaba whose main job was simply to write down the revelation and also to write down the hadith of the Prophet. Initially, the Prophet did not give permission to write the hadith down. He didn't want people to confuse them. Now, if you know Arabic very, very well, it's almost, you can be probably 95% accurate uh, when you hear a verse of the Quran and you hear a hadith. It's just different. Uh, however, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to be extra cautious. So later in the Medini period, he did uh, give permission to certain Sahaba to write the hadith, his hadith down. 
One of them was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As, who wrote something called as suhifa As-Sadiqa, where he collected some of the hadith of the Prophet And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As, one time he said to the Prophet he said, shall I write down from you when you're angry? What if you say something and you're angry? Shall I write it down? And the Prophet said, the one who sent, sent me in truth, nothing comes out of my mouth except the truth. And then he said, I joke, but I always speak the truth. Right? The Prophet ﷺ had a sense of humor. The, the personality of the Prophet ﷺ was that uh, very easygoing, right? Leinu Jayyib, Janib. So he was a very, very easygoing person. Da'ibun Bishra, he was always, he always seemed like he was happy. In Mosul, he calls him a tahak, the smiling prophet, right? So easygoing disposition. Uh, you know, did not even raise his voice, as Aisha says, even in the marketplaces. Just easygoing. You know, some people you who are in authority, you have to sort of walk on eggshells. You don't want to set them off. They might do something crazy. The Sahaba never, they had fear of him, of course, uh, and they were very uh, careful around him, but uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not, he didn't have that type of personality uh, where you had to walk on eggshells. He wasn't a loose cannon or anything like that. He was, he was a very humble person. Okay. There are tens of thousands of Sahaba, and there's about 124, 125,000 Sahaba. Some of the Urnama, they, they don't insist on that number. But they say that's around the number of Sahaba, 125,000, which is uh, about the same as the number of an Anbiya, according to the Hadith. Again, we don't insist on that number. There were 313 Sahaba at Badr, and according to the Hadith, uh, 313 or so Mursaleen, or Rusul, right? And then there's four archangels, there's four Khulafa al-Rashidin. Although Imam Sayyuti, in his book, Tariq al-Khulafa al-Rashidin, Imam Sayyuti had a book on the history of the rightly guided caliphs, he includes Imam Hassan ibn Ali as the fifth, fifth caliph, because technically he was caliph for six months. Uh, when he uh, abdicated to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And there's a hadith that says the rightly guided caliph, caliphate will last for 30 years. Uh, so when, when Sayyidina Ali was martyred, it was 29 years, six months. And um, Imam Hassan was, was the caliph for six months. Okay. Um, so the recitation of the Quran because so many Sahaba recited it, not just in Medina. You know, there were Arabs, there were Bedouin that did not live in Medina, but they were Muslim, there were Sahaba. They lived on the outskirts. The, the recitation of the Quran is tawatur, it's multiply attested. So this word tawatur in Arabic means multiple attestation. So something that's tawatur, like the Quran is tawatur, we have to believe in that report. It's part of our aqidah to believe in reports that are tawatur multiply attested. It's just too big uh, of an event for it to have been a lie, you know. Um, so there's hadith of the Prophet that are There's about a thousand of them according in the whole definition of Tawatur, that's also, you know, up to much speculation. Um, so ulama have different interpretations of what constitutes multiple attestation. Uh, but there's about a, a thousand or so hadith that are tawatur. One such hadith is, whoever sees me in a dream has truly seen me, for shaitan cannot take my form. So this is a hadith we have to believe in. The Prophet sallallahu another example, the Prophet sallallahu he mentioned um, ten men that he promised paradise. Now he promised many, many people paradise that are not on this list, right? Um, his, his daughter is not on this list, Fatima. But we know she's the, the master, the mistress of the women of paradise. Hassan and Hussein are not on this list. So why these ten? Why do they bring them and insist? You have to believe. Because these ten, uh, they they appear in traditions or reports that are mutawatir, that have tawatir, that are multiply attested. So it's part of our aqidah. So Imam uh, Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, he, he mentions these ten men in the creed, in his aqidah. We have to believe that, uh, that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and um, uh, Zubair ibn Awam, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, um, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd, and one more, it's not coming to me, 
we have to tell Ibn Allah that they are in paradise. <clears throat> and if you notice, if you look at that ten, uh, most of these ten are men that stood in front of blades and arrows at Uhud. I mean, they really actualized. And Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min al The Prophet's life is more important to the believers than their own lives. So Prophet sallallahu emphasized these are men of paradise so many times because they defended him physically. You know, they say, you know, put, put, they put themselves on the line defending him with life and limb. So the Prophet sallallahu reported in its tawatar that these men are in paradise. Okay. <coughs> um, we have a well-known story uh, in the Sirah about the uh, conversion of Sayyidina Umar, and that story is interesting because it testifies to the fact that the Qur'an was being written down in the Meccan period. So this is around 615, 616, so the Bi'afel was 610, that's when the revelation started, and the Prophet was around 40 years old, right? So we're told the sixth year of the Bi'atha, Sayyidina Umar, he, he was going to Darul Arkam to kill the Prophet And then Nu'ayr ibn Abdullah, he saw him, and he said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to the house of Arkam, I'm going to kill Muhammad. So Abdullah, he needed to buy some time for the Prophet to tell them that Umar is coming. So he said, don't you know your sister is already Muslim? Uh, he said, what, my sister Fatima? Yes. So he goes to Fatima's husband, his, his brother-in-law's house, his name was Sa'id. So he goes there and he could hear the Qur'an being recited. There was a scribe in the house named Khabab, because Sa'id was illiterate. And he was reciting the Qur'an. And then Sayyidina Umar breaks in, and we know the story, Khabab, he hides under some furniture or something. And then Fatima takes the, uh, the papyrus that, was, that they were reading, it was the actual manuscript that they had written Qur'an on, and she put it under her gown. And then Umar and Sa'id, they tussle a little bit. He kind of throws them down. Fatima comes and he strikes her. And then she starts bleeding. We know the story that he became full of remorse. And then he said, let me look at that thing that you were reciting. So in the, in the, she tells him, your najis and your, sh your shirk, you have to go wash yourself. Right? So he goes and washes himself. So he reads it in Surah Taha. And it's interesting in Surah Taha because the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Umar is like Musa. Umar is like Musa. They have this sort of common temperament, and they're they're very just. They have adala, and Sayyidina Umar was so just. He had adala in his physical body. He was ambidextrous. He could take a pen in each hand and write equally at the same time like this. That's how much adala he had, even in his physical body. Uh, so you know, the beginning of the surah is about Musa alayhi salam. You know, Taha ma anzalna alayka al Qur'an li Taha is one of the names of the Prophet But according to the Meccan dialect, according to Ibn Abbas, Taha also means, O oh reader, O oh man, we did, not, we did not reveal this Qur'an for it to be a source of distress for you. So Sayyidina Umar thought, oh, it's like it's a very personal message. And then we have the story of Musa salam, And he was reading about Musa alayhi salam. That sounds, he, I like this guy, I like this Musa alayhi salam. <laughs> this is what converted him. You know, this manuscript, we might actually have it the very manuscript. The oldest manuscript of the Qur'an on earth was recently discovered. It's called the Birmingham Manuscript. And I've actually spoken with the scholar that found it. She's, um, her name is Alba Fadeli. What country is she from? She's from Germany, I want to say. She actually gave a lecture at UC Berkeley and had a chance to talk to her. So they've had the manuscript, but they've misidentified it for years. You know the guy, you know, have you ever heard of Cadbury chocolates? Cadbury cream egg? So Mr. Cadbury, uh, he was sort of a, a very rich man, and he would sometimes fund these exp expeditions into the Middle East. So in one such expedition, his group found these Quranic manuscripts that they took back to England. So they, they, they saw this manuscript and they mislabeled it. They thought it was much later than they thought. Recently, Dr. Fideli, she looked at the manuscript and ran tests on it, and she discovered that the earliest date possible for this text uh, is 568 CE, and the latest is 645. And that's a very big swing, by the way. 
568 is before the birth of the Prophet So I asked her, why is this gap so large? It's not that old, I mean, comparatively speaking, I mean, you have dinosaur bones that are millions of millions. And she said, yeah, it is kind of a large gap. So I said, why is, it, why is it such a large gap? And I said, is it because maybe they want to add some controversy to it and try to say that it's a pre-Islamic uh, Christian manuscript or something? And she kind of said, no, I don't know about that, but it is, it is kind of a wide gap. <laughs> they have to add some controversy. There was another professor that was there who was almost falling out of her chair because she was so excited about this manuscript, but she wanted to ask, she had to wait till the very end. She said, so what's so different about this manuscript? Like, how, what's, what's different about it than the Quran the Muslims have now? And then Dr. Fidelity was just like, you know, there's no dots and there's no vowels. And she goes, well, I know that. What else? Like, nothing. I said, what? Nothing? <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> she was very mad. She wanted something. She wanted like another surah or something. You know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So this story, you know, it's it's interesting because it does prove that the Quran was written down in the Meccan period. Uh, there's a hadith in Bukhari um, where Zayd ibn Thabit. So Zayd ibn Thabit was the chief scribe of the Prophet He was a chief scribe, and it's interesting. He was actually taught how to read by a mushrik who was taken as captive at Badr. So when the Muslims defeated the mushrikeen at Badr. Um, some of them were taken as captive, and the Prophet said, I, I'll release you if you teach how to, if you teach ten Muslims how to read and write. So Zayd was one of the Muslims that actually was taught how to read and write from a mushrik that was caught captive at Mecca, and he became the chief scribe of the Prophet. And he spent time with the, the tribes of Bani Israel, and he learned Hebrew in three weeks or so. Right? So he was multilingual, and he would use he would refute their, their texts and their theology. Uh, so he was a chief. He said, Kuntu Jarabu. He relates a hadith in Tirmidhi. I was the neighbor of the Prophet. So Zayd used to live right next door to the Prophet. Well, he says, whenever the uh, wahi would descend upon the Prophet, uh, he would send for me and I would come and write it down for him. Right. And uh, it says in the hadith in Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ, he kept an ink pot and a scapula bone uh, in his own house, according to Suyuti. So the scapula bone means something to write on, like something that you can write on. The bones were used for like crude paper. And the Prophet would order him to write. The Quran is also called Al Kitab, the book, which can have different meanings. One meaning is something written. Right, so even the word kitab suggests there's kitaba happening at the time of the Quranic revelation. People are writing it down even before Medina. Uh, kitab also means a proper book or a codex. So that was not at the time of the Prophet of Islam, and they were going to say this is a prophecy that eventually would become a book. Kitab is also synonymous with a revelation. So kitab linguistically um, is a form three infinitive which simply means some sort of correspondence between two entities. So kitab doesn't necessarily mean something written, but some sort of correspondence between two, because form three is associative, right? So for example, kataba, to write to someone. Kataba just means to write. Kataba, you're writing to someone, you're corresponding. Someone else is reading it or receiving it. So not necessarily something written. Just like kataba means to kill someone, Qatala means to engage with another party, and you're both mutually fighting. <coughs> However, there is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, very interesting hadith, the Prophet said, because if you, if you go back in time, if you were to meet the Sahaba, and if you met a Sahabi at random, and you said, do you have the Qur'an? Right? Do you have the Qur'an? He would say yes, and you put your hand out like this. So, what are you doing? Do you, want, do you want some food or something? So, no, give me the Quran. He said, what? Give you the Quran. So when you say to a Sahabi, do you have the Quran, he has it in his mind. So say, what portion of the Quran do you want? What do you want me to recite to you? Right? So this idea of writing down the Quran, although it was happening at the time, it's not like, you know, this is a code, here's a book, here's the Quran. Right? However, there is a hadith of Bukhari Muslim. Very interesting. 
Do not take the Quran on a journey with you, for I am afraid lest it should fall into enemy hands. So here he's not talking, you know, don't take your Quran and your memory with you. That's not what he's obviously referring to. So he's referring to anything that you have that has Quran written on it. He's not talking about Mus'haf. There's no codex yet. That's later. That comes at the time of Rahman. We'll talk about that. So when you go on a journey, don't have a piece of paper. It's probably good for us now, right? When you're traveling overseas, don't have anything. <laughs> There's a brother who, uh, this was a long time ago, he had, he had a book, uh, Kitab al-Asasi, book one, very basic book on Arabic. The last lesson has a picture of the United Nations building. The, la the last lesson, is a picture. So he said he was stopped at an airport and they flipped through his book and they saw that picture. And they said they, they looked at every page. It took hours. I said, what is, what is that? That's the United Nations building. What's it doing in this book? I said, I don't know, it's an Arabic lesson. And he said, read it. He said, I can't read it. It's the last lesson. I'm like, I'm lesson five. <laughs> so you're refusing to read this? He said, I can't read it. I don't know how to read it. And they know how to read it. So they actually read it and said it's harmless. They wanted to see what he was going to say. Anyway. <laughs> and then, uh, so we come now to Jamr al-Qur'an, the collection of the Qur'an. It's called Jamr al-Qur'an. And the ulama say Jamr al-Qur'an has two meanings. One meaning is to memorize the Qur'an, right, to collect it in your mind. That's a form of Jamr. And also to uh, write down the Qur'an and preserve it. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa Qur'ana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is upon us to collect it, to collect the Qur'an. It is upon us to collect the Qur'an. So, Yawm al qiyam Surah Al-Qiyamah, uh, Ayah 17. So, Yawati says, the entire Qur'an was written down at the time of the Prophet But it was written on rudimentary materials. It was written on crude paper and parchment. So, papyrus, papyrus is like leaves that's made into paper, is very fragile. Parchment is animal skin. So the Birmingham manuscript is written on parchment. That's why it's lasted so long. Papyrus just kind of, to imagine holding a leaf, putting a leaf in your closet for 100 years, and then taking it out, and it just disintegrates. That's papyrus. Right? And you know, parchment was expensive. To make one codex, to make one Uthmani codex, 300 animals have to be slaughtered. It takes 300 animals to have enough skin to write one codex. So they're very expensive. <laughs> Sayyidina uh, Rahman, he, we'll talk about this, he had a few copies of the Imam manuscript. The Imam manuscript is his own personal copy of the Quran, the archetype he had in Medina. He made five or six copies and he sent them out into the provinces. And some people say, why only five or six? You know, six times 300, that's like 2,000 animals. It's very difficult to make one codex. There's no printing press, right? at least not in that part of the world. The Westerners get credit for everything. Gutenberg invented the printing press, actually some China men invented the printing press long before Gutenberg, but they get all the credit. You know, Pascal's wager, say Nadi so the same thing, much before that. Anyway. Okay. <coughs> you, you, I don't know if you saw the opening ceremony. This is off. This is tangential, but the um, opening ceremonies of the Olympics in Brazil. They had this guy with a long mustache driving a, flying a plane, and the commentator comes on and says, "Many people are." And he said, "Many Americans are confused right now." So the Brazilians actually believe it was a Brazilian man who invented motorized flight. It wasn't the Wright brothers. So they would contest that, <laughs> and every country has different people that would they would say. And there's evidence that the ancient Egyptians had electricity in the pyramids, electricity, because they said there's no way they could have built these things inside of these pyramids. It's just they wouldn't be able to see anything. It's impossible. The torches wouldn't work. So they they have a lot of theories as to how they did that. Some of them say they had some sort of crude electrical system. So. There goes your Thomas Edison. <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay. Anyway. It's okay. It's not, it's not a big deal. As long as we have that in everything's a, a near mark. Um, so, 
So, the, and so you have papyrus, you have parchment, you have leaves, you have animal bones. It was not codified. When I say codified, I mean bookified. You know, bib biblicized, if you will. It wasn't made into a book, the Quran, until later. It wasn't brought together as a single codex or scroll until after the passing of the Prophet. So different companions at the time of the Prophet them, they had different portions of the written Quran. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of Hafav. However, the Prophet them, according to sacred sources, himself fixed the arrangement of the surahs and would recite it as such. There is an opinion, it's a, min it's a minority opinion, amongst Muslim ulama that Sayyidina Uthman actually arranged the suwar of the Quran. And he basically went from the largest to the smallest. Remember I mentioned that. Uh, maybe last time or the time before that. So that's a minority opinion. That's sort of the Western, the, the dominant opinion amongst Western uh, Islamicists, Theodore Noldeke, the history of the Quran, the standard Western text. Because all pre modern books were like that, the Mishnah is like that. You have the largest sections, and then as you read along, it gets shorter and shorter. The New Testament is like that. But there are multiple hadith that say the, Proph the Prophet ﷺ himself would recite the Qur'an in this order. It's not a big deal, because the surah is a coherent literary unit, right? So if you read a surah and you come to the end, that's the end of the surah. Right? It's not like you have to read the surah after, right? It's, it's not a must to do that. Although sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would join surahs in prayer, um, but it's not a must that you have to do that. Like for example, Ibn Mas'ud would always recite what duha and in the alam nashrah like a sadraq every single time. And he said that he got that from the Prophet. There's nothing incumbent upon you to do that though. If you're in prayer and you recite what duha, you can recite it ikhlas in the next rakah. It's okay. Right? So he, that's a sunnah of the Prophet to do those two together. Okay. <coughs> and the Hanafis have these interesting rules about what to recite in which rakah. So going to the Hanafis, you can't skip one surah. You can't single a surah out like that. It isn't like that. So if you do what duha in the first rakah, you can't do what uh, was zaytun, because you skipped one surah. It's considered makru. And Abu Hanifa and the Hanafis, they don't like it if you recite backwards. So in the first rakah, you do ikhlas, and in the second, you do kawthar. Because now you're moving backwards. They don't like that. Even if you're going in chronological order, Right? If it's not in the, what's known as the canonical order of the Qur'an, canonical, Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, so on and so forth, and that's, that's the order we should, we should follow, according to the Hanafi school. It's Makru if you don't do that. Oh. <coughs> I mean, prayer is still valid, Shara'an, but it's considered something that's reprehensible, <coughs> disliked. So there are multiple hadith. There are three hadith in Bukhari that describe something called al-mu'arada. Mu'arada, form three again. Ain-ra-dad. Mu'arada means a mutual presentation. This was witnessed by multiple sahaba, including Fatima and Zayd and Uthman ibn Mas'ud, that the Prophet wasallam on the last ten nights of Ramadan, he would go in i'tikaf in the masjid. He would have seclusion in the masjid, and Jibreel alayhi salam would sit with him and they would present Quran to each other. So Jibreel alayhi salam would, in a sense, review his recitation every year. Jibreel alayhi salam would recite the Quran, the Prophet would repeat. This was witnessed, this was inside the masjid. So this was, visit, this was witnessed by multiple Sahaba. The last 10 nights of Ramadan, uh, during the Madani period every year. And in the final year of the Prophet sallam, uh, this happened twice. So he was 20 nights in Ertikaf, his final year, his final Ramadan. So he reviewed the Quran twice. And the Sahaba said, this is the order in which he recited the Quran. The canonical order is the way he recited the Quran, not the chronological order. So he didn't begin again with Iqra and then end with whatever is at the end, the last two ayahs of Tawbah or something in Baqarah. We'll talk about that. He recited according to the canonical order. Because the Quran is a, uh, every surah is a distinct literary unit. Okay. <clears throat> so there are three stages of collection. Three stages of collection of the Quran. <clears throat> the first stage is at the time of the Prophet. So at the time of the Prophet, 
The Quran was fi sudurin nas. It was in the hearts of humanity. In other words, they memorized it. This again was an oral culture. Right? Hifid was always primary over kitabah. Memory always took precedence over the written text. Now it's the other way around. But at the pre-modern world, most cultures were oral, and we said even in Athens at the time of Socrates and Plato, 90% of the populace was illiterate. And it was also written on various scattered rudimentary materials. Right? So the entire Quran was written, and it was written on these different types of materials, and, and hundreds, if not thousands of Sahaba had the entire Quran collectively, but that wasn't such a big issue. The big issue was they all had it, many of them had it memorized. Right? The recitation of the Quran is established by oral transmission. In an oral society, it is always primary. Orality today is secondary. So today, if you go to a masjid and you stand behind an imam and he leads the prayer, and he recites something that you don't recognize, and you go home and look in your mushaf, and you can't find it, it's not Qur'an. And the guy leading is probably a federal agent. <laughs> so, write down his badge number. But at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if you stand behind him, and he recites something, and you go home and look into your papers, your leaves, and your parchments, and your papyri, and you don't find it there, your collection is incomplete, he is right. So write it down. That's why we have Masahif attributed to Ibn Mas'ud and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Ibn Abbas, that are not complete. Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf, if it's authentic, and this is a big issue, um, a very good book that I recommend on this topic is by M. M. Al A'lami. It's called the, um, the Compilation of the Quranic Text. It's a book I teach at Zaytuna to the sophomores. It's a, really a comparison between the compilation, canonization of the Quran, uh, in comparison to the New and Old Testaments. And he has a beautiful chapter, chapter 13 of the book, in the appraisal of the so-called Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud. So there's a lot of questions about, is this really by Ibn Mas'ud? Anyway, Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf, quote-unquote, is missing Al-Fatiha, al Surah Al-Fatiha. So some Western Islamists say, look, even Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud, he didn't believe Al-Fatiha is Qur'an, which is completely ludicrous. Because three of the seven canonized qira'at of the Qur'an, three of the seven, come from Ibn Mas'ud. And, and all of those qira'at, they recite Al-Fatiha. So it, the orality of Surah Al-Fatiha is without question. Why did he not write it down? Allahu Akbar. Maybe he just thought it was axiomatically obvious that this is Qur'an. Why should I write it down? I mean, this is a Mus'haf in his own personal collection. And some Sahaba have notes. They, they quote hadith in the margin. So Western scholars look at that and say, look, they think this hadith is Qur'an. Right? Ubay ibn Ka'ab, he wrote uh, Dua al-Qunut in the margin. And then Nolde case says, oh, look, this is an extra surah of the Qur'an. We got it. No, it's a Dua. Because the Prophet says, after Fajr, and after Maghrib, sometimes he would raise his hands and make dua in the prayer. And this is what he would say, and this is how I wrote it down. It doesn't mean that, Ubay no kaqari, this is Quran. Right? But they tried things, right? It's like the lady at UC Berkeley, like, ah, what's wrong with the Muslim, with the manuscript? So there's certain things they look at. They, they just want, you know, the, the, the Christians every so often, they find this like the Dead Sea Scrolls, although it's not really Christian, the Nag Hammadi Library of 1945. New Gospels, right? That's what they discovered. The Gospel of Thomas. Like, whoa, this kind of blows the lid off of what we have in the Bible, right? It's so different. There's no passion. There's no death of Christ in the Gospel of Thomas. So they're looking for something like that. They want to find like, whoa, you know, here's, you know, I don't know, Surah Ahlul Bayt. Here it is, Surah Ahlul Bayt. The Shia were right. You know, <laughs> Uthman, he took out these verses. <laughs> Not all Shia believe that. Very few minority. We'll talk about that as well. <clears throat> you know, again, this is one of those big conspiracy theories, right? Sayyidina Rahman was able to remove verses about Ahlul Bayt, and he was able to convince every single Muslim in the world to do the same and to keep it. 
too big of a lie to be true. <clears throat> okay, anyway. So, and then the second stage of collection. So, so the first stage of collection, fisuduri nas. The second stage, and, and then written on various rudimentary materials. The second stage of collection, during the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, the first caliph. Were scattered portions of the Quran, we're going to talk about this process, scattered, scattered portions of the Quran were compiled and their contents were transcribed upon suhuf, suhuf, scrolls. And these are papyri, suhuf or scrolls. So this is no longer extant. The vicissitudes of time have taken away the scrolls from us. We don't have them. And then the third stage is the time of Sayyidina Uthman, where the contents of the scrolls were transmitted upon parchment and made into a mushaf, a codex, a book, a proper book. These scrolls are cumbersome because you have to, you have to open them like this. You ever been to it? Probably not, but I have. I've been to a synagogue? Probably not, right? Um, maybe, yeah. I've been to many synagogues. I do a lot of interfaith work. Don't get the wrong idea. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, you know, they had this huge Torah scroll which you have to hold with these two large pieces of wood. And you have to sort of unwind it like that. That's a traditional way of sort of reading the Torah. So initially the Quran was written on scrolls, and then the codex is so much nicer. I mean, this is this is a codex. It's nothing, it's light. I can hide it, I can sneak it onto a plane, and look how much ink is on this little book. It's amazing. Really, in the Arma, that we can have a codex. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we have a codex at the time of Sayyidina Arfaman. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> if you look on, if you have a book, maybe you can look on someone else. Maybe you can share. Page, thir uh, um, page is this? 36 and 37 of the Von Denver. 36 and 37. So, let's talk about this a little bit. <laughs> There's a good job here, the chronology of the written text. So you have top left, right? The Prophet Sallallahu prophethood commences, the Bi'atha, around 610. You move to the right, first revelation of Ghari uh, Hira, Jabal al-Nur, translated orally, right? 610 to 632, you have the Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca and Medina. So 610 to 622 is the Meccan period, about 85 suwar, or Meccan. 85 of them. In 622 to 632, you have the Madani period, about 29 suwar, revealed to the Prophet We have continuous revelation on numerous occasions, so 114 suwar, about 6,236 6, verses in the Quran. It's about the size, roughly, of the New Testament. Transmitted orally after memorization by many, and writing down revelation by various companions upon the direct instruction of the Prophet. We said that Suyuti and Al Qatada, they put the number of the people of the bench around 900. The chief scribe of the Prophet, Zayd ibn Thabit. 632, the, the death of the Prophet. Last revelation a few days before this. The last ayah of the Quran, according to Imam Suyuti, is most likely Surah Al Baqarah, verse 281. So it's not al yawma akmantu lakum dinakum. This verse, th this day I have perfected your religion. Wa atmantu alikum ni'amati, right? You know this in Al Ma'ida. That's a portion of verse 3 of Surah Al Ma'ida. This was revealed at Hajjatul Wada, the farewell pilgrimage. So there's more Quran revealed after that. The ulama say, perhaps the meaning of the kamal of the deen here means that there's no more ahkam revealed after this ayah. There are no more verses of the Quran that have jurisprudential uh, effect to them. Right? But there's still Quran coming to the Prophet, um, the type of ayat that would be classified as ma'ad. Remember we talked about uh, the thematic categorization of the ayat of the Quran. Ma'ad was the most prevalent type of theme of the early revelations, and it also ended the revelation. So the Quran comes full circle. So chapter 2, verse 281, وَاتَّقُوا Fear the day in which you will be returned to Allah. This is the final ayah of the Quran of Suyuti. Some of the ulama say, the last two ayahs of at were the last. 
ayat. Laqad ja'akum rasulun min anfusikum azizun alayhi ma anitum hadisun alaykum bil mu'minina raufur rahim. Fa intawalla fa qul hasbiya Allah la ilaha illa huwa alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. That is, these are the final two I attain of the Quran. This is the dominant opinion. It's 2 to 81. Uh, the last surah of the Quran, complete chapter, is Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi Wal Fatah. This is Madani, but revealed in Mecca. So anything after the Hijrah is Madani. But this was actually revealed to the Prophet وسلم, when he was in Mecca, but after the Hijrah. So it's considered Madani. <clears throat> And this is a reference to the Fatha Mecca. And uh, Abu Bakr, when he heard the surah, he began to cry. They asked him why. He said, This means the, the death of the Prophet is imminent. <clears throat> Complete revelation left behind in the memories of various companions as well as on various written materials. 632 to 634, Abu Bakr's Caliphate. 633, we have a battle called the Battle of Yamama. It's in 11 Hijri. 12 Hijri, something, I think 11 Hijri. So, 633, Battle of Yamama. This was against Musaylama al Qaddaf, the man who was claiming to be a prophet. He was killed in this battle by Wahshi. So, um, during this time, uh, many of the Hafav were also being killed in, in other military expeditions as well. And so, uh, Sayyidina Umar, he comes to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, this is mentioned in Bukhari. He said, we should collect the Qur'an onto scrolls. And Abu Bakr's immediate response was, this is bid'ah, which you're suggesting. This is an innovation. This is something the Prophet ﷺ never did. Right? We should, how can we do that? And then Sayyidina Umar was able to convince him. So now they have ijtihad. Right? They sit down and discuss. What are the pros and cons of this? So you just get every bid'ah. There's a hadith that every bid'ah is in the, in the fire. This is, a, this is a way of speaking. Right? It's not to be taken literally. Obviously, every bid'ah that has no basis in religion, right? has no basis in religion, then those are to be rejected. But this is something that uh, has a basis uh, because you know, the Sahaba want people to preserve the Qur'an because it's fault to recite the Qur'an in prayer. Right? So he sat down and he was able to convince Abu Bakr Siddiq that this is indeed a good thing. Right? So the Hafad are being killed, and that's a problem, because Hifid in this time, in this time, this pre-modern time, is always prioritized over Kitaba, over what's written. So now, you know, the Hafad are dying, we should use what they've remembered, memorized, and finally write it down. Right? So Abu Bakr Siddiq, he agrees, and then they call for Zayd ibn Thabit. And they say to Zayd, we have a project for you. You are going to <laughs> be in charge of the transcription of the Qur'an onto scrolls. Right? And then Zayd's response is, this is bid'ah. <laughs> How can I do this? Imam Shafi'i says, al-bid'ah bid'atan. This is dominant opinion. This is, this is a standard opinion. Bid'ah is of two kinds. There's bid'ah hasana and zayd hasana. There's good and bad bid'ah. Right? Technically, the tashkil, you know, what do you call it? Zeb Zeb Tesh, Fatha, Kasra, Dhamma, technically that's bid'ah. You look in any Uthmani manuscript, you won't find no Zeb Zeb Tesh. So let's, let's just, you know, forget about it. No, it helps people read the Quran correctly. It's a good thing. Right? The lines in the masjid, technically bid'ah. Go to the Prophet's mosque, well, no, no, I don't know about now. At the time of the Prophet said, there are no lines in the masjid. Right? But this helps people line up, no problem. Right? Okay. So Zayd, he goes to the masjid and he calls for all of the Sahaba who have any piece of Quran to bring it to the mosque. He wants to know what the Sahaba are considering to be Quran. What do you think is Quran? What do you have in your house that you think is Quran? Bring it into the masjid. And what does he do? He checks it against his memory and the memory of his memories of his committee. So they have the entire Quran. So what, what's the purpose of this? Is to ensure total accuracy, to align the written Quran with its oral recitation. And based on the ayah, ayatul dain, was tashhidu shahidain 
Nuri Jadiku, and uh, have two witnesses from your men to bear witness. Two men of good standing uh, were required, who were present at the time when the Prophet وسلم, was given that portion of the Quran, whatever it is, at the time it was revealed to him, two witnesses who were there at the time of the Waqi. Or they were in the masjid, for example, because sometimes the Prophet would receive Quran when he was with Aisha or by himself or somewhere else. The first time that the Prophet وسلم, uh, presented these ayahs in prayer in the masjid. Two witnesses for every piece of Quran that was brought. Okay. Um, so, uh, Zaid, he wrote down, uh, and then he, he discovered that that everything that was brought into the masjid matched what was in his memory, in the memories of the Hafal. Uh The end of Tawbah, the last two ayahs I mentioned, there was only a singular attestation. So Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari, he was actually uh, the only witness they could find for the, those final two ayahs uh, of Tawbah. But many heard those ayahs from the Prophet Sallallahu thereafter. So even Hajar considered it Tawatur. So Zayd wrote it down in the Surah. The reason why there was only a singular attestation, probably because it was, they were the last ayahs revealed, or some of the last ayahs revealed. But many Sahaba heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu thereafter, later on, uh, from him. Okay. Now, so, the uh, Quran is written on these scrolls. And during the uh, Caliphate of Sayyidina Umar, the Suhruf are kept by Hafsa, the daughter of Sayyidina Umar, who is a widow of the Prophet as mentioned in Bukhari. Now we have the Caliphate of Sayyidina Uthman, 644 to 56. The Suhruf remained with Hafsa bin Umar. 653, you have uh, military campaigns against Armenia and Azerbaijan and other non-Arab lands. Hudayfa comes to Sayyidina Uthman and he says to him, there are serious differences amongst the Muslims in the provinces. They're making errors in the recitation. So, we have to understand, <clears throat> the, the non-Arabs, right, on the frontier, in cities that are being newly converted, people that are becoming Muslim, non-Arabs, like Farsi-speaking peoples, they have fragmentary manuscripts of the Qur'an written in shorthand. Shorthand Arabic is extremely difficult to read, even if you're Arab. Extremely difficult. There's no dots. There's no vowel notations. Right? It's very difficult to read. Uh, you can actually look at the Birmingham manuscript if you go on their website and just sit there and try to read it. You'll be, you won't even recognize the best mela. That's how difficult it is to read. Right? Um, so you have non-Arabs, right, that are trying to read this text, and they're making grave errors. So you're allowed some leeway with lahja, with, with uh, dialect, and it doesn't change the meaning, it's okay. For example, some people refuse to correct their qira'ah, but if you say, what is zalim, you know, okay, you haven't changed the meaning. Right? But that's not the very that's not a very good that's not the best tajwi. Izaja, there's a brother one time, older man, who were taking tajwi classes, and he said, Izaja, and then the Urama said, Idaja. He said, Okay, I got it. Izaja, he just refused to take correction. <laughs> so this is how I was taught since I was a kid. And then the Mulan is like, So what? <laughs> it's not correct. He said, Well, it's not correct. Am I am I you know saying something wrong? Is it against the Quran? He said, No, but but sometimes it does make a difference. And it's, and it's, um, uh, for example, in, in Yemen, the Qaf is pronounced Gul. Is it Gul who Allahu Ahad? And that's acceptable. It's okay. It's Lahja. It doesn't change the meaning. It's acceptable variance, if you will, dialectical variance within the acceptable dialectical parameters. Right? But sometimes it, it changes the meaning completely. Or sometimes people, you know, they, taint, they turn the Ha into a Ah, so Muhammad becomes Muhammad. Muhammad means something completely different. Right? And they give Adhan like that. Or they make Adhan and say, Hayya ala al-fallah, al Come to the farmer. Come to the farmer. But 
was a man, he was giving Adhan <coughs> in the past, and he said, ah, Allahu Akbar, and then he was stopped by the authorities. He said, who taught you Adhan? He said, nobody. He said, don't ever make it again, because you made it into a question. Oh, is God great? Is God great? So they thought he was trying to do something. He said, no, I don't know what I'm doing. Or Abu Aswad al Duwali, one time he heard a man reciting the prayer, and the man said, Inna Allah bari'un min al-mushrikeena wa rasulihi. And he went. And then he pulled him aside and he said, who taught you your qira'ah? He said, no, no, no. I just like to leave prayer. He said, no, I'll do it again. Because he completely changed the meaning. In the Allah bari'u min al-mushrikeena wa rasuluhu. That's the correct reading. So God and his prophet have dissolved all obligations for the mushrikeen. Not God has dissolved all obligations from the mushrikeen and the prophet. Like God withdraws his trust from the prophet. <coughs> so, you know, rusuluhu, rusulihi, that's the difference. Dhamma to kasra makes a world of difference. Right? <clears throat> so there's acceptable variants. The, the hafs, they say, Malik yom din Malik, owner. Right? Hafs is from Ibn Mas'ud. The Wash, Nafi is reading in North Africa. Medik yom din Medik. Medik means king, owner, king. Acceptable variant. Allah's both of these. And both of these readings are tawatur, that go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Or we talked about the Wudu verse. One is accusative, one is genitive. Wash your feet, wipe your feet. Both are acceptable. Wash your feet is the normal state. Wipe your feet if you're having, if you wear khufain, if you have socks on. Both readings are tawatul. That's an interesting thing about Arabic is that you know, in English, you sort of just have to repeat the same thing and tweak it a little bit. In Arabic, you can move the tashkil around and get a different meaning with the same rasam, the same consonantal skeleton. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is what's happening with the non-Arabs. So you can imagine... But if you took the consonantal skeleton of one word. Oh, this is what's in the manuscript. These early manuscripts. So, how do you read that? Well, if you're a half of the Quran and you know it's before and after, you can probably make a very good guess. If you're half of the Quran, you, you don't even need this. If you've been taught the Quran, you've memorized it, if you're an Arab, maybe you can get it. Right? Well, what is what can this be? It could be qatala, he killed. It could be filon, an elephant. It's a big difference between he killed and an elephant. It could be qutila, he was killed, passive voice. It could be qabla, before. Before. It could, it could be qatala, he massacred. Qutila, he was massacred. Qabbala, he kissed. Kubbila, he was kissed. Absolutely. So, this is a big problem. Okay. And shorthand manuscripts, they don't have i'ajam. I'ajam are these diacritical dots. And they don't have tishkiyah, vowel notations. So, non Arabs. In these non-Arab lands, <coughs> they're reciting the Quran completely incorrectly. They're changing words, changing meanings. Right? Now, what's happening in Arab lands? You have these fragmentary manuscripts of the Quran that are written uh, with the spelling conditions of different Arab tribes. Okay, different Arab tribes. So the Qur'an is revealed in the dialect of Quraysh. And there is a difference of opinion, what are the seven ahruf of the Qur'an? One opinion is the ahruf, or seven dialects of Arabic. Another opinion is the Qur'an was only revealed in Qurayshi Arabic. But the Qur'an has seven variations in its text. We can talk about that later. But you have these different manuscripts of the Qur'an, 
written in, the, in different spelling conventions. For example, English has different, their, American English has 23 dialects. Right? There's 23 dialects of American English. And, you know, these are called like um, North, West, Midland, and Appalachian South, and Boston Urban, and like Bay Area Hippie or something, I don't know. <laughs> But then you have, in, in England, you have different dialects as well, right? And, and English, British English and American English sometimes have different spelling conventions. So the word color is spelled C-O-L-O-U-R. There's a U in there in British English. If you try to write that on your typewriter in American English, or typewriter, on your laptop, it'll underline the word in red, meaning you've misspelled it. In America, it's misspelled. In England, you're okay, right? So it's the same with, with Arabic. You have these manuscripts written in, written with the orthography, meaning spelling, style, and conventions of different Arab tribes. Sometimes it doesn't change the meaning or the tara'a, but sometimes it does. So now, and of course, the Arabs also at this time were not trained by Sahaba. They have these sort of uh, they have this sort of tribal asabiya. Like this, this is my tribe. This is the only. This is the correct recitation of the Quran. My, this is the only dialect that I'll accept from the Quran, right? So you have this idea happening. For example, the, the word tabut, it's mentioned in the hadith, the word tabut um, in Qureshi dialect is spelled ta alif ba wow ta, tabut. But in other dialects that you find in early manuscripts, it's spelled tabu with a tamarbuta at the end, tamarbuta, right? So this came into play during this time. So Zayd went to Uthman and said, which one should I write down? So Zayd Uthman said, the Qureshi, the Qureshi dialect, tabut, proper tab. So what does Zayd Uthman do? Is that he tries to recall all of these fragmentary manuscripts. He does the best he can. You know, it's not like, you know, he sent out this army, you know, give up your manuscript or, you know, no, nothing like that. He tries to recall them from the major metropolitan areas, right, from the major masajid, major centers, as much as he can. He brings them back to Medina, he destroys them, and then uh, he has Zaid um, copy the suhruf onto a codex. Okay? So remember, the suhruf were done at the time of Abu Bakr, right? It matches exactly the memories of the Hafat, the early Sahaba. So you take the suhruf now, and you, he transcribed it onto the Mus'haf. And then five or six copies of the original Mus'haf called the Imam Manuscript, the archetype that stayed in Medina. Sayyidina Uthman was reading this manuscript when he was martyred. And it might still be extant. There is a, there is a uh, manuscript in, museum, in the museum in Istanbul that, that some of the Urlamas say there's some markings they say that's the blood of Uthman, Allah Hu right? <clears throat> So what he does is then, he makes five or so copies of that codex. These are called the Amsar, Amsar, with a saw, the Amsar. And these copies are sent to Mecca, Damascus, Kufa, Basra, another one in Medina, and some say one in Cairo. There's at least five, possibly six, copies that were made of the Imam manuscript. Now, how does this solve the issue then? Oh, okay. Uh, do you hear the break? I'm in the middle of a very, okay. We'll come back to <laughs> I have to stop. Sorry. I'll see you next time. So I'm going to come here. It was put in the state archives. And then we learn at the time of Sayyidina Uthman that there are fragmentary manuscripts um, with the frontiers uh, that are not vowel, are not dotted, are being mispronounced by Arabs and non-Arabs. Uh, so those were collected as much as possible uh, and they were destroyed. And then Zayd uh, ibn Thabit and his committee of 12 Sahaba, uh, they recopied the Sukhruf and remember each piece that the Sukhruf was based on required two witnesses who were there at the time of the revelation of the Prophet or when he first presented these ayat in the, in the masjid. Uh, so then Sayyidina Uthman, he has Zayd write a codex, Mus'haf, in the, 
in the bosom of uh, the Porej. Uh, so, and there's an orthographical style of the Porej. And then that's where we left off. And then uh, we can add to that that uh, at least five copies of that Mus'haf were made. So the Mus'haf that was in the possession of Sayyidina Uthman is called the Imam Manuscript. The Imam Manuscript. And there are some manuscripts in the world, even today, that could be the Imam Manuscript. Probably the most common, the most famous of these is in Uzbekistan, called the Tashkent Manuscript. Uh, and some of the ulama who have looked at the manuscript closely have seen traces of blood on one of the pages, which they claim is the blood of Sayyidina Uthman. Uh, According to the story of his martyrdom, uh, he was reading from Surah Baqarah when he was struck and, and killed. Um, there are other places, Top Kathy Museum, that have very ancient manuscripts as well, which could be one of these Uthmani codices. So anyway, five copies at least were made of the Imam manuscript, and they were sent to major metropolitan areas. One was sent to Mecca, one to Dimash, Damascus, the Kufa, the Basra, one maybe to Al Qahira, to Cairo, and there's some discussion that a second manuscript was kept in Medina to Munawwara. But also, this we really left off is right here. We said that these manuscripts, these Uthmani codices, they also lacked tashkil. They didn't have vowel notations, and they didn't have i'jam. They did not have uh, uh, diacritical dots. Uh, so how did Sayyidina Uthman avoid the same problem as before? What he did was he sent a professional qari, a professional reciter of the Qur'an, with, with each manuscript to teach that area how to recite the Qur'an in all seven of the ahruf, in all seven dialects of the Qur'an. So you have the rasam standardized, stabilized in the khat of Madani, of, uh, which is probably Hijazi, Hijazi script in the style of Qureshi dialect. Uh, but then uh, you can plug in, as it were, all seven of the Qur'a'at into the Rasm. Uh, so this is how it was taught from that point on to ensure proper pronunciation. Okay, so that was the transmission. Uh, there was a question about um, Tafsir of the Qur'an. We'll, we'll deal with that. Now we have a section on Tafsir coming, inshallah. Right. Um, so we'll get more into that. Uh, but generally, the best type of Tafsir is Tafsir of Quran with the Quran. This is called Tafsir bin Riwaya. Right? So every good Mufassir knows how to make Tafsir with the Quran. In other words, when the Quran mentions something like Laylatul Qadr, or, or I should say Laylatul Mubarakah, there's an eye in the Quran, I think Surah Al Dukhan, where it mentions a blessed night. What is this blessed night? Well, over here, if you read over here, it says Laylatul Qadr. So that's probably what it's referring to. Right? So there are times when the Prophet will explain these ayat. Right? So this is the best type of tafsir. Tafsir bil riwaya. Explaining the Quran with the Quran or explaining the Quran with the hadith, authentic hadith of the Prophet. Right? And this is where conservative scholars will stop. Right? Uh, so like the Hanabila, the early Hanbalis, did not engage in kalam, right, speculative theology. They would stop at the hadith, and that's it. Now, um, other schools of theology thought it was important uh, to expand the exegetical tradition of the tafsir for the purposes of um, not only making the Qur'an relevant for that particular time in people, but also to uh, deal with some of these uh, false theologies that had sprung up. Right? Because you do have, you know, Mu'tazila theology. Uh, you do have Shia, if you're a Sunni, Shia theology. There's problematic elements to it. Uh, you have the Jabariya, the Qadariya, the, um, the Antinomians, you have the Determinists, you have all these Mujassima, you have the anthropomorphists, so sometimes it's necessary to expand a little bit on these. So, but the best tafsir is bil riwaya, right? And then the next level of tafsir um, uh, is bil ra'i, 
tafsir bin ra'i, and this is somewhat controversial. Ra'i means according to opinion, right? So um, this is when the mufassir will say, will, will give his opinion as to what he thinks it says, based on his understanding of Quran and Sunnah, right? Uh, but Allahu Alam. Right? Um, so this is a way again of making the Quran relevant for our time. This is a big question that the youth have in America. What does this book mean to me? You know, you read these ayat, okay, that's great. It's talking about Ghazwat Muhammad. What does that have to do with me? You know, um, you know, it's talking about uh, the Mushrikeen and how they attack the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does that have to do with me? The lesson there is obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? That's the transcendental lesson. But what does that have to do with my life? you make it relevant. So that's tafsir bin ra'i. Right? So uh, Imam Qurtubi, right, uh, the, the classical medieval scholars, they engage in tafsir bin ra'i. And then you have tafsir bin ishara, which is the most controversial. Tafsir, tafsir bin ishara, which is like a mystical exegesis, like a ta'weel, like a ta'weel. Uh, so Something like Ibn Ajiba, Ibn Wahidin, Ibn Arabi, right? Um, this type of uh, mystical tafsir. Allah. But we'll get back to this topic. But the best, the Sunnah, a Sunnah to, to Fasil al Quran. This is the axiom of the scholars. The Sunnah makes tafsir of the Quran. Many, many hadith. The Prophet will go to the Sahaba and he say, Mada taqul fi hadil ayah. What do you say about this verse? And they say, Allah Rasulullah And he explains what it means. This happens hundreds of times in the hadith literature. We'll come to hadith, welcome to uh, tafsir. But today is asbab al nuzul Asbab al nuzul which means the occasions of the revelation. These are called historical contextualizations uh, of the ayat of the Quran. So the primary function of learning Asbab al Nuzul is to make tafsir. What is Asbab al Nuzul? So it sheds light on the ayat's immediate context and meanings. Right? Uh, it answers the question what event, what situation, what question, what issue, what occasion prompted the initial descent of an ayat? What is the original context of the ayah? Right? It's called asbab in the zoo. Asbab is the plural, sabab uh, is the singular. Monsoyuti actually has a book on this topic. Lubab al nubur ki asbab in The quintessence of transmissions concerning the occasions of revelation. The term sabab is a technical term. It's first used by Imam at tabari Imam at tabari was great exeget historian, he died 922 Miladi. So there's no hadith, you won't find the word sabab in any hadith that has this technical meaning. You're not going to see something like hadha sabab al you know, bihadihi al ayah, something like that. So in the hadith you find things like fa'unzila ilayhi, then it was revealed to him. Or fa'anzalallahu ilayhi, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to him. Nazalat ayatun fi hada. A verse was revealed concerning this. Right? So the oldest book on this topic is no longer extant, but it was called Kitab al-Tanzil by a scholar named Ali ibn Madani. He was a sheikh of Imam al-Bukhari. But the book is no longer available, it's not extant. So the oldest extant book we have on this topic and the most celebrated was by a scholar named Ali ibn Ahmad al-Wahidi. Al-Wahidi. And he died in 1075 Miladi. His book is called Asbab al-Nuzul, The Occasions of Revelation. It's been translated into English. It's uh, published by Fons Vitae. Fons Vitae. It's about 300 pages. And Imam al-Wahidi, he gives the Asbab for about 570 ayat, which is by no means, you know, a good portion of the Quran is about 6,200 
ayat of the Quran. Right, so 570 ayat and about 83 suwar, 83 surahs. The major drawback to the text is that Imam al-Wahidi was not a hadith scholar. Right, so many of the reports conflict. Right, many of them are weak. Some have no sanad whatsoever. He'll say things like, Qala ahlul ilm, the people of knowledge you say. And that, you know, is good enough for some people. But for hadith scholars, not good enough. You need to give me a sanad. Right? Or say, Qala mufassirun, the exigent say, so and so. Or he'll say, Qala suddi, Qala kalbi. So he'll quote scholars, or he'll quote sources that have some uh, weakness in their thiqa, in their um, uh, reliability. Okay, but nonetheless, it's uh, all of the great scholars of the Quran, Imam al Tashi, Imam al-Wahidi, Imam Suyuti, Ibn Taymiyyah, all of them agree that Quranic tafsir is invalid without knowledge of the asbab of the Quran's nuzul. You need to have knowledge of the asbab of the nuzul. One can make grave errors without this knowledge. Before we get into some examples, I want to talk about the major categories of asbab. Major categories. Why were Quranic ayat revealed? Uh, the most common was a response to an event or a situation in the life of the Prophet So in the Quran we have a lot of ayat that say, obey the messenger. Obey Allah and obey his messenger. Obeying the messenger is obeying Allah. Variations like that. So many of these ayat were revealed because of Ghazwat Bahram. This is the sabab and nuzul of these ayat that deal with obeying the Prophet Why? Because as we know, in Ghazwat Bahram, there was a group of archers that the Prophet told to stay put. He said, even if you see us routing the enemy, or if you see the birds plucking out our eyes because we've been defeated, do not leave this post until I come and get you myself. So 10 of the 40 men stayed, including Abdullah ibn Jubair, who was martyred. 30 of the men thought the battle was over, so they left. And then you have a tragic event, followed by a tragic event after that. The main lesson is uh, to obey the Prophet Or we see Abbas wa Tawalla. See, the Quran does not go into these details. It's not like the Bible. The Bible is, there's a lot of narrative details that seem just superfluous, long genealogies. I mean, we have that Ibn Hisham goes into genealogy, the Sirah goes into that, right? The Quran doesn't do that. The Quran just suddenly gives you Abbas wa Tawalla. Like, what is Abbas wa Tawalla? So what's going on here? You have to look at Asbab al Nuzul. So we know this, the Sabab al Nuzul is the Prophet is in Mecca, it's early in Mecca. He's trying to make da'wah to Al-Walid ibn Mughira and some of the uh, leaders of the Quraysh. And Abdullah ibn Maktoum, a blind man comes, and starts pulling at his shirt. The Prophet sallallahu he, he does an abus, which is this. It's just doing this with your face. It's just with the forehead, that's called abus. It's not a scowl, he didn't go like this. It's just, that's it. So then, he's a prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimands him immediately. Abasa wa ta'wala and ja'ul a'ma. You, you frowned and turned away when the blind man came to you, right? So this is a sin of a prophet, is leaving an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. Either way, he's virtuous. This is a dumb of a prophet. The prophets have a different, these words mean different things. You know what Allah says, وَوَجَلَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى ضَالًا ضَلًا Usually we translate that astray, and that's not how the ulama translates. He found you astray and died to you, is an incorrect tafsir. Because we're talking about a prophet, even before the bi'atha. The meaning of this, according to the ulama, there's two meanings. Dalal of a prophet before the bi'atha means he's searching for something. He's searching for and then God gave him sharia. Or it means he's enamored. One of the meanings of dalal is to be so in love that you don't know what to do with yourself. You're so in love, and then we give you focus where to put your love. So the Asbab al Nuzul, then what it does is it fills in the narrative gaps of the Quran. That's what the Sirah does too. That's how it functions. Right? 
So that's the most common reason why ayat were revealed to the Prophet response to an event or a situation. But then you have questions posed to the Prophet. Right? The Sahaba asked the Prophet 13 questions. All of them are answered in the Quran. Yes, They ask you about the ruh. Yes, They ask you about the sa'a. Yes, They ask you about They ask you about charity. They ask you about the jibal, the mountains. Yes, about the new moons. They ask you about the yatama, the orphans. Right? So these questions posed the Prophet وسلم, they prompted Tanzil. Right? So these are the Asbab of Nuzul. Well, like when the Jewish tribes of Medina, they asked the Prophet وسلم, three questions. Right? They told Abu Sufyan if he answers these questions. The Prophet وسلم, told Abu Sufyan, uh, Inni fa'ilu dalika ghadan. I'll do that tomorrow. Right? But then no answers came for 15 days. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, never say, never say, Without saying inshallah. So you might have thought the initial sort of inclination might be, well, that was kind of embarrassing for the Prophet. But in fact, many of the mushrikeen and the Jews of Medina started thinking, there is something he's receiving. Why would he embarrass himself like that then? So he's waiting for something, right? <laughs> that actually worked in his, to his advantage. We should listen to it more closely because he's hearing something. And then questions of the Prophet. So, for example, the Prophet was sitting with angels in Bukhari, and he says to them, Why don't you visit us more often? And the ayah was revealed, Do not descend except by the permission of your Lord. al wahidi says, the asbab, however, relate to the immediate cause of the nuzul. The immediate cause during the life of the Prophet uh, So, Surah 105, verse number 1. Alam tara fa'ala fi What is the sabab of nuzul of this ayah? Does anyone know? Is it the attack on Mecca by Abraha and Ashram and his army? What is the sabab al nuzul of Alam Tara Kefa Fa'ala Rabbuka Bi Ashab al The Surah al fil What is the sabab al nuzul Why was this Surah revealed? Is it because of the attack on Mecca by Abraha? Yeah, so this is not the sabab al nuzul according to Imam al Right? This is the content of the nuzul. You have to make a distinction between the content of the nuzul and the sabab of the nuzul. The khabar, or what is the information that the nuzul is bringing, and the sabab of the nuzul. Because this happened in the year 570, the attack on Mecca, but this surah was revealed to the Prophet about 46 years later, about 616 or so. So, so what is the sabab of nuzul? In general, persecution of the Prophet by the Quraysh in Mecca. The reminder of the Quraysh. Reminder of the Quraysh. They're persecuting the Prophet Sallallahu so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He speaks directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he knows there's other ears listening. You know, don't you remember, the, uh, not, or rather, don't, don't you know the significance of what I did to the companions of the elephant? It's really for the Quraysh. They go, oh, remember that. This was Tawato. There was many people that were alive at that time who remember that event. Okay. It's the same with like stories of Nuh and Hud and Musa alayhi salam, right? So the exodus of the hijrah of Musa alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran. What is the sabab and nuzul of the story of the hijrah? It could be the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, right? So oftentimes in the Quran, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing information about past prophets that has relevance to the life of the Prophet similar events. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals portions of Al-Baqarah shortly after the Hijrah about, you know, about the exodus of Moses because the Prophet just made exodus. That this happened to him, it happened to you. Right? 
they're saying this about you. They said this about the former prophets. Yeah. So we know that the asbab deal with the life of the Prophet Al-Wakili uses another example. What Allahu Ibrahim Khalila? And God took Abraham as a Khalil, as a friend. What is the sabab and nuzul of this ayah? Is it that Allah took Abraham as a friend? No, because that's mentioned in the Torah. Right? He's called God's friend, you know, in a scripture two thousand years prior to this. What is the sabab and nuzul of this ayah? Allah you know. Exactly. So the point is the sabab and the khabar, the, the occasion and the content of an ayah are not necessarily connected. Abbas wa ta'wala, there's a connection between the content and the sabab. You frowned and turned away, right? Because the sabab is the Prophet turning away from Abdullah ibn Maktoum. So the content is related to that. Dealing with past qasas, or something else happening, or similar in the life of the Prophet it's causing these ayat. So, I'll give you some examples how one can make grave errors uh, without this knowledge. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 115, chapter 2, verse 115. Walillahi al mashriku wal maghrib, fa ayna ma tuwalu fa thamma wajhullah, in Allah awasil and alim. To God belongs the East and the West. This is a, an idiom. In English, it's called a merism. East to West means everywhere. Somebody might say, what about North and the South? The North and the South don't belong to God? No, this is a figure of speech. This includes everything. It's called a merism. So, one has to study balaba. You have to speak rhetoric to understand what's happening in this eye. That's number one. Whichever way you turn, you will find the face of God. So now we have to study theology. Whichever way I turn, I'll find Allah's face, his wudge. Does he have a physical face? Oh, we believe in pantheism? God is everything? Right? So theology becomes necessary to study. But then also hadith and fiqh become necessary to study. If you read this ayah on its face, whichever way you turn, you'll find God's face. I can pray in any direction. Then. Whichever way I turn. Ain't namah to Whichever way I want to. Right? And that would violate the ijma and the consensus. So we'll come back to this ayah. But another ayah, chapter 5, verse 93. There is no blame on those who believe and work righteousness for what they have eaten. As long as they uh, had uh, piety of God and believed and worked righteousness. So you can see how this verse can be misconstrued. I can eat whatever I want? Is that what it's saying? There's some Sahaba who heard this ayah for the first time, and that was their initial interpretation of the ayah. We'll talk about this. Another ayah, chapter 2, verse 158. Inna safa marwata. In Sha'arillah, for men Hajjad Beta, a weird Tamara, for that Juna Ha Alehi, and the Tawafa Behima. So, uh, Safa and Marwa are sacred symbols of God. Whoever goes to Hajj or Umrah, there's no blame if he runs between them. There's no blame, so it's optional. That's sort of the feeling one gets. There's no blame if I do that. So, what if I don't do it? Is it okay? So, there are also various ayat that become incomprehensible without context. Right? <clears throat> For example, when you finish your rites of the Hajj, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا When you're done with your rites of pilgrimage, this is chapter 2, verse 200, Al-Baqarah 200. When you're done with pilgrimage, then remember God like the remembrance of your ancestors. Or even more, with even more severe in your remembrance, Vikr of the Abba of ancestors. What is it talking about? Or Al Anfal, verse seventeen. Or Mama Rameta Ibn Rameta, Walakin Allah Rama. God speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You did not throw when you threw. Allah threw. What? 
For what? What are you talking about? Okay. So these verses cannot be understood without a smile in the zoo. So with respect to the first ayah, to God belongs the east and the west, to Allah belongs the east and the west. Whichever way you turn, you'll find the count, you'll find the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Suyuti mentions that there are multiple reports. Some of them conflict about what is the true sabab. So there's there's a few asbab of nuzul. This ayah has different occasions of revelation that deal with it. One of them is either it's referring to nafila prayer while mounted on an animal during travel. So if you're traveling uh, and you're in the car, I guess would be the equivalent now, uh, it's nafila prayer, it's not far. Or nafila in this context also means sunnah, something extra. Right? You can continue to go the direction you're going and pray in your sitting position. Whichever way you turn, you find Allah's confidence. In reality, Allah's uh, existence, right? not physical face. We'll talk about how to deal with these mutashabihat ayat later, anthropomorphic ayat. But when it's far, you stop, you find the Qibla, you stand and you pray. If you can't do that, this is a fifty issue. Like you're just on a plane and you just can't get up and, you know, the seatbelt bites on and you, know, <laughs> you get up and start praying, they look at you, throwing off the plane or something. So there's a difference of opinion on what to do in this situation. You can pray in your seat, you can wait till you land, wait till you think you're safe, if you think you're in danger, wait till you're safe. You know, pray in your seat fog and then make it up later. Probably the best way. Keep looking out the window to judge the prayer times. Face the Qibla the best you can. Okay. Or he says, Al-Wahidi says, this relates to a situation where you uh, cannot determine the Qibla, but you have to make Taqdeer. Taqdeer means some sort of determination. You have to try to find the Qibla. You know, I was in an airport about a month ago, and I have this smartphone, but I don't know how to use it. Nothing ever works. I think it's user error. Uh, and I got a new phone. This is a new iPhone. Anyway, it works a little better. Uh, so I, I, a janitor walked by and I said, excuse me, sir, do you know which way is north? And he said, use your, uh, use your phone. Use your smartphone. So yeah, the, the user is not so smart. So, <laughs> so I asked around which way is north. I would try to look out the window for the sun. You have to try to guess. So you have to make takdeel. You make takdeel, you pray. If you find out later you were wrong, the dominant opinion is, the uh, opinion of uh, Abu Yusuf, uh, I believe, in Hanafi school, is as long as you make takdeel, you don't have to make it up. Uh, as long as you try to locate the Qibla correctly. Right? So if there's an opinion that this is what the ayah is talking about. I try. Go make it prepared. Whichever way you turn your mind, God's countenance. Or Ibn Abbas says that this ayah was revealed in response to Jewish objections to the change of the Qibla. Right? Why, why did you change the Qibla? Whichever way you turn, you'll find Allah's countenance. Uh, in, in, a, in a way of saying, Baytul Maqdis is still holy. It's a holy place. But the, but the Kaaba, is the original Qibla of Ibrahim Ayyusa. And that's the direction we're going to pray. So which one is the Asbab? Uh, Those are And I'll come back to this ayah. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, when there's multiple Asbab, the ulama have a sort of method of choosing the strongest report. But the rest of it will be reports. Just stated scholars, scholarly opinion. Right? Yeah, that's, that's another. That's something else that will sway or is it truly an asbab? We'll talk about that. Shall we? With respect to 593, this is when there's, uh, there's no blame on those who believe and work righteousness for what they have eaten. Right? So according to Portubi, even some Sahaba, as we said, Rathmani the Medarun, under, uh, misunderstood this ayah. Some of them approached Umar and insisted that had punishment could not be carried out on a righteous believer, 
you didn't have Bass clarify for them the Sabbath of Nuzul. The ayah is referring to companions who indulged in drinking and gambling before these prohibitions and then died. It's according to Ahmad and an Nasa'i. There's no blame on them for what they ate because there was no prohibitions at the time. And these in drinking and gambling were not until the early Madani period. So it was halal to gamble and drink even into Medina for some time. So if they died before those prohibitions, they're, they're okay, there were no prohibitions. Or if someone you know, did these things before Islam and they converted, all of that is wiped out. Or someone, you know, a believer ate or drank out of ignorance or due to deficient knowledge and makes tawbah when he comes into knowledge. Or even someone who has knowledge, he knows it's haram and he does it, but he makes tawbah. Because Allah is a tawbah, al-afu. Tawbah means the one who forgives. Al-ghafar means the one who uh, keeps forgiving. And al-afu means the one who erases it completely. Gone. So this is not uh, a verse that is dealing with or advocating you know, antinomianism. That you know, as long as you believe, you can do whatever you want. You know, believe in God and do what Thou wilt, as Augustine said. Augustine of Hippo. Believe in God and do what Thou wilt. Okay. And as far as two one fifty eight. Uh, Safa and Marwa. There's no blame if you go between them. Marwa thought it was optional based on his understanding of the text. Then Aisha disagreed and pointed to the Sabah of Nuzul. So at the time that this ayah was revealed, the Mushrikeen had put idols at the base of Safa and Marwa. There were idols there. So some of the Sahaba thought it was now sinful to do the, the sa'i, right, the running. So the point of the ayah is, it's still obligatory, despite the presence of the idols. You still have to do it. For example, if I tell a brother, go in that room and pray. He goes in that room, and he looks behind him, and there's a crucifix. So he comes outside and he says, there, he says there's a crucifix in there. So go in there and pray. There's no blame on you. Am I telling him, don't pray? I'm making it optional now. No, you still have to pray, but I'm saying it, there's no blame for doing that thought of action. Face the tibla, don't look at it, don't worry about it, and pray. And this is the nature of the eye. And then you have the issue of primacy. This is an usuli issue. That when an ayah is revealed in connection to some event or situation or question, what is given primacy? Is it the general sense yielded by the wording of the ayah or the specific sense implied by its sabab of nuzul again is it the general sense yielded by the wording of an ayah or is it the, spe the specific sense implied by its sabab of nuzul suyuti advocates the former the general sense yielded by the wording of the ayah right? and this is the practice of the sahaba in other words, they would deduce general rulings from verses that had specific occasions of revelation. This is called the primary of the general. The primary of the general. The usuli principle, for those who want to know it in Arabic, is al-ibratu li ramum al la li khusus sabab That the lesson or the salient point is due to the generality of the expression not due to the specificity of the occasion. I'll give you an ex example. There was something called lihar, repudiation of a wife. A, a man in the Jahari period would say to his wife in Arab society, anti aliyaka dhahri ummi, that you are like the back of my mother, right? So now um, he will not have conjugal relations with her. He will not give her material support if he doesn't feel like it. She's just kind of lost in that house, right? So this happened to a woman named Khawla bintu Thaqlaba in the Madani period, right? So you have some remnants of these ideas, even amongst Sahaba in Medina, that is her, her husband, Aus ibn Samit, divorced her through Dihar, right? That is the specific sabab al-nuzul of the ayah. 
but it doesn't just apply to them. You see? What do we do? The general is drawn from the specific. The am is drawn from the khas. So all of these ayah have a specific nuzul, sabbatul nuzul. But the sahaba would draw a general lesson, meaning that when Allah says in Surah uh, Al-Ahzab, ayah number four, that your wives can never be your mothers, that applies to everybody. That vihar is haram for everybody. You cannot do that to your wife. primacy of the general. He deduced that uh, the general from the specific. So that's an important uh, important concept. And she came to the Prophet and said, Al-Mujadila Qad sami Allah qawla allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha wa tashtaki ila Allah The beginning of Surah Al-Mujadila That's her, Al-Mujadila The woman who argues with you is khawla bintu fa'laba Allah has heard uh, the speech of the woman who's arguing with you. And she carries her complaint to Allah. So this ayah was revealed. Sayyidina Umar, during his caliphate, <coughs> was taking an army out. And he, he halted the entire army. Because he said, you know that woman that the <laughs> Quran was revealed? She's standing in the roadway right now. And people, why did he stop the army? The entire army halted. So he approached her and he said, yes, Sayyidina, can you please move from the roadway? Very politely, because this is someone that is, is Allah heard her dua and revealed Quran. Okay, another example: <clears throat> the ayah specifying corporal punishment for those who slander chaste women. If you slander a woman who's chaste, and you know, call her you know, a zaniya, a'udhu billah. If you cannot produce four witnesses, you're given eighty lashes in public. The corporal punishment. This is something America used to do, you know, during the period of the Founding Fathers, during the time of Washington and Benjamin Franklin. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was supposed to be whipped in public, but he, he fled from New York. He broke his apprenticeship, which was against the law. The punishment was being tied to a, a pole and then whipped. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so this verse is uh, 24 6 of the Quran. Surah to Nur, ayah number six. And those who uh, levy charges against chaste women and, and fail to produce evidence, whip them 80 lashes. Right? So this was revealed about a man named Hilal ibn Umayyah. This is the first person to have done this. Right? So that's the specific sabab. The sabab of Nuzul is about this man. But we draw a general ruling from the specific. Right? So say, well, that's what he that, that was revealed about him. I can slander whoever I want. No, you can't. Right? It's a specific sabbat, but it's a general ruling. The lesson is is uh, is due to the generality of the expression, not the specificity of the occasion. Uh, another example. Um, oh, sorry, and that's not Hilal ibn Umayya. That was uh, Hassan ibn Thabit. There was a great poet of the Prophet who was praised by the Prophet But unfortunately, he was one of those who spread the rumor about Aisha. Hadith with Ifk. Right? And this you know, goes to show that believers can fall into sin. They're not ba'asum, sahaba are not ba'asum. And then he repented for it, his tawbah was accepted. The Prophet sallam, he you know, embraced him as his companion. Right. So this was, these, these ayat were revealed on the occasion of hadith al-ifq, the story of the slander of our mother Aisha. And Allah says, يَعِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ أَن تَعُودُوا بِمِثْلِهِ أَبَدَا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah exhorts you never ever to say anything remotely close to this ever again. So that's why Imam Malik said, slander of Aisha is kufur because of his eyes. And it would be a capital offense to slander Aisha in Medina. Because it's an act of apostasy. Okay. What was Hilal ibn Umayyah? Oh, yes. 
So that was the ayat dealing with li'an, maledictions upon oneself. If you make false accusations about your wife, like, you, know, you suspect your wife did something, if you can't produce witnesses, right, then there's a series of maledictions. May Allah curse me about mine. May Allah curse me. You do that five times, right? Even if you do it five times and the marriage is dissolved, right? no one is, there's no had punishment. You have to have witnesses that have had punishment. Uh, so this was related to Hilal ibn Umayyah, who suspected his wife, and they did this thing. So Suyuti so says the provisions contained in these ayat transcend in their applicability, i.e., the original occasions of the revelations. Their scopes are wider, transcendental. Even a verse of threat, a wa'id, wa'idu li kulli humazatil lumazat, Woe to every scandal monger, Imam Zabakhsha, he says, its occasion is khas, is specific, is talking about a specific person, but the threat is aam, it's for everybody. <coughs> Another example. وَسَارِقُوا وَسَارِقَةُ فَاكْتَعُوا أَيْدِيُهُمَا The thief, male or female, cut off their hand. The ruling, the hukum, is aam by ijma' is general. So there's, uh, there's application after its immediate occasion. The sabab is khas. The occasion is specific. It was Ibn Jozi mentioned the man had his armor stolen in Medina. The ayah was revealed. But another issue with respect to these prescriptions is, is it unconditional or conditional? Unconditional means mutlaq. Unconditional. Mutlaq. Conditional is muqayyad. Muqayyad means like tied to something. So it is am, you know, you, you cut the hand, but it is conditional on certain things. Conditional. It's not just, you know, it's theft, do it in every case. Right? Several factors come into play. And these are called the preventatives of the hudud. The preventatives of Islamic punishments. For example, is it a first-time offender? That has to be taken into consideration. Uh, is it petty theft? What do you steal, a candy bar? Right? Uh, was it a child? Uh, is there a famine or drought? In other words, is a moratorium possible? Sayyidina Umar, during his caliphate, there was a famine. People were stealing because they were starving. So he said, I'm not going to carry out produce punishment on these people. They're starving. What do you expect them to do? Is, is there due process? Of course. It's not like the movie Aladdin, where Princess Jasmine is walking in the soup area. She picks up an apple, and the, the vendor says, takes out his sword and says, do you know what the penalty is for stealing? That's what kids are watching. What if the person repents immediately and returns the goods? Taken into consideration. Are there other options? Right? So there's two types of punishments. There's, there's uh, maktuban, prescribed punishments, mentioned in the Quran. And then there's something called ta'zir. Ta'zir are discretionary punishments that are uh, carried out by order of a hakim or a qadi, for example, prison time, something like that, ostracizing someone, putting them in prison. So it's not just limited to amputation. Is there poverty? Is it public property? What if he steals a library book? That's technically public property, so that's a preventative. What about the finder's keeper's rule? Just find a thousand dollars cash on the ground. That's not stealing. There's no had punishment. There's different ways of dealing with these things. What if the victim doesn't press charges, or the judge shows leniency? Right? It's an hadith we also saw the king that prayed also behind the Prophet Sallallahu and they approached the Prophet very close. He walked right up to him when he was seated, and he said, "I, I transgressed the book of Allah. So punish me according to the book." This is something that's in the book. This is something. 
eventually, major he's done. Punish me according to the book of God. So the Prophet said, he looked at him and he said, Didn't you just pray with us? And he said, Naam. He said, It's already been forgiven. Go away. Don't worry about it. So he could circum he would circumvent the Hudud. Right? Nail yourself with God's veil. And the man came to Abu Bakr and said, I broke the laws and I want to be punished. And Abu Bakr said, um, who did you tell? He said, Nobody. He said, just make Toba. Go away. And then the same man went to say Muhammad and said, uh, I broke the law and I want to be punished. And then uh, Omar said, Who did you tell? He said, Abu Bakr. Why did you tell me that? I don't know. Go. And the man who ran out of the suit. He ran out of the suit holding something. He stole. He was a thief. Ran out of the suit. Who does he run into? Sayyidina Umar. Uh oh. Whoops. Wrong man to run into. So Sayyidina <laughs> Umar said, Salikta, did you steal? And the guy was shocked. He said, Get out of here. He threw him away. Because <laughs> you, you also have to bring witnesses. There's, there's also statute of limitations. You can't bring, you know, six months later, this man stole my car. Six months later, a judge would throw it out. There has to be immediate immediate charges, proceedings, two witnesses that saw the, the, the theft of good standing. So it is Aum, right? The Hukum is Aum. But you can see how the scope and extent of its applicability can be severely limited. Dr. Shabir Ali, who's a Canadian scholar, he said, in the first 400 years of Islam, there were six documented cases of hand amputation. And even in the Ottoman period, which were very meticulous details, it was an anomaly. Once in a blue moon, this would happen. So the purpose was not cruelty, but to be an effective deterrent. The strictness of the punishment itself was a preventative. For example, I'll give you an example. Driving down the street in San Ramon a couple of years ago, and I come to the intersection, and there's a big sign that says "Red Light Violation, five hundred thirty-eight dollars." You might think, well, you know, that's a lot of money, but I I pulled in one hundred fifty k a year. Not me. That's maybe what you're thinking. <laughs> so it's not too bad. It's just uh, annoying. But did you know that there are you know, sixty thousand children in the Bay Area that are suffering from poverty, that 40% of people in the Bay Area are living paycheck to paycheck, a $538 fine is literally the difference between having a home and being homeless for 40% of people in the Bay Area. Right? So here's the point. The point is not to be cruel. You know, they don't have to write that there. Why even write it? If the point is just to rip people off, don't put any sign, right? Let people run red lights and then send them bills for $538. The point is to be a deterrent, a strong deterrent. But if you do this, there's a heavy penalty. One of my teachers, he said he lived in South in Riyadh for 14 years. He said he never locked his door in 14 years. No one would ever rob his house.
great note takers. Matthew 5, 30. If your hand offends you, cut it off, cast it beside you. If your foot offends you, cut it off, cast it beside you. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, cast it beside you. It is better for part of you to enter hell than the whole of you. The Christian exegetes, they take this as majaz. This is figurative, like cut off the weight of sin. Don't enable yourself. In Matthew 19, 12, he says, I encourage you to be eunuchs for the sake of God. And castrate yourself. Again, they take this majaz, but interestingly, one of the greatest scholars of Christian history, origin of Alexandria, literally castrated himself based on this verse. The irony there is that Origen was known for his spiritual exegesis, but he took this verse very literally. But from the Torah, Deuteronomy 25, 11, there's a problem that if two men are fighting, as mentioned in Deuteronomy 25, if two men are fighting, and then the wife of one of the men comes and tries to separate them and grabs the genitals of one of the men, then it says, cut off her hand and show no mercy. The point is that you have these types of ahkam in biblical text. So, you know, how do ahli kitab deal with them? You know, why is it that the Quran is suddenly incompatible with America? They have these, they have these ahkam um, tenfold in their own text. The Quran doesn't mention stoning one time. There's no mention of stoning as a penal punishment in the Quran. You'll find it 9, 10, 11 times in the biblical text. Right? So how did they reconcile their text with America? Why, why don't they allow us to do the same type of reconciliation? Why do they practice it? Well, no, they didn't practice it. There are Jews that follow Halakha law. They go to places on the East Coast, and you know, they have their own communities, and they follow the letter of the law. But they have this idea that if the law of the land that you're living in does not accommodate something in sacred law. You abandon the sacred law and follow the law of the land, and by doing that, you are following the sacred law. We have that as well. If there's something in the Sharia that contradicts the, the, the non-Muslim majority land that we're living in, the Sharia says, abandon that problem and follow the law of the land as long as that law does not break the Sharia. But if you're being ordered to break the Sharia, then you make hijab. So this is a big so this is a big concern for a lot of non-Muslims. Because when we hear the word sharia, to be honest, what do we think of? We think of halal or haram food. Can I eat this gummy bear? Or it's something to do with prayer. Prayer, wudu, food. That's what we sharia. When non-Muslims hear sharia, they think about amputation of hands. They think about flogging people. They think about stoning. That's all they're thinking. The hudud, right? As one of my teachers said the other night, if you have a book of sharia. 99% right. of it is food, is prayer, tahara, commercial law. At the very end, you have something called kitab al and this much. And that's only for the sultans, that's for the, the political authorities, and nothing to even do with us. But that little sliver there is what non Muslims believe the entire Sharia is, and what every single Muslim will carry out upon them, apparently. So, it's a misinformation that they're receiving from the media. A lot of it is fake news. Exactly true. And it's us doing a poor job as well. Our dawah efforts. I think we should. Before I uh, keep going here. <laughs> so, inshallah, we'll continue. We'll finish at Spabu Nuzul next time. Inshallah. And then we'll do uh, the next is abrogation mess. And that's also very, very important to understand what is nas, what is abrogation in the Quran? What abrogates Quran? How does hadith relate to it? What verses are abrogated? Today uh, we're talking about nas, nas, nun, sin, ha, nas, which means, uh, translated usually as abrogation, cancellation. So this is one of the most Difficult, complex, lengthy, controversial topics in Islamic legal theory, uh, and quite often misunderstood. Um, and like Asbab al Nuzul, it is not an exact science, so scholars are very opinionated on this issue. There's a lot of difference of opinion 
Overall, there is a consensus that there's definitely nasq in the Qur'an. There is a level of abrogation. The real difference of opinion regarding it is the scope or extent of nasq in the Qur'an. So we'll talk about that, inshallah. So nasq deals generally, according to Lama Tabari, generally, this only applies to ayat that are muhkamat. Muhkamat. Remember last time we talked about Quran itself divides its ayat into two groups, mutashabihat, that are multidimensional, that are obscure, or unclear, or anthropomorphic. And then there are muhkamat, which are clear or one-dimensional, or ayat that have legal and ethical implications. So when we talk about nasq, we're talking about ayat muhkamat, ayat that have legal or, in, or ethical implications. Essentially, ayat canceling other ayat in their legal aspect, or outward aspect, or exoteric aspect. So the technical definition that's given by the ulama of the Qur'an is رفع الحكم الشرعي بدليل شرعي رفع الحكم الشرعي بدليل شرعي To remove or lift away a legal ruling by means of a legal proof. So why only the ahkam? So why don't verses in the Qur'an, because remember we divided the uh, ayat of the Qur'an, this is the, the division of al-biqa'i, of Imam al-Ghazali. You have ayat that deal with rububiyyah, with nabawiyyah, with ma'ad. These ayat are never, no, they're never mansukh, they're never abrogated. Dealing with rububiyyah, why aren't ayat that deal with rububiyyah, with lordly qualities, why aren't they ever abrogated? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immutable. Allah doesn't change. Only our understandings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only our understandings change and are sharpened and are refined. That's what theology means. Theology is to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So people have different theological um, characteristics or different theological understandings or descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll come back to this idea in a minute. But nasq involves ibdal, ibdal, badal, ibdal, which is substitution or replacement. So ayat that were forgotten by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran seems to indicate this is a reality. Ayat forgotten then replaced with similar ayat. Or as a reference to the ahruf we talked about, the seven letters of the Qur'an, that ayat were revealed in various ways to facilitate comprehension amongst the Arabs. So as we said, in the Hafs they say, Malik yawm din Allah is the owner, the wash, Malik yawm din the king, these are two different words. Both of them have tawat or transmission, both are multiply attested that go all the way back to the Prophet This is called Ibdal. You also have something called Ibtal from uh, Batin. Ibtal. Nullification or cancellation. This is the cancellation of ayat that have legal or ethical import. Uh, the wisdom behind this, according to the ulama, is to establish a precedent of dynamic legalism that law changes as time goes on, depending on social location and context. In the Qur'an, canceling many ahkam, uh, uh, or it's a reference to the Qur'an can canceling many ahkam found in previous revelations. Right? So if you look at Jewish law, there's a lot more laws than what we have in Sharia, a lot more. Many of them are, you know, they're based on bid'ah, they didn't quote review to Musa alayhi salam, and the Qur'an seems to indicate that. But some of them were revealed to many Israel, but they've been cancelled with the revelation of the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is doing something to Jewish law. It is ameliorating the Jewish law. It's called taysir. And this is a function of nasq, of abrogation. It's making it easier for people. We'll talk about that as well, inshallah. Okay. The Quran is a universal uh, revelation. 
right? So it can be difficult. It uh, is something that should be implemented by everyone on the earth. So he said that ayat that deal with rububiyah cannot change because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. Allah is immutable, but only our understandings of God change. Jews and Muslims, for example, worship the same God. Most people would say, most Jews and Muslims will say that they both worship the God of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Each claim to have a more refined theological understanding, but it's the same God. Right? Jews and Christians, for the most part, believe that they worship the same God, the God of Abraham. But Christians will say they have a more refined understanding. Not that God changed and became a trinity. Christians maintain that God was always a trinity, but this wasn't revealed yet until the time of the New Testament, or it wasn't revealed until the time of Isa, Isa. And this is something that uh, Jews and Muslims uh, disagree with. Obviously, our understandings of God change, but some, something so drastic as a triune deity suddenly being revealed at such a time is uh, unacceptable. But if you look at sacred law, you look at halakha, you should know this term. The Jewish counterpart, the Hebrew uh, counterpart to sharia is halakha. Like we say, people have halakha in the masjid, but it's a case of halakha. This is sharia of Bani Israel. According to their sharia, uh, you can drink wine. Um, in moderation. So this is a difference we have in the Quran. Wine is uh, is not permissible. So this is a function of nasq that is interscriptural. So the Quran abrogating uh, certain ahkam that will reveal the previous prophets. Why is that? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knew what kind of alcohol would be drunk towards the end of time. Back in the day, in the pre-modern world, someone my size, over 200 pounds, if I wanted to get drunk, I'd have to drink about a gallon of wine. It's very difficult to get drunk. But now I go to the liquor store, and I buy you know, 120 proof, whatever, tequila, two shots and I'm on the floor. I've never done it, but it could happen, right? So this is Umul Chabayef, the Prophet said, he said, Al-Khamru Jumar al Alcohol is the summation of all sin. Right? And alcohol kills more people than cigarettes, definitely. But you know, alcohol, beer, wine, such a big business in America that you'll never see any you know, public service announcement about you know, uh, criticizing you know, Budweiser during the Super Bowl. Quite the opposite. Anyway, or like seafood, in Jewish law, there's very strict, meticulous rules about what Jews can eat that's from the ocean. They can only eat fish that have fins and scales. A fish has to have fins and scales that you can eat. Whereas in Islamic law, uh, it's much easier, right? Depending on which meth have, but generally it's easier. And there's other, you know, the beard is something that is fardain for Orthodox Jews. Right? Even trimming the hair on the side is impermissible. You have to grow the locks down. So Islamic law um, has uh, an easier aspect of, of Sharia. Okay. So, you know, Western. Um, Islamists, they oftentimes criticize Nasr and say this is just a kind of a clever way that Muslim scholars you know, sort of want to cover up the fact that the Quran apparently contradicts itself. Like, so all this ayah has been abrogated by this one. Right? And they say, well, can God really change his mind? A lot of Muslims actually, modern Muslims, and I was talking about this during a lecture in the masjid a couple of years ago, I think it was a theology class, and I mentioned Nasr. And their brother jumped all over me and said, Are you saying that, you know, there's contradictions in the Quran, or does Allah change his mind, and things like that? So we have to understand the nature of Tanzil. Tanzil means a piecemeal revelation. 
Tanzil, piecemeal, progressive revelation. The Quran was revealed uh, over 23 years. The community of the Prophet is changing and growing and evolving. So the very ethos of the sacred law as a dynamic reality is being shaped around that initial community. The law as a dynamic reality. This is very, very important. There are certain things in law, in Sharia, that never change. These are called thawabit. Thawabit. They never change. There are other things in law, many things in law, that are mutaghayyarat, variables, right? And change according to social location. So, you know, Sharia isn't some prepackaged 1400 year old law. Here it is, take it or leave it. If you just look at the Shafi'i school, for example, it's called the Shafi'i school. It's after its founder, Imam you know, Shafi'i. But thousands of scholars have contributed to this school, even today. So if you go into a Shafi'i book of Sharia, a book of fiqh from 500 years ago, and you try to look up what's the fiqh of praying on an airplane. You're obviously not going to find it, right? If it's a 500-year-old book. Nowadays, if you go to, a, go to a Shafi'i scholar, and you ask him, do I have to pray on an airplane? He'll give you an answer. You say, wait a minute, Imam Shafi'i talked about airplanes? No. The nature of these schools is that they're dynamic, right? They're living. They're, uh, there's a, a variable aspect to these schools, because that's the nature of sacred law. Right? So there's always a human element. There's an element of ijtihad. The principles that were laid down by the Salaf, all of these fatawa are taken, are based on principle, juristic principles. So they're not out of nowhere. They come from something. They can always be tied eventually back to an ayah or to hadith of the Prophet Okay. That's the nature of sacred law. So abrogation allows people to adjust to new prescriptions and proscriptions by growing in their faith. Remember our mother Aisha, she said that if adultery and wine were prohibited early in Mecca, very, very few people would have become Muslim. Right? Now, the Quran itself refers to its abrogative aspect. So this idea of abrogation is not purely a scholastic uh, idea that doesn't have basis in the Quran. Ayah number 106 of Al-Baqarah is the fundamental ayah that establishes Nasr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ مُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِرٍ مَا نَنْسَخْ Nasr, right? That none of our verses do we cancel or cause to be forgotten, except that we bring in its place something better or similar. Don't you know that Allah has power over all things? And then 16101, Surah Al-Nahal, Ayah 101. وَإِذَا آيَةً مَكَانَ آيَةً وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يُنَزِّلُ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُفْتَرُ بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُ That when we replace one ayah, for another ayah, and Allah knows best what he is revealing, they say, you're a forger, or you're just making this up. This is what the Quran says. This is what people say today. Oh, you're just making this up as you're going along. But But the majority of them, they don't understand the wisdom behind a progressive revelation. The spirit has to be willing. This is the problem when you have an Islamic revolution in a country where people are you know, dancing in clubs and drinking alcohol, and now there's sharia everywhere. You have to be patient with people. Then you start having things like prayer police walking around, right? Uh, so that the spirit has to be willing. It's a, it, this is how the Sahaba were trained. The Sahaba were trained gradually, progressively. And there's wisdom in that. You should remember that. Oftentimes we have brothers that go overseas <clears throat> for, you know, two, three years and they come back with a lot of knowledge, but then they start reviling their parents. 
oh, my dad, you know, he missed the sunnah, or he doesn't have a beard, or something, you know. What a facet. And they start getting into debates with their parents. Right? We have to be patient with people. We can't reach adab, especially with parents. And then years later, that same young brother sits back. My dad had so much wisdom. I shouldn't have disrespected him so much. He didn't have a lot of religious knowledge, but wisdom, right, as we said, cannot be attained through study, only through age. 1339 of the Quran. Yamhu Allahu ma yasha wa yuthbit. Allah cancels what He wants and establishes what He wants. Also, Al Bayyina. لا يكون الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب والمشركين المنفكين حتى تأتيهم البيّنة رسول من الله يترو صحفا متهارا فيها كتب قيمة. The Quran is described as scrolls. In the scrolls are different books. That are made correct. Kutubun Qayyima. So the ulama say, why does Allah describe the Quran as kutub? What books, books made correct? So the ulama say here that the meaning of this, Allah is that the Quran contains the essential teachings, the correct teachings of the Torah, and the Inji, and the Zabur. These books, the essence of these books, is captured in the Quran. And that the shara'an aspect of those books has been abrogated. So there's no more, you know, I'm going to find a fatwa based on what Deuteronomy says. You, know, you don't appeal to Jewish law. The, the shara'an aspect of Jewish law is abrogated. And this is called supersessionism. <clears throat> right? This idea is a Christian idea. The Old Testament covenant is abrogated by the New Testament. This was standard uh, Christianity, that the covenant that God made with Bani Israel on Mount Sinai is canceled because they failed to uphold it. It was a two-way two street. And because Bani Israel failed to uphold the covenant, the mithaq of Dirit in Hebrew, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted his grace from them <coughs> and gave it to another nation. This is indicated also in the New Testament, Isa alayhi salam, according to Matthew, he says, the kingdom of God, which is an expression meaning prophecy, shall be taken away from you and given to a nation that bears the proper fruit. So this was standard Christianity. This is definitely what Paul believes and writes in the New Testament. Uh, but uh, the Catholic Church had uh, a council in the 60s called Vatican II, 1962 to 65 or thereabouts where they made major statements. One of the statements they made was that Christian, the Catholics can now have interfaith dialogue with Muslims. It was impermissible before that time. I met a Catholic a few weeks ago. Old lady, she told me, I remember a time when it was impermissible for me to walk into a mosque. Before the 60s, it was impermissible. The Prophet Sallallahu said that he had Christians come into his masjid, and they would have interfaith dialogue. Another thing that the church did during that council, Vatican II, is that they apologized to the Jews for blaming them for deicide or killing God. And, you know, the Vatican was one of the first governments, I mean, it's, it's a government it's called the Papal State, it's one of the first states to endorse Hitler's government. They also um, declared that the Jewish covenant is now valid. Right? So this is called dual covenant theology. So they sort of revoked this idea that the Jewish covenant is mansukh, it's abrogated. Now official Catholic doctrine is that if you're practicing Jew, even though you might hear about Isa alayhi salam be presented with the gospel and you reject it, you're not a Catholic. As long as you stay committed to Judaism, you'll go to heaven. This is now the Catholic position. Okay, so, so um, beliefs, articles of faith, fundamental principles of law, narrative, spiritual, uh, prophetological, theological verities, 
are not subject to nuts, nuts are not subject to nuts. Suyuti also mentions in Usmani, there's a very good book on the sciences of the Quran if you want something in addition to von Denver. It's by a South Asian scholar named uh, Mufti Muhammad Tati Usmani. Uh, it's called An Approach to the Sciences of the Quran. It's translated in English. Very good text. I teach from it at Zaytuna. Uh, where he actually goes into some examples from the Bible of Nasr. So this is not a, uh, a, a Muslim concept. So you have what's known as what he calls interscriptural abrogation. Interscriptural, meaning one scripture abrogates another. In other words, the New Testament abrogates the Old Testament, or the Quran abrogates the Torah. And then you have intrascriptural, intra with an A, intrascriptural abrogation. This is when the New Testament, in many instances, uh, abrogates itself. And we find that. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus tells the Hawariyun, Enter ye not into any Gentile land, or the towns of Samaria, enter ye not, but go rather into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, think not that I've come, no, Matthew 15 he says, um, that I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in other words, he's only he's telling the Hawariyun only to go, only to go to Jewish homes, with the Injil. Don't go to non-Jews. But in Matthew 28, he says, go into all nations. Why is that? Because now the teaching is complete. It's a progressive revelation. Now they have the full gospel. So it seems like a contradiction, but there's a way to explain it. So thus, the irony is oftentimes Christians will point to things in the Quran uh, and will explain it through the lens of Nusk, and they'll say, oh, that's very convenient cover-up. They have the same concept in their text. You have this, uh, an example of the New Testament abrogated the Old Testament. Um, in, in Jewish law, um, a man can divorce his wife for any reason, anytime he wants. He can just write a letter and repudiate his wife, no problem, and marry somebody else. Isa alayhi salam apparently says in Matthew 19, that you can only do that if your wife is guilty of porneia, which is the Greek word, uh, which is where we get the word pornography from. Porneia means adultery. It's only if she commits adultery can you divorce your wife. So in this sense, what he's doing is he's making it more strict. This is called teshdid, right? Teshdid. Um, so when it comes to nas. You have Taysir and Tashdeed. Taysir means to ameliorate something, make it easier. Make it easier. And this uh, idea is in the Quran. There's actually a statement attributed to Isa salam, in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 50, where Isa salam, says, I confirm the Torah, but I also make halal some of the things that were haram. It's called taysir, making things easier for people. Right? This is a function of nas, but also tashdeed, uh, intensification, to make things more stringent, like what it says in Matthew about divorce. It's, it's under the rubric of Nusk. There's different types of Nusk. One might even describe Nusk as um, a refinement of a previous ayah. And that seems to be how Ibn Taymiyyah is using it. We'll talk about that. All of these things. So, so Ibdad, Ibdad, substitution, replacement, is under the rubric of Nusk. Ibdad, total cancellation, is under the rubric of Nusk. Taysir, amelioration, making things easier. Tashdeed, making things harder. Okay. Um, so, a few terms here. The abrogating verse in Arabic is called nasikh. Nasikh. 
That's the verb. That's the verse that's abrogating the abrogated verse, the cancelled verse, or the refined verse, if you will. It's called mensuch. So these are active and passive participles. Fa'il maf'ul, nasif, and mensuch. The classic example. Okay, now let's talk about an example. The classic example of nasif in the Quran is the gradual prohibition of alcohol. So you have Surah uh, An-Nisa, Ayah 43. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is a madani ayah. Ya ayyuhal ladina amun, la taqrabu salah wa antum sukara, hatta ta'alabu ma ta'ulu. All you who believe, uh, don't approach the prayer while you are intoxicated until you can understand what you're saying. A short time later, you have 219 of Al-Baqarah revealed to the Prophet which is now making a moral argument against alcohol. That khamar and mesir, so alcohol and gambling, it says, The harm of them is more than their benefits. This is now an argument. We're on the road to Nasr. And then Al Ma'ida, ayah number 90, 590. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about alcohol and gambling, Fajtanibuhu, Rijizu bin Amal al Shaytan, Fajtanibuhu, they are um, an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Shun them completely. So, how do we know about Nas? What is it based on? It's based on reliable reports from the Prophet and the companion, similar to how Asbab al Nuzul was, was known. There's also an element of Ijtihad from the scholars. It's good to be with the majority. Yadullahi ma'al jama'a. The protection of God is with the majority. So the Urnama talk about four classes of abrogation. Four classes. You have Quran abrogating Quran, like the wine example, the alcohol example. Quran abrogating Quran. All classical scholars believe in intra Quranic abrogation. The difference of opinion again is the extent or scope of the abrogation in the Quran. There's always a difference of opinion about everything, except the three questions in your grave. That's the difference of that, right? That's why the, that's the wisdom of the three questions. There, there is only one answer to each question. Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? Man Nabiyuka, who is your Prophet? Madiyuka, what is your religion? So you're not going to be asked, Ma, you know, Madhabuka, Ma, Man Shaykhuka, Ma, Ma Tariqhuka. You know, these questions are not. I mean, they're, 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 they facilitate our understanding of our Lord and the Prophet and the religion. But there's more than one answer to those questions. Of these three, there's one answer. Know it or not. So, according to Sayyuti, abrogation happens 19 times in the Quran. That's it. 19 times. Some read Sayyuti differently and say, no, he means 21. But according to the translation of the Itqan I have, 19 times. A more modern scholar, Shah Waliullah, Indian scholar, died 1762. He says it's only actually five times in the Quran. So we'll talk about why there's a difference of opinion here uh, in a minute. But basically, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, the Salaf used the word Nasq very broadly the Salaf are the early Muslims. When they say this ayah is mansuh, they really meant that this ayah has been refined by another, not absolutely nullified. Right? That's how they're using it. The Khalaf, the later scholars, when they say Nasr, they tend to mean absolute nullification. Right? I'll give you an example. In, in Ali Imran 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amin, Ittaqullah haqqa tuqati. O you who believe, fear Allah as he has the right to be feared. 
And some of the Sahaba were saying, wow, how can we fear Allah as is his right? So the ayah was revealed, uh, Surah 64, Tahabun, verse number 16, فَاتَّقُوا Fear Allah as much as you can. So, is there really an abrogation happening here? The goal is the same, fear Allah as is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The goal remains, uh, but the method is now revealed. So there's a refinement of how to get to the goal. How do we how do we fear Allah, in other words, as is his right, by fearing Allah as much as you can. Okay. So the salaf, they did not mean absolute nullification. Or if you look at what you know Sayyidi says in his uh, we mentioned this last week also about the verse in the Quran, Al Baqarah one ninety where Allah says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يُقَاتِلُوا لَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Fight those who are fighting you. Uh, but do not go to extremes. Allah does not love extremists. Chapter 2, verse 190. Imam Sayyuti says, This ayah is abrogated by the first part of At-Tawbah. بَرَاءَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَنَسُولِهِ That, you know, a declaration of immunity by Allah and his messenger, you know, breaking all covenants with mushrikeen. Attack the mushrikeen wherever you find them. Right? So what he means by that is that the first part of Toba abrogates that verse in Al-Baqarah in its immediate context. Right? It's not indefinitely abrogated. You know, fight those who are fighting you. Okay, now I can fight whoever I want. It's not how the Urgama took it. So even if there's abrogation, there's a, uh, a lot of times there's a very khas, very specific context to that abrogation. That's not a blanket abrogation. So these things take a lot of ijtihad. They take knowledge of hadith, knowledge of sirah. Uh, they take knowledge of tafsir. But it's not a simple, you know, okay, whatever's in Medina abrogates Mecca, no. That's how a lot of kuffar present nasq in the Qur'an, right? So one of the last surahs to be revealed was a toba. So they say, oh, toba then, which describes the rules of engagement, what to do with if people commit khiyana against the Muslim polity. Right? Well, that's the surah now that Muslims go by. And history doesn't bear that out when Muslims were going into different lands, they didn't, you know, just you know, slaughter everyone wholesale. There's no evidence of that in North Africa. People willingly became Muslim. You know who even admits this? There's a book called Answering Islam. That was a website. It was a book written in the early 90s by Norman Geisler, a big anti-Muslim polemicist, and his ghostwriter, Abdul Salib. He says that he has this friend named Abdul Salib, who was a former Muslim. Abdul Salib is the slave of the cross. But he probably doesn't exist. Abdul Salib is probably a figment of Geisler's imagination. A lot of these Christian guys, in order to sort of bolster their work, uh, they sort of make up some, this guy's a former Muslim, so he knows what he's talking about. Anyway, he says in that book that many, uh, many Christians in North Africa willingly accepted Islam because of Islam's stress on brotherhood and low taxes. That's what he says in that book. Because there's no historical evidence of wholesale bloodshed of invading Muslim armies. You take in the largest Muslim country, Indonesia, you know, eight, eight Tujar that were Muslim, eight traders, uh, traders, I said like trader jokes, right? Tajik, uh, merchants, I should say, eight merchants, they went into Indonesia and they just showed Good character. And now you have 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. A Muslim soldier never stepped foot on the soil of Indonesia. People can't explain that. I was in a debate one time in America with a guy named Lakona, and he said his argument was people in America, because I said 20,000 people in America become Muslim, and it's not due to immigration. I'm talking about black Americans, white Americans, Latino Americans. And he said, well, that's because Islam is spread by the sword. What? 
Who, who has a gun to these people's heads? So I walked around from, I was behind a podium, I walked around, I said, do you see a, a weapon on me? And I turned around and I said, I must have left it outside next to my camel. That's <laughs> double parked, right? <laughs> and it's just a nonsensical, it deserves to be ridiculed. Or they say, another argument is, men become Muslim in America because they want to practice polygamy. I mean, how many Muslims do you know in America? How many Muslim men in America do you know that have more than one wife? I mean, certainly that's not a major factor why people are becoming Muslim. They just don't want to admit people become Muslim because they believe it's true. <laughs> what a concept. Amazing. <clears throat> anyway. Okay, so Quran abrogating Quran is one class of abrogation, right? but very limited. Then you have Quran abrogating Sunnah, for example, and Sunnah is not just Hadith, it's authenticated Hadith, the normative practice of the Prophet is Sunnah. So we believe in the Sunnah, right? There's some people who conflate the two and say, oh, Hadith, you know, some of them are weak, of course some of them are weak, some of them are are forged. Kitab al Mawdu'at, Ibn al Jawzi has a whole book on forged hadith. Sunni scholar. We're talking about the Sunnah, we're talking about the normative, uh, the agreed upon ethos, the agreed upon normative practice of the Prophet. So his practice was to follow Ahl al Kitab uh, against the Mushriki when there was no command from Allah. So he would face Baytul Maqdis for the Salawat. Right? You, you face Jerusalem, and then the eye was revealed in Al-Baqarah 144 to face uh, Mecca. فَوَلِّي وَجْحَكَ شَطْرَ مَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Turn your face towards the inviolable mosque. Quran abrogating Sunnah. Then you have the controversial classification, which is not agreed upon. Sunnah abrogating Quran. The Hanafis believe it's possible. The Malikis believe it's possible, and the Shia or the Ja'faris, if you will, also believe it's possible. That Sunnah can abrogate the Quran. But only Sunnah that is considered to be tawatul, multiply attested. And the proof text of the Ahnaf is Surah Najm. Wa The Prophet never speaks from Hawa. Everything he says is wahi. So if we know, if it's multiply attested, that this is definitely what he said, and it's a hadith, it's not an ayah, it's still something he said, and it's wahi. So it's possible for a multiply attested hadith to abrogate something in the Quran, according to the Hanafis, the Malikis, and the Shia. Um, the Shafi'is denied this, and so did the Hanbalis. Imam Shafi'i position was the Sunnah is never as strong as the Quran. And he points to an ayah in the Quran, Surah Yunus, ayah number 15, where the Mushrikeen come to the Prophet and they say, This is a good Quran, but change it a little bit. And he says, It is not for me to change anything. So this is the proof text that no Sunnah, no matter how strong, can ab abrogate the Quran. And there is a difference of opinion as to what, what Imam Shafi's actually actual opinion was. Did he just believe it's not possible, or did he believe that it never just occurred? So that's a controversial one, Sunnah abrogating Quran. And then you have Sunnah abrogating Sunnah, which is uh, agreed upon. You might have 40 hadith on one issue. To give you a good example, there's a hadith that says, do not go to graveyards. There's another hadith that says, go to graveyards. Right? So if one isn't uh, initiated in the sciences of hadith, one can make grave errors in deriving rulings from hadith. So these uh, sound six books, Bukhari Muslim, we have them in our homes for Barakah, you know, we can read them. Uh, but don't extract legal rulings from them. That's for the ulama. That's who they were written for. That was the intention of Imam Bukhari and Muslim, to write these things for ulama that know how to deal with them. 
So <clears throat> how do we deal with the graveyards issue? Well, initially, the Prophet deemed it impermissible for the Sahaba to go to graveyards because many of them would go there and worship their ancestors. So they're coming out of Jahiliya, right? So he's weaning them off of that. So it's forbidden, do not go. And then in the Medina period, when they're established in Tawheed, now it's permissible. Go to the graveyard, you know, pray for the dead, recite Quran for them, and then leave. Don't commit these excesses. Don't, you know, circumambulate them. Don't grab them and kiss them and rub them. These types of things. Don't pray, don't bow towards them. Right? So he's wean them off. This is the wisdom behind it. Abrogation. Another example of, oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so we said according to the According to the definition of Nasq, then, the definition of the, khal uh, the Khalaf, the later scholars, right, that just absolute, just absolute negation. Suyuti so says it happens 19 times in the fall. In the Quran, we have Nasq al Hukmi duna tilawa. Nasq al Hukmi duna tilawa. We have an abrogation of the legal ruling without its recited ayah. <clears throat> so, in other words, the ayah is still recited, but the legal ruling has been abrogated. For example, the verse about wine, 443. Don't come to the prayer while you're intoxicated. Now, that doesn't mean that the ayah has no meaning anymore. Imam Ghazali said, There's an exoteric meaning to the Quran and an esoteric meaning of the Quran. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who is an Imam of Ahl Sunnah, he said every verse of the Quran has four layers of meaning. He called them al-fad, isharat, lata'if, and haqa'iq. The expression, the illusions, illusions, the subtleties, and the realities. So the ulama would argue here, sukara means intoxicated, but there's, it has different meanings. It could mean distracted. Don't come to the prayer while distracted. So we're talking about nusk, we're talking about the esoteric meaning has been lifted. The very clear, apparent meaning. Don't come to the prayer intoxicated on wine. That's clear. 
But there's other meanings that are there. They're esoteric in nature. You know, in other words, clear your mind. Don't be intoxicated with dunya, with worry, with despair. Right? Get that out of your mind and then come to the prayer. So there is a meaning that's still, there's an esoteric meaning that's good for all time. Just to make that clear as well. <coughs> so as we said, according to the definition of Nasr al the Khalaf, Imam Sayyuti says in Itqan, there's 19 or so ayat in the Quran that are abrogated, Shah Waliullah, he said it happens only five times, and none of the five times that Shah Waliullah uh, um, demonstrates has anything to do with um, uh, the la fi being abrogated, or that ayatul safe abrogates, you know, the, the verse of the sword abrogates any of the so-called peaceful verses of the Quran. Now, others disagree and say there's no abrogation in the Quran. They'll contend there are actually no sound reports on this issue at all. More modern, this is a more modern opinion, right? Uh, the trend nowadays is sort of to downplay Nasr. So, Ahmad, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, the founder of Aligarh University in India, he did not believe there's abrogation in the Quran. Um, Muhammad Abdu, Rashid Rida, Egyptian reformists, or called neo Mu'tazilai, proto Salafi, whatever people refer to them, uh, they did not affirm abrogation in the Quran. The Mu'tazilai position is that there is no abrogation. So uh, the Mu'tazilai uh, alam was named Abu Muslim al Isfahani, Abu Muslim al Isfahani, who said that there's no, there's no intra Quranic abrogation. The Quran does not abrogate itself, there's only inter scripture. Abrogation, meaning the Quran's ahkam abrogates the ahkam of the Torah and Inji. <coughs> okay. Some would say that these are not really abrogations, they're more specifications. That one verse explains another in more detail or according to special circumstances. So, going back to the wine example, 590 says wine is forbidden. 443 says, but, you know, if you happen to get drunk, then just don't come to the prayer in the muster. And then 2119, 2219 says, there's some benefit in alcohol, so you can't use that as an excuse for moderate drinking. So really, there's no abrogation here. Or specifications. So, uh, I am the <coughs> yes. Yeah. So you, you do have uh, the ulama mentioned you have abrogation of the recited verse with its legal ruling, but there's only one example they can think of. Apparently, in Sahih Muslim, Aisha reveals who says that there was a verse that dealt with something like ten sucklings that make a marriage impermissible. Then it, was, then it was reduced to five. It's a very enigmatic statement she's making. But apparently there was an ayah like that, that dealt with ten sucklings and invalidated a marriage. Um, <clears throat> that's no longer recited in the Quran, and the legal ruling is no longer applied. Uh, but some would say that this report is spurious. Um, or it could refer to something that is related to the Ahruf of the Qur'an, uh, where you have uh, synonyms in some, some surah, of suwar. Uh, for example, in the Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud, he says, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَسُوفِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Instead of إِحْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Suf is a, it also means wool, it's a synonym. So this could have been uh, a, a form that was revealed to the Prophet uh, in order to facilitate understanding of a certain Arab tribe that didn't use another the other word ihnil um, manfush, but over time that that version of the ayat, if you will, uh, just fell out of use. It wasn't it wasn't recited anymore. So in that sense, it was forgotten. Um, or the other must say that that munsiha is really referring to the ahkam of previous scriptures. We don't have authentic scriptures of the Torah and the Injil. So Allah replaced them 
with the Quran, something better or similar. Yes, uh, what's the majority of the majority, majority opinion is, it is <clears throat> in the Sunnah is that there's definitely an abrogative aspect in the Quran. That the Quran um, does abrogate certain ahkam within itself. And that's across the board from classical scholars. The modern trend denies that. And that's based on, you know, that's based on scholarship and that's something to, to take, you know, seriously. Uh, but the real difference of opinion amongst the Salaf was the extent of abrogation. How often does this happen in the Quran? Yeah. Yes. Um, besides the six, three, two letter combinations at the beginning of surahs, are there any other ayahs that the meaning, the general meaning, isn't agreed upon? Like, for example, that I mean, like, I was, uh, no one can say you in Greek Turkey. Is there any other ayahs? Yeah, the ayat with the shabihat. So verses in the Quran that um, that have theological implications, right? uh, or ayahs that seem to present um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as having the qualities of creation, using words that may conjure up physical images. Tuma istawa ala al-arsh. Then he is the arsh. What does that mean? Somebody asked Imam Malik about that. Right? Like, do we go into that? We didn't mention it. So istawa, one of the meanings of istawa is julus, is to sit. The arsh, one of the meanings of arsh is a footstool or a bench or a chair. So a man came to Imam Malik and he said, What does istawa al arsh mean? And he was sort of a proto anthropomorphist. An anthropomorphist is someone who believes that God has body parts and he's, he's in space, he's made of matter. So Imam Malik, he said, istawa ma'alum. The, the verb istawa is in the Quran, there's no doubt. And he said, kayfiyatuhu uh, um, ma'akul. That how is istawa is beyond your comprehension. Was su'al anhu bid'a. And asking about it is an innovation. So nobody really knows what that means. Right? And the tendency of the Salaf was to leave the meaning to God. It's called Tafwil. Allah knows what it means. Whatever is, uh, whatever is becoming of His greatness and majesty. Allahu alam, laysa kamithihi shaykhun. And they leave it. They wouldn't comment on it. The Khalaf sometimes would comment on these things. Because you have other Muslim groups saying deviant things about these ayat. So the Mutashabihat ayat. The Quran says the Muhkamat, however, the verses that are that are easily understood, they're Umul Kitab, they're the essence of the book. So if you even in translation, you'll get the essence of the Quranic of the Quran's teaching from the Muhkamat. Are there any preserved in the Quran right now that we still don't know the meaning to? Of course, yeah. Yeah, the Quran is... I mean, I mean, that same same answer applies to that. I mean, every, there, there, are, there are tafasir for every ayah in the Quran. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the ayat that are with the shabi hat that are obscure or theological or multidimensional, you know, these are certainly uh, these are certainly open to further inquiry. I don't know. Are they big in number? I guess is my question. Or is it, you know, no. They're, no. They're not. They're not. And again, the muhkamat the or the essence of the text. So, um, so those are easily understood. And even the Mutashabi had them. If you can read a that if you read a good tafsir on that, it's, it's pretty clear what apparently the Bihai had are saying. But you know, the Quran is a universal scripture and it's good for all time. Uh, so that's the point of modern tafsir is to make the Quran relevant for different audiences. 
Yeah, you said, so you said there are 19 organizations. Yeah. And it's a lot like there's there none. Is it because they read the same thing differently or interpretation is different? They're reading the same thing, right? So, yeah. yeah I mean, what, how do they justify, rationalize 19 versus none or 19 versus 5? Yeah, it's all about how you define that. So the president was saying, there's, this isn't really ab abrogation. It's not a total nullification. Um, it's a different way of explaining the previous ayah, the refinement of the ayah. So they, they didn't like that idea of, of it, the problem of total cancellation of a hukum in the Quran. But the Ahasun will say, that definitely does happen. I mean, why was you know, permitted at one point that it was made haram? We'll, we'll come back next week, inshallah. If there's more questions about this topic, and then we'll start to see it, inshallah. The topic of Tafsir. We're talking about Tafsir. Tafsir uh, is usually translated as uh, Quranic commentary or exegesis. Exegesis is a Greek word meaning to draw something out of a text. <clears throat> tafsir is from Fassara. The verb fassara, which means to explain or to interpret something. Uh, definition of the word tafsir is given by Imam Azakashi. He says, He says, Tafsir is a knowledge by which is known the faham, the comprehension of the revealed book of God. Knowledge by which is known the comprehension of the revealed book of God. Upon his prophet Muhammad. And an explication of its meanings. As well as the extraction of its rulings and maxims. So again, knowledge by which is known. Uh, the comprehension of the revealed book of God upon his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And explication of its meanings. As well as the extraction or deduction of its rulings and maxims or legal saying, uh, sorry, wisdom sayings. The word tafsir is in the Quran itself. Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, verse 33. So this is a Quranic word. Uh, another word that's used is ta'wil. Ta'wil is also used for Quranic commentary. Ta'wil from the root awwala, awwala, which means to find the source of something. <clears throat> and the word ta'wil is in the Quran. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ For example, it's in Surah uh, Al-Imran, Ali Imran, ayah number 7. Some of the ulama say that tafsil and ta'wil are interchangeable, they're synonymous. Some of the ulama say that tafsir refers to the explication of individual words of the Qur'an. It's more like a, a lexicon, uh, we say, um, like lexical analysis. Tafsir is the explication of individual words. So what is kawthar? What is fu'ad? What is tamud? Like that. While ta'wil uh, looks at sentences and phrases words in context. So these are different opinions as to what tafsir and ta'wil mean. The first opinion is they mean exactly the same thing. Another opinion is tafsir is more like lexical analysis of individual words, whereas ta'wil refers to meanings of sentences and phrases or words in context. A third uh, opinion is that tafsir explains all of the kalimat of the Quran, all of the words, what all of the words mean. Individual words, sentences, phrase, everything. Whereas ta'wil uh, is an explanation of the ibar. Ibar means the lessons. 
the lessons of the Quran, like the overarching lesson. That's another opinion. So, you know, tafsir would be then breaking down the linguistics, the grammar, the rhetoric, looking at hadith of the story of Musa alayhi salam. But then what does that mean? What's the lesson behind it? Another opinion is that tafsir deals with the exoteric meanings of the Quran, the apparent meanings of the Quran. So the vahiri meanings, vahir. What is on the vahir is on the apparent, right? Or as we say in some Middle Eastern countries, zahir. Right? Zahir and batin. Batin. So then ta'wil is the esoteric or mystical meanings of the Quran. وَلِلْقُرْآنِ ظَاهِرْ وَالْبَاطِنِ Imam al-Ghazali says, مِشْكَعَةُ الْأَنْوَارِ For example, he uses the example of Musa alayhi salam at the shajara. Allah told him, إِخْلَعْنَ عَلَيْكِ Take off your sandals. Imam al-Ghazali says, that phrase has a has a ظاهري meaning and a باطني meaning. So one is taken from tafsir, one is called tafsir. The tafsir is, what does it mean? It means take off your sandals. He, he took off his physical sandals. That's it. The Zahiri meaning is, what do the sandals sort of represent? And Imam Ghazali says, the left sandal is the dunya, the right sandal is the akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants Musa alayhi salam not to think about either abode. Don't think about consequences in the dunya, don't even think about reward in the akhirah. Just concentrate on me. Think about Allah. Allahu alam. The latter is called ta'weed. Is it okay to say that tafsir is a bit narrower definition and tawil is a bit more broader analysis of the same text? Yeah, you can think of it like that. Yeah. In some respects. Yeah. Another way to think about this, and this is akin to the last definition, that tafsir is an explication of the muhkamat of the Quran. Muhkamat means verses that are very easily understood, ayat that are very easily understood on their on their face, even in translation. Or as ta'wil is an explanation of the mutashabihat, and these two terms are also in the Quran. Same ayah, Ali Imran, ayah number seven. Muhkamat, hunna ummul kitab, ukharu mutashabihat. Okay, so it depends on the scholar. Probably the most popular is that uh, from the Salaf, that they're interchangeable. From later scholars, they would say that the outer dimension of the Quran is tafsir, the inner dimension is tafsir. Okay. Um, there are two main approaches to tafsir. Two main approaches. The first is called at tafsir al tahlili. Tafsir al-Tahleel. Tahleel means analytical exegesis. Analytical exegesis. Or analytical tafsir. This is when an exegete, a mufassir, so the ism fa'il of fassara, yufassir, tafsirun, mufassir. Mufassir is the commentator. The commentator goes verse by verse. Verse by verse commentating on the Qur'an. This is called At-Tafsir At-Tahlili. And we'll talk about how, what, how he does that. What does he do? Right? Those are the, the types of Tafsir. But the second main approach is called At-Tafsir Al-Mawdu'ri. At-Tafsir Al-Mawdu'r. Or as we say again, Mawzu. Mawzu in Farsi means subject. Right? Or theme. So thematic Tafsir. Thematic. So here the exegete, the Mufassir, He's not going verse by verse. He's looking at themes. So he's drawing, for example, what does the Quran say about Al-Anbiya? Yeah. So he's only commenting on Al-Anbiya. What does the Quran say about um, Ahkam? Just verses that deal with, that have legalistic import. Verses that, what does the Quran say about theology? Aqidah verses. Right? This is called the Tafsir al Mawduri. Okay. Now, there are also three types of tafsir. So there are two approaches, these two, tahrili and mawduri. Then how do you do tafsir? Three types. 
The first type is called Tafsir bir riwayah Tafsir bir riwayah It's also called Tafsir bil ma'thur Ma'thur are from athara, athara. So Tafsir by transmission <coughs> by transmission or Tafsir by handed down traditions This is considered the best best type of Tafsir and there's four levels to this type of tafsir, but we'll hold off on the four levels for now. Let's go to the second type of tafsir. The second type of tafsir is called tafsir bil ra'i, the ra'i, or called bil diraya, tafsir bil diraya, the ra'i. So tafsir by qualified opinion. Tafsir by qualified opinion. So just to back up a little bit. There's two main approaches to tafsir, tahlili and mawdu'i. Right? Analytical, verse by verse, and mawdu'i, thematic. Verse by verse is going verse by verse. Thematic is just commenting on the verses that have a specific theme. Right? But how do we do these two approaches? With three types of tafsir. Either by tafsir bin riwayah, by transmission, which we'll talk about, inshallah, or the ra'i, a qualified opinion, meaning through ijtihad, rigorous scholarship. Or the ishara, by indication. So these are three types of tafsir. The riwayah, also called the ma'thur. The ra'i, also called the diraya. Or the ma'pul, by intellect. And then the ishara, by indication. In any tafsir, you just they have to be categorized in one of these three, or when the person is going to tafsir, he will change depending on the verses he's dealing with. You do mix and match. So any yeah. book that you read of tafsir, there's a mix and match. Usually, yeah, uh, yeah. There are some uh, authors <coughs> that are very mystically inclined, so they're not dealing with ahkam. Like Imam Qurtubi's uh, tafsir is is really focused on ahkam, legal rulings. But like Ibn Ajiba, right? Is all tawil, it's all mystical. Bil Ishara. So what is Bil Ishara? Let's start at the bottom. Bil Ishara, mystical exegesis, a type of tawil, right? Where the exegete will intuit the meanings. He will intuit the meanings. If this happen, this could happen to a, a regular person from the awam, that Allah will give him ilham. A, but for a regular person, it's more of a personal theophany. It's for that person. The person has an experience of Allah that's mediated by the text. For example, Sayyidina Umar, we talked about this last time. When he heard Taha, he felt as if the Quran was speaking to him. A lot of people convert like this, by the way. They read the Quran and they say, wow, this is, it's, it feels like Allah's, God is speaking to me. <coughs> right? So one must not be definitive because one is not an expert. But it's possible that someone can intuit a personal meaning from the Quran that Allah is communicating to that person. If the ulama intuit these meanings, then they can communicate them, but they also must not be definitive. Because this is the ishara. It's not necessarily that with the that are textual. That's why this is somewhat tenuous type of tafsir. Right? Some of the ulama rejected. Okay. Now let's go to Tafsir bin Riwaya, the first type. Tafsir bin Riwaya, Tafsir by transmission. And there are four grades of this. Four grades. The top grade is Tafsir of the Quran with the Quran. Tafsir of the Quran with the Quran. And those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes Tafsir of his own book. This happens quite often in the Quran. Al Qariya, Al Qariya, wa ma adraka man Qariya. What is al Qari? What will explain to you? That Allah answers it. It is a day when humanity will be like scattered moths. What is Al-Hawiyah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers, answers his own question, so to speak. So Allah comments, right? Or another example. Surah Al-Dukhan, ayah number 3. Surah 44, ayah 3. 
Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul mubarakatun. We sent it down on a blessed night. What is this blessed night? Look at Surah Laylatul Qadr, ayah number one. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul Qadr. What is this blessed night? Laylatul Qadr. That's the dominant opinion. There is, there is an opinion that the first layl is Laylatul Bara'ah, the 15th of Sha'aban. This is the opinion of Imam Abdul Rahman al Awza'i. Even here, there's not consensus. But this is generally considered the best type of tafsir. Another example, uh, and this is one that is interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ihdina surat al mustaqim He tells us to ask him. And, and Ihdina, like Hada means to show, not really the guy, literally to show, show us the straight path. Right? And the word sirat in Arabic. If you look it up in the Hans Ver dictionary or any other dictionary, there's no plural form of sirat. It's very unusual. I can't even think of another word like this, except for the word Allah. Right? Like sabir also means path, but you have subul, there's a plural. Sirat is only one sirat. Right? So if you look at surah number 6, ayah 153, an'am, there's another reference to the sirat al mustaqim this is my straight path, so follow it. Right? Now the verb that Allah uses in this ayah is ittaba'a. Ittaba. This is a form eight verb. It means to follow. So keep that in mind. Now we move to Surah number three, verse 31. When in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni. So Allah tells the Prophet Say, if if you love Allah, you have to have ittiba of me. And then also, Surah 7, 157. rasula, Those who have ittiba of the Rasul. So, the first ayah says, we must follow the straight path. The second ayah says, we must follow the Prophet. Therefore, the straight path is the Prophet. Sirat al Mustaqim is the Sunnah of the Prophet. This is how the Urnama will deduce this meaning. That's why there's only a singular Sirat, because there's only one Prophet. So we have to be familiar with the language of the Quran. Maybe a, a more uh, easier example. Sirat al Ladina an Anka Alayhim. Right? The path of those whom you have favored. So then, who are these favored people? That's obviously Al Fatiha, ayah 6 and 7. If you look at Surah Nisa, ayah 69. <laughs> Again, using the same phraseology, Allah tells us who are those who have the ni'mah of Allah upon them. Prophets, right? truthful people, martyrs, and the righteous. Another example, in Surah to, uh, Baqarah, Ayah 37, Adam alayhi salam, uh, Allah tells us about Adam alayhi salam, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ that Allah taught Adam certain words, and Adam recited them, then God relented towards him or forgave him. But he doesn't tell us what these words are. But if you keep reading the Quran, Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 23, Adam alayhi salam and his wife said, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasirin. O our Lord, we have transgressed her against our own selves. If you don't show mercy to us and forgive us, we'll be from the lost ones. So the say, these are the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam. So tafsir of Qur'an with the Qur'an. Another aspect of this is to look at the context of an ayah under study, what came before and after. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33, verse 33, 
Allah only wants to remove every type of stain from you, O people of the house, and to render you pure and spotless. So then the question is, who are the Ahl al-Bayt? Right? There's a contention between Ahl al-Sunnah and Shia. Who are Ahl al-Bayt? The Shia maintain Ahl al-Bayt are only five people. These are called Ahl al-Kisa. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Imam Ali al Hassanin, Hassan and Hussein Fatima Zahra. The Sunnis will say, look at the context of this ayah, what came before and what came after. The previous ayah addresses the women of the Prophet directly, the wives. Ya Nisa al Nabi, Lestunna ka ahadin min al Nisa. Then you have this ayah. Then after this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Wad kurna, wad kurna, ma yutla. Is all feminine. And you all recite of what has been revealed to you in your homes. Kunna, feminine plural. So you have a feminine plural here. You have the Ahl al-Bayt verse here. A feminine plural here. But the Quran say the context suggests that definitely the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are from the Ahl al-Bayt. Right? But Ahl al-Bayt also contains male members. <coughs> We talk here kum taught here. Kum means men and women. So obviously there's men in Ahl al-Bayt. So this includes Ali and Hussein and so on and so forth. Um Hassan the Prophet. Says, uh, the Ulama also look at because Ahl al-Bayt, the phrase, appears three times in the Quran. In Surah Hud, verse 72 and uh, 73, uh, the angels bring news of birth of Ishaq alayhi salam to Sarah, right? And then she says, I'm going to have a son, I'm an old woman, and my, and my husband's a hundred years old. This is strange. And the angel says, This is a feminine verb. Second feminine singular, if you were to parse the verb. So they're speaking directly to Sarah Ali and they refer to her and her husband as Ahl al -Bayt. The third place where it occurs is Surah Al Qasas, chapter 28, verse 12, when Musa Ali is not nursing from anyone, from any of the, the nurses of the house of Fir'aun. So then the sister of Musa Ali whose name is Maryam, uh, she comes to Asya and she says, Shall I point you towards the people of a house that will nurse him? This is obviously referring to women. Right? Okay, so this is called Tafsir of Quran with Quran. There's many examples of this. I'll spare you more examples here. Let's move to the second grade. The second highest grade of tafsir bil riwayah. So we have tafsir bil riwayah and tafsir by transmission. The best type of that is tafsir of Quran with Quran. The second best type is tafsir of Quran with the, with the sunnah of the Prophet Right? A sunnah to tafsir al Quran. The sunnah explains, makes tafsir of the Quran. This is, this is very apparent from the Quran itself. The idea that, you know, Theory that we don't need to follow Sunnah, just follow Quran, doesn't make any sense. It's, it's untenable. Imam Suyuti in the Itqan, he has this long list of this type of tafsir, is Sunnah. One example he gives, a classic example, Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 187. <clears throat> it says, al abyadu min al khayt al aswad min al fajr. So eat and drink. Let's talk about fasting, right? Eat and, and eating and then starting your fast. Eat and drink until the white thread appears distinct from the black thread. There was a companion of the Prophet, Adi ibn Hatim, who took a black piece of string and a white piece of string, and he put it on his pillow, and he was eating, and the sun was rising. And when he could distinguish the white from the black, he stopped eating. And he said this to the Prophet. The Prophet, he said, 
You've, you're too literal. <laughs> so what it means is eat and drink till the white thread of the dawn appears, distinct from the black thread of the night. <clears throat> so the Prophet himself is explaining the meaning. Right? Tafsir of Quran is Sunnah. Bil Hadith, you can say Sal Hadith. But they take his words literally. And that's a good practice. Take it literally unless there's a reason to go to a majaz or figurative. Like the Prophet said about his wives, the, the first wife to die after me is the one is the one with the longest reach. So immediately the wife stood and measured their arms. The longest was Sauda. Right? But Zainab died first. And they understood, oh, what he meant by that, because she was Umul Masakin. She was the mother of the poor people. She was known for just giving everything out. The longest reach meant the one who was the most charitable. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Another example of this type of tafsir of Quran is Sunnah. Going back to the Ahl al Bayt verse, right? 33 33, Ahl al There is a hadith uh, re related. In, um, I believe it's in the Tabarani, where the Prophet is in the home of Umm Salama, one of his wives, and there's a knock on the door, and it's Fatima Zahra, and she's holding some dessert or something. So the Prophet says, somebody spreads out a sheet on the ground. He says, sit on this and eat. And then after some time, he says, oh, go call your husband and sons, Ali and Hussein and Hassan. So they all come and eating on this sheet. Prophet when they're done, he picks up the sheet and he throws it over the five of them. Right? And the ulama say, this is the sabab al-nuzul of this ayah. Innama yuridullahu liyudhib kuman rizza ahlet bayt wa yutahirukum fatihara. Allah wants to remove every type of stain from you, O people of the house, and to, and to render you pure and spotless. And the Prophet sallallahu he says, Allahumma ha'ulai ahlu bayt. Oh God, this is my ahl bayt. Right? And then the hadith continues that Um Salama, she tried to put her head underneath the kisa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he said, anti ila khayla, like you're okay. And didn't allow her. So this is a proof text that Shia used. It's in Sunni books <laughs> that ahl bayt are only these five. Who is the narrator of this hadith? The narrator of Umm Salam. Yeah. However, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, they say there's no contradiction here. What the Prophet is doing here is establishing an inner circle, the inner circle of Ahl Bayt, which is called Al Itra. He referred to them as Al Itra, or Itrat, we say in Farsi. So there's the Itrat, which is the essence, the core of the Ahl Bayt. Then you have greater Ahl Bayt. And this is also made manifest in a Sahih Muslim hadith. Or two tabi'i, they come to Zayd ibn Aslam, a sahaba, and they, and they ask him point blank, are the wives of the Prophet in Ahl al-Bayt? He says, yes, and so are the Banu Abbas and Banu Ja'far, the descendants of Abbas and Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. That's the greater Ahl al-Bayt. They do have, but the Itra are the five. The Prophet said, Fatima Zahra, uh, Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. So we'd say there's a greater Ahl bayt and sort of an inner circle. The Shia say these five are Ahl bayt that's it. And they're also the Itra. <clears throat> Another example. Remember the verse that we talked about in Baqarah 37? Allah taught Adam words and then Fataba Ali. Now there's a hadith of Al Hakim related by Sayyidina Umar that when Adam salam, was making Tawbah, he was saying Istifar, Istifar. And Allah was not relenting towards him. But then Adam alayhi salam, he remembered what he saw written on the arsh of Allah. It said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And he said, Allah wa bi haqi Muhammadin astaghfirullah. 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 So Allah, I, I asked him about the right of Muhammad. And then Allah asked him, Where did you learn this name? And Allah knows better. And he said, When you created me and blew into my nostrils of your ruh, I opened my eyes and I saw his name written on the arsh, and I knew that he must be a very beloved person to you. So then, Fataba alayhi, then Allah relented towards him. This mentioned the hadith of al-Hakim. The stronger is tafsir al-Quran with the Quran. 
Another example. Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. Now, here, kawthar, you cannot do tafsir of this ayah with Qur'an. Why? Does anyone know? Why not? It's the only mention of kawthar. There's, there's only one mention of the word kawthar in the entire Qur'an. Kawthar comes from kathir. Kawthar is sigot mubalaba, like something incredibly abundant. Something like overflowing, like incredibly, is called kawthar. So it's only in the hadith where he was asked, what is kawthar? And the Prophet says, Nahrut fil jannah, a river in paradise. However, the ulama say, Wagheru and other things. It doesn't limit kawthar only to the garden. Because kawthar is something that is manifold. So the ulama say, kawthar is the chasais of the Prophet. Things that are only for him, like the river in Jannah, like the Shafa'a al Udma, and also Fatima Zahra. One of the meanings of Kothar is Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam. Because in the context, the Sabah wa Nuzul of Kothar is remember they're making fun of the Prophet because his sons died and they called him Abtar, the one cut off. And Allah says, The one who hates you, he is Abtar. I'm giving you Kothar. So from this girl, this female, you're going to have incredible progeny. This is from his Qasais. His, his uh, progeny is from his daughter. So if they lost, uh, if the mission would be uh, Ishara, uh... It would be Bel-Rai, I would say, by, by Ijtihad. I mean, there's some textual proofs for it. So, so, but here the Sunnis would, because it's Bil Ra'i, the Sunnis would, it's based on Ijtihad, they wouldn't insist. This is definitely what it means. But the Shia, this is definite for them. They're more inclined towards mystical exegesis, the Shia. And so are the Christians, by the way, compared to the Jews. The Christians are very Ta'wili, Bil Ishara. This over here in the Bible, this means Jesus will be crucified. What are you talking about? Because if you, it's a typology, right? And we'll get to some of these things. The Shi'a are like that as well. If you read the Tafsir of Tada Tadari, it's very Ishari. Okay, so that's the second grade. The third grade of Tafsir bin Riwaya is by the Sahaba. Okay, so we're talking about Tafsir bin Riwaya by transmission. The best is tafsir of Quran with Quran. The second best, tafsir of Quran with Sunnah. The third best, tafsir of Quran with statements from the Sahaba. And it's um, understood that it's either actually coming from the Prophet or it's their Ijtihad. And the best of the Sahaba are the four Khulafa. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of hadith from them. There's a handful of hadith from Abu Bakr Siddiq from Sayyidina Ali. Very few hadith. It's very strange. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, I, I don't want to misquote the Prophet. So he didn't, he didn't relate a lot of hadith. But then Ibn Mas'ud is, is strong. Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Musa al Ash'ari. Aisha into Abi Bakr, or Hafsa into Umar. Again, here the Shia only take from Ahl al Bayt. They take from Ali, Hassan, and Sayyid Fatima, and their 12 Imams. So the fact that like someone like Ibn Mas'ud is in a hadith is that it's da'if or mabu, just on the face. Because they have a strange aqidah from our perspective that many of, most of these Sahaba apostated left Islam. And this is not Sharia, it's mainstream Shia. <clears throat> so we find that unacceptable. So when companions, when the Sahaba learned a surah, is very important. It was not simply related to memorization. They also learned the tafsir of the surah. For example, uh, Suyuti in the Itqani quotes Imam Malik's Muwafa. Or Imam Malik says, Aqama ibn Umar ala hifthil 
على حفظ البقرة ثماني سنين. That it took eight years for Abdullah ibn Umar, and some say Umar, to memorize al Baqara eight years. Why it take him so long? So he doesn't mean just memorizing, to learn the meanings of Baqara as well. That's what he's talking about. He learned that obviously the laft, right, the expression, but also the tafsir behind it. Ibn Kathir mentions that Ibn Mas'ud says, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُهُ مَا نَزَلَتْ آيَةٌ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا أَنَا أَعْلَمُ فِي مَنْ نَزَلَتْ وَأَيْنَ نَزَلَتْ that Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, one of the early companions of the Prophet he said, by the one, I swear by the one uh, about whom there is no other God, a verse or ayah never descended from the Book of God except that I knew about whom it descended and where it descended. And there's a similar statement made by Sayyidina Ali. And Imam Zarqashi, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he placed his blessed hand on the chest of Ibn Abbas. Allahumma alim, alim hu at ta'wil. Oh Allah, give him the ta'wil. And ta'wil again amongst the salaf means tafsir. Give, give him the tafsir of the Quran. By placing his hand on his chest. So Abdullah ibn Abbas is called Mufassir al Quran. Mufassir al Quran. Turjuman al Quran. The exegete of the Quran. <clears throat> the interpreter of the Quran. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Suyuti mentions, whenever <coughs> Sayyidina Umar wanted to know the tafsir of an ayah, he would call up Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was in his early 20s. Sayyidina Umar was in his 60s. And so the older Sahaba would say, Why do you ask this young man about tafsir of Quran? And he said, Because he's always right. He always says something that is very, very uh, insightful. So, a lot of times uh, the tafsir of uh, Ibn Abbas is tafsir, actually. Yeah. yeah, but here's the thing about Ibn Abbas. There is a, there is a, we're talking about this, there's a book of uh, tafsir that's ascribed to him. Um, it's called Tanwirul Niqdas, but many of the transmissions that are attributed to him are weak. So we have to be very careful about anything coming from Ibn Abbas. Many of the say it's actually from one of his students named Mujahid or Qatada. But it's a little bit later. So we have to be very careful about Abdullah Ibn Abbas. Anything that's that's attributed to him. A lot of it is yeah. Did he really write a tafsir? It seems too early. Allah. We'll talk about that inshallah. And then the fourth level is tafsir of the Qur'an by the tabi'een. Who are the tabi'een? The second generation of Muslims. Right? So the ulama say, the ulama of the Qur'an, they say, this is Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir says, if a tabi'een reports something from a sahabi, it should be given greater consideration. If it is his own, it must be compared with other tabi'een. If there is a sort of consensus an ijma or a jumhur amongst them, then it's given consideration. If there's ikhtilaf or it's a solitary opinion, then we should look for other sources. So the tabi'in are given weight if they say, I heard from Ibn Abbas or I heard from Ibn Mas'ud. Or it's their opinion, but there's a sort of general consensus amongst the tabi'in that this is what the ayah means. If it's isolated opinions, he says, be careful. It's opinion of Ibn Kathir. Now, with respect to the Tabi'een, there are three groups of them. The Meccan, the Medinan, and the Iraqi. And the ulama say the Meccan uh, are the best, because the pioneer of the Meccan Tabi'een, the Meccan ex school of exegesis, the Meccan school of Quranic exegesis, the founder is Abdullah ibn Abbas. And his students, as we said, are named Mujahid. You'll, sign, you'll find that in Hadith al and they call it Mujahid, or Qatada, or Ikrama, or Aqa. Those are his four main students. Mujahid, Aqa, Ikrama, Qatada. Mujahid studied the entire Quran with Ibn Abbas three times. From the Medinan school, the pioneer is Ubay ibn Ka'b. 
who made Ibn Ka'b, who was a companion of the Prophet, and his best student was named Zayd ibn Aslam. Zayd ibn Aslam. And from the Iraqi school, um, and uh, there's, in the, there's two schools in Iraq, the Basra and the Kufa. But generally, the founder of the Iraqi schools is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The best exegete in Basra was named Hassan al Basri, al Hassan al Basri. He's also a great man to solve. Um, and then Ibrahim al Nakhari in Kufa. Ibrahim al Nakhari, who was a student, a direct student of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And the student of al Nakhari is Abu Hanifa. Okay, so that's Tafsir of Quran bin Riwaya. Okay, so it's either by, by the Quran itself, that's the highest level, by the Sunnah, second highest, by the Sahaba, third highest, by the Tabi'i. Now, the second, what we call the type of Tafsir, is the Ra'i, Tafsir of the Quran by rigorous scholarship or sound opinion. It's also called Adiraya or Ma'akul. <coughs> Ijtihad. Ijtihad means rigorous scholarship. It's related to the word jihad. It's form eight in reflexive. Someone who really struggles against his, his own self. It's called a mujah, it's called a mujtahid. Mujtahid. So this is not mere opinion. Right? So like, oh, my opinion is this, but he has no training. Right? So this is someone who has training. We'll talk about the level of knowledge. But the basis for this is when the Prophet according to the Mishkat, he sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen. Mu'ad ibn Jabal. I spent the night in this masjid he founded outside of Sana'a. And he, he said to Mu'ad, he said, Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tu'nafiru. Beautiful hadith. Make things easy for people. Don't make them difficult. Call call people. Give uh, make people happy. Give them glad tidings, uh, and don't and don't drive people away from you. And then he said, "Judge according to the kitab of God." And then and then he said, "What if I don't find something in the kitab of God?" He said, "Then judge by my sunnah." What if I don't find that? Then, then use your intellect. Make ijtihad. Okay. <clears throat> so this is for Mu'ad ibn Jabal. So tafsir bin ra'i, the ulama say, is haram for the laity. For someone who does not have training in ulum al-Qur'an, it is haram to engage in tafsir and to present oneself as an authority. Hadith al-Tirmidhi, whoever comments upon the Qur'an without requisite knowledge has reserved his seat in the fire. So when it comes to tafsir the rai it's either tafsir mahmud or tafsir madhmum. It's either praiseworthy or it's blameworthy. Is it praiseworthy, mahmud, or madhmum, rejected? So Imam, so this type of tafsir should contain what's known as ideal meanings. Or meanings uh, or interpretation of the text that falls within normal interpretive parameters. Right? So Imam Zarkashi said, this type of mufassir must choose the most apparent meanings of the Arabic and not utilize vague or obscure definitions. Like as used by poets, poets use words. I mean, like you know, secondary or even uh, third or fourth, fifth definitions of words. It shouldn't be obscure. So Usmani has major issues, for example, with uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, because he interprets uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan interprets Wadribuhunna, right? strike the women. He says it doesn't mean strike. He says it means to separate from them. 
point to the Sunnah of the Prophet and say the Prophet never struck a woman. Then Yom Dulim Ra'atan Aisha says. So he points to the Sunnah, but uh, the ulama say this doesn't work grammatically. So daraba, taking a direct object, means to strike. When there's a preposition after, then it can mean to walk away from. The Quran says, Ida darabtum fi sabilillah. Right. So um, it doesn't quite work grammatically. Or like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa, Idrib bil asaq al hajara. He's not saying, you know, walk away from the rock using your stick. Think strike the rock with your stick. So the, the point here then is, what is the nature of the striking? That's the real issue. Right? So uh, Usmani would say, in most of the it doesn't do any good to just deny the ayah. The ayah is there. Right? Even if the Prophet says something never did it, right? the ayah is still there. So how do you implement it? When? What? What are the circumstances? How do you do it? What is it a good meaning? If there is a level of striking. <clears throat> or another example is the verb tawaffa, tawaffa, the primary meaning of tawaffa means al qabtu al ruh to seize the soul. Right? <clears throat> According to Lisan al Arab. And 22 times is used in the Quran to mean to take the soul or cause someone to die, except when reference to Isa alayhi salam. And the meaning is to keep one's promise. So this is a Something that some critics of the Quran point out that one of the primary definitions of tawaffa mutawaffika, Allah says that Isa alayhi salam, the primary definition could be that I will seize your soul, I will cause you to die. However, the ulama reject this because in another ayah it says, They did not kill him nor crucify him, it was made to appear so unto them. So, in order to make jama' of these ayat, they go to another primary definition of talaqba, which means to keep one's promise. <clears throat> it's a big topic. We're going to continue with it next week. <clears throat> By the way, he did not pass. They asked him about the striking. Like, what is, how do you do it? <laughs> Ibn Abbas, and this is a strong narration from him, he took out his tooth stick, this walk, and he said, you do this to her hand. And they said, this doesn't cause any pain or anything. So yeah, that's the point. So in other words, when a man is arguing with his wife, uh, generally, at least maybe it's not a politically correct statement, but women are generally more gifted linguistically. Women don't stutter as much as men. They're more gifted than wisdom. Uh, so a man will be losing a debate, and to compensate for that, he's going to turn things physical. So even that bass says, make it physical, but make it this, just to cause a break, to stop that sort of snowballing down into a physical abuse. Do something physical to let off some steam. So the point is not to cause harm, it's to do something physical. That's how Ibn Abbas interpreted it. And if you look at the, that ayat, actually, the ayat says, you know, first admonish her, like give her advice, and, and then, you know, uh, then, you know, you'll talk it out, and if that doesn't work, you know, then separate your bed from her, right? Which is much harder for men than women. So men don't want to get to that point. And then it says, So after you've already talked things out, I mean, how, how is it going to get down to Wadribu? Because 99% of the time, an actual strike happens in, like, in a fit of rage. It's not after, okay, we're going to talk, let's separate minutes, and then, okay, you know what, honey? There you go. It's, it's not going to happen. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Um, so, in other words, even that Bass is saying, at that point, come back in, try to work it out, and then give yourself a non-verbal way of sort of blowing off steam without harming her. He actually commented on this verse at Hajjatul Wada. And he said, which means without any type of 
pain, infliction, any type of like mark or anything like that. All of that is absolutely haram. You can't beat an animal. You, you, how can you beat your wife? Yes. Uh, do you know there's a hadith where uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, uh, if I wasn't the Prophet of God, I would do this, which is like regarding his misfire? Yeah. Do you know if, the, if there's a hadith like that? Yeah, there's something like that. There's mentioned in um, Shema'i literature. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if I wasn't, I would hit you with the misfire. Yeah, that's that's what he bases, that's one of the basis of Ibn Abbasism. It's mentioned in the Shema'i um uh, in, uh, what is that for? Our, our Sayyidina Muhammad, and Imam Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini. It's been translated, our Master Muhammad. It's in two volumes. Yeah. And people say, well, you know, we actually put that hadith in there to show the, the Prophet's forbearance. Yeah, he wouldn't even do that. And even if he did, it's, it's, not, it's nothing. The point is not to inflict harm. <coughs> but you have Prabhupada Usu. Prophet said in the hadith, I fear for you something more than I fear that than I fear for you the Dajjal. I said, what is it? Ulama su evil scholars. You turn on the TV, you see them on satellite. One of them said, you can beat your wife, you can do whatever you want to your wife, just don't break any bones. So somebody called in and said, can I skin her alive? He said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ulama su evil scholars. You know, I mean, where do you get it? Don't break any bone. I mean, where are you getting this from? This is from it. And Tasib bin Ishara bin Shaitan. But people, you know, nowadays people want you know, attention and things like that. If you can be controversial, but, you know, be famous by any means necessary. Right? That's why you have all these. You know, right now, the, the, what's trending is, you know, being sort of a hardcore alt right activist and speaker, uh, you know, saying things that are borderline racist. These people are world famous now. Riots at universities. And you think, are these people even sincere? <coughs> Probably not. Anyway. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So, again, with Tafsir bin Ra'i, he said it's either acceptable or it's rejected. So tafsir that's accepted is someone who is proficient in classical sciences. So someone who studies sharia and aqidah and loga, like language. Other tafsir, he's master of sirah and hadith, asbab al nuzul ijaz al-Qur'an, nasq in the Qur'an. 13 to 15 disciplines, he has to have ijazat, or she has to have a teaching licenses. In order to give a, your own opinion about an ayah of the Quran, tafsir bin Ra'i. And even then, when you give your own opinion, it has to fall within linguistic parameters of the word that you're. You can't find some deep, deep, dark, crazy definition of that word that nobody's ever heard of. So, mere opinion without knowledge is rejected. Or to go against the ijma. For example, somebody say somebody has all of these disciplines and he says, you know, in the Quran it says, whichever way you turn, you'll find the countenance of God. You can pray any direction, any qibla. That's fine. So this would be rejected, even though the scholar has ijazat, because he's going against clear ijma. Consensus of all scholars. There's no even minority opinion that says, face a different qibla. I'm not talking about direction, like north, east, west, what's the quickest way. I'm talking about facing something else other than Mecca. If somebody says, oh, the Quran means face Jerusalem. This is rejected, and, and this person needs to make toba. It doesn't matter how many teaching licenses he has. Yes? Question? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you know these profligates, there's this false prophet named Rashad Khalifa, who, <laughs> who said, so that's me. You are from the messengers. He's talking about me. And he started making commentaries in the Quran like that. So why is this type of tafsir important? 
it, it, because it makes the Quran relevant for a specific audience of believers. These are called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means to interpret the Quran through a certain lens. Right? I mean, the Bible does this all the time. You go to the Bible bookstore, the Bible for uncles, the Bible for military men, for veterans. You know, so so the tafsir is catered towards a certain reader. The Bible for teenagers. And nowadays, you know, we should have tafsir of the Quran. The tafsir of the Quran that highlights human rights, or you know, environmentalism, gender roles, or race. You know, or we should have a you know, post 9/11 American reading of the Meccan Suwar. Because the ulama always say here in like the Meccan period, the prophets of Muslims in America is analogous to the Meccan period. So then, what do we do with these Meccan Suwar? We can read the translation, but how do we apply them to? Or context. That's why tafsir the ra'i is important. So it's not just, oh, this is the hadith, you know the tradition really well. You have to know that. But what do you do with the tradition now? How do you make the Quran relevant to your specific circumstance? This is badly needed. Any questions from the sister side? And then uh, some issues that I just had a quick yeah. form of comment. I don't know if you could clarify for me. I heard that like the first um, woman, Muslim woman who translated the Quran, translated the Tharaba as well as to go away. I don't know if, you're, if you know this, but I was just wondering, I was going to ask that question before. Can you clarify why yeah. did it go away? Just, I, I mean, Amina would do it. Um, she just rejects the, in her book, she just, she said, I say no to this verse. I don't know what that means. Sounds problematic. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. But Jonathan Brown, in his book, Misquoting Muhammad, he actually mentions that. He says so there is an opinion that, because that's what the Prophet apparently did. His wives would have conspired against him. You know, there was a competi healthy competition amongst them. So he, he, but you know, it upset him. So he never struck them. He separated from them, according to the Sirah. That's why Omar, you know, he saw the Prophet sitting by himself and he said, did you divorce all your wives? And he said, no. So what are you doing here? And he said, you know, I'm just sort of taking some time out, right? So that's sort of the, the ulama say that you know, the this, this seerah, because the Prophet, you know, he's kind of hulubu al-Qur'an. His entire essence is the Qur'an. So he applied these ayat somehow. So how did he apply this ayat? By separating from his wife. But we're talking about a linguistic standpoint, it doesn't quite work. Right? I think it says, um, uh, paradise lies in the feet of the mother. If, if you can break it down, what does it mean, right? So that yeah. Again, same yeah, possibly. It doesn't possibly. mean the mother is just like making the Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. So, kind of, yeah. You sort of have to twist the Arabic a little bit. It could work. Yeah. And this is marriage, marriage counseling. Allah is giving counseling to the couple, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Instead of breaking, uh, I mean, divorcing this kind of shape. Yeah. Yeah. I think they started the Quran. So today, inshallah, we're going to uh, finish tafsir, um, exegesis, and then next week um, <clears throat> we'll do some miscellaneous topics and have a Q&A session, maybe you have time for a Q&A session now as well. If at any time during the class you have a question, you can ask it. You don't have to wait till after or something. Right. <clears throat> so you can ask any question, doesn't mean you're going to get an answer. <laughs> so maybe. I don't know as an answer. Right. That, did he, that was a man who lived in Morocco <clears throat> during the time of uh, Imam Malik Ibn Anas. The Imam of Masjid al Nabawi, as you know, he walked from Morocco to Medina. And he got to Medina and he asked Imam Malik 36 questions. And to 32 of them, Imam Malik said, Allahu a'lam la adri. <laughs> I don't know, Allah knows best. But he was so happy that Imam Malik answered four of his questions. <laughs> Okay. 
So the last time we said that when it comes to tafsir, there are two main approaches or methods to tafsir. One approach is called tahlili, which is analytical to exegesis, is to uh, uh, interpret the Quran verse by verse in order. So that tafsir al tahlili. And then we said there's tafsir al mawduri or thematic exegesis, where I mufassir will look at a certain theme and pull out those ayat from the Quran and comment upon them. And we said the mufassirin, the exegetes who uh, undertake these methods, have three types of tafsir that they use. And these types are bil riwaya, right? also called bil ma'athur, tafsir by transmission. And we said there was four levels of that. And then we said tafsir bil ra'i, also called bil diraya, tafsir by uh, qualified opinion, and then tafsir bil ishara, by indication. So last time we began talking about tafsir bil riwaya, right? And we said that tafsir by transmission has four levels. There's tafsir of Quran with Quran. And then tafsir of Quran by the Sunnah. Then tafsir of Quran by the Sahaba. Then tafsir of Quran by the Tabi'i, the followers. <coughs> and then I believe we began talking about tafsir the Ra'i as well. Is that right? Yeah. By reason or rigorous scholarship, by ijtihad, right? And we said here, there's two types of tafsir also. There's tafsir mahmud and tafsir madhmum. There's accepted tafsir and there's uh, rejected tafsir. So we said when it comes to tafsir mahmud, that the exeget must be proficient in various disciplines or sciences. Right? So it's not just someone says, you know, um, I studied a little bit of Arabic and I think this ayah means this. Right? Again, this doesn't negate this idea that the Quran has a personal meaning for us. Right? We talked about that as well. That a lot of people convert to Islam because they'll read an ayah in translation and it will change their life. Right. We're talking about someone who is presenting themselves as an authority and is saying that this is what the ayah means, in my opinion. So one must have loha, right? They must be a master of Arabic. And 14 times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qualifies the noun Quran with Arabian. Quran and Arabian. This is an Arabic Quran. It's Arabic. So, my teachers, they would say, when they would quote the Qur'an in another language, Sheikh Muhammad al-Yaqubi, may Allah preserve him, when he would quote the Qur'an in English, he would say, some of the meanings may suggest the following. Right? Some of the meanings, right? the ma'an, the meanings, may suggest the following. And then he'll say the verse or the ayah in, in English. But the Qur'an is Arabic, and the ulama say, uh, commenting on Surah Al-Baqarah, that وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْنَمُنَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا أَمَانِي That from them are some that are illiterate who don't know the kitab. Ibn Abbas says the kitab here is the Torah, uh, except their own sort of vain interpretations. So Ibn Abbas's exegesis says that the reason why many of the Bani Israel began to go astray is simple, it's the loss of Loha, the loss of their language. Go back a hundred years from now, most Catholics knew some Latin. It was required. They would pray in Latin. Every Catholic knew some Latin. They would teach it in school, Greek and Latin. Uh, but that's no longer the case. I've even met, you know, Christian pastors. These are people who, you know, run churches who don't know any Greek or Latin. 
and they actually called me to go and teach a section of Greek to their congregation. And so that's a good idea, but then they always change their mind at the last second and say, no, you might proselytize or something. Make some dawah, you know, undercover dawah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you have to know loha, you have to know other tafasir, you have to know the sira of the Prophet them. you have to know hadith, you have to know asbab and nuzul, we talked about this, right? You have to know the naskh, the uh, science of abrogation and the extent of that and the different opinions regarding that. So all these things one has to know in order to have a tafsir mahmud bir ra'i. And then we said there's tafsir madhmum, which is blameworthy, which is rejected. And this is someone who gives their mere opinion, goes against the ijma, doesn't have uh, requisite knowledge. The Sahaba and the Tabi Rohan were very cautious about tafsir bil ra'i, very cautious. Sa'id ibn Musayyid, when they asked him questions about halal and haram, he would answer readily. But when he would, they would ask him questions about tafsir, he was silent as if he didn't hear. <clears throat> and then we have tafsir bil, uh, bil, bil ishara, or by indication. So here the uh, interpretation is beyond the outward meanings of the Qur'an. And these occur to a heart which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened. And this is Allah's prerogative. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give secrets, asrar, to whomever he wills. Right? This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Um, so when it comes to this type of exegesis, sometimes as we said, one of the meanings or definitions of ta'wil is mystical exegesis. Remember we talked about the different opinions, the difference between tafsir and ta'wil. So one of the differences by the ulama is that tafsir is an interpretation of the outward meanings of the Qur'an, and ta'wil is the interpretations of the inward meanings of the Qur'an. Um, so more conservative ulama, they don't necessarily will engage in this type of Tafsir, but this very prevalent type of tafsir amongst uh, the Shia, who are more mystically inclined, uh, and Christians when it comes to the Bible. Right? So for Christians, almost everything in the Old Testament is some sort of indication, ishara, of Isa alayhi And I think they might go a little overboard. There are certainly places in the Old Testament or the Tanakh that do that do not fit the description of the Isa alayhi but rather fit the description of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu um, alayhi If they were to entertain that type of interpretation, many of them do not, and they don't know much about him. So that's where we sort of come in and try to educate people about that. Um, <clears throat> so to give you an example, and there are obviously Sunni exegetes, Ibn Ajiba and others, Imam Ghazali, Sahala to study, Ibn Arabi, uh, who do engage in this bil ishara, which is really extraordinary what they say. Um, I'll give you an example of this. We talked about this one last time, as Musa alayhi salam being told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ikhla'na alayk, remove your two sandals. Right, and we said that, you know, there's a vahiri meaning here, there's an explicit meaning, which is that he removed his sandals, and no one is doubting that. Right? So Imam Ghazali in his munqad, Mina Dalal, his sort of autobiography, if you will, he says that he studied with a with different groups of people. One of them he calls the esotericists, the esotericists, the Baltiniya, right? And the Baltiniya were those, and it seems to be a a sect of the Shia, maybe the Ismailis, who rejected that the uh, Quran has outward meanings; everything is inward, right? So he rejected their opinions. Uh, but you also have a, uh, a method called the Vahiriya that denies the inward meanings, but only takes the outward meanings. So Imam Ghazali says very clearly, Lil Quran, Zahirun wa batin. Remember that from the Nishkatul Anwar, that Nietzsche writes. Quran has an outward or explicit exoteric meaning as well as an inward esoteric meaning. And both of them should be accepted. So Imam al-Ghazali, he uses the example in the hadith, لَا تَدْخُلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ بَيْتًا فِيهِ سُورَةً وَلَا كَلْبٍ 
that the angels do not enter a house that has a picture or a dog, right? <clears throat> and he says, well, what does that mean on its face? It means that if there's a dog in the house, exactly what it says. If there's a dog in the house, right? So we, uh, we accept the outward meaning. But then he says there are other people who reject the outward meaning and say, oh, it just means don't bring dog-like qualities into the house. And he says, both are correct. Don't bring dog-like qualities if you're a human being, right? Don't bring those qualities into your home. So, <clears throat> interesting also is uh, something that is attributed to Abdul Qasim and Junaid, uh, one of the great articulators of Tasawwuf in the fourth century from Baghdad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks to Musa alayhi salam at the burning bush, he says, Inni anallah, innani ana rabbuk. So he repeats the pronoun ana. Ana, I am, I am God. Inni anallah. I am, I am God. So it's interesting why, you know, and, uh, why, why the duplication of the ana. And Imam al-Junaid notes that this is also true in the Torah. That Musa alayhi salam in Exodus, when he's at the burning bush, God tells him, Ehye asha ehye in Hebrew, I am who I am, I am who I am, I am duplicated again. So, Junaid says that the reason for this is to stress the core attribute of Allah, that Allah is the only one who can truly say, I am, because uh, Allah is pure being, that He's non contingent. His uh, existence does not depend on anything else. Whereas our existence is completely dependent on Him. And this is one of the meanings of Samad, Allah Samad, Kudu Shayin Yahtaju Ilayhi, wa huwa la Yahtaju Ila Shayin. Everything is in need of Him while He is in need of nothing. Right? So, Wujud, this is the core attribute. We study theology, Ash'ari theology, Maturidi theology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 20 attributes that are considered. Wajibat, and the, the core attribute is wujud, existence. Allah exists. So this is the, according to Imam al-Junaid and others, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stressing to Musa alayhi salam, that uh, the one who is the necessary existent is speaking with you. Allah's existence is necessary. Wallahu a'lam. There's, there's uh, as I said, there's, and Shia ulama who have really interesting things to say as well. Uh, Imam Tada Tabari in his Al Mizan, um, he looks at a passage from Surah Safat, right? Chapter 37, verse 106. This is when Ibrahim is ordered to sacrifice his son, right? And then he stops him and he says, In the Hadal Lahul Bala'ul Mubin, that's verse 106. Verily, this is a bala, this is a trial, a tribulation. And then Imam Tabatabari, he says, you know, count ten ayat. From there, he gets a verse 115. That we saved Musa and his brother from a great disaster. So Imam Tabatabari, he's saying here that the son of Ibrahim, Ismail, um, is a typology of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, right? And that he's vipin azim, you know, he's a great sacrifice, azim. And he mentions suyuti, he quotes suyuti, and he says, suyuti says he's great because this uh, ram was brought by Jibreel, alayhi salam. And Imam Tabatabari agrees, he says, yes, that's true, but there's a different meaning here, there's a deeper meaning. There's a typological meaning. So in, in Tawil, in mystical exegesis, you have this term typology. A typology is something that happens in the past, but is really foreshadowing a future event. Something that happened in the future. Right? For example, Methadu Ahli Bayti Kemethadi Safinati Nur. The Prophet said, this is Sunni Hadith, sound Hadith. He says that the Ark of Noah is a typology. 
of the Ahlul Bayt, his family, at the end of time. Man raqiba So whoever embarks on it is saved. Wa man Whoever does not is destroyed. But it's not necessarily a flood of water that's going to encapsulate the world, but a flood of, you know, sin and, you know, bid'ah and, you know, these types of kufur, these types of nifaq, these types of things. So attach yourself to Ahlul Bayt at the end of time, drowned in the sin of, of kufur and nifaq. Right? So this is an example of a typology. So anyway, Imam Tabi Tabi says, on the 10th of Muharram, you know, you have Imam Hussein being martyred at Karbala. Right? Ten verses later. Right? He points to a very interesting type of. And then he's the Kaf Haya Ain Saad. And he says, Allahu Adam. But he um, conjectures. He says, Kaf is, is Karbala. Kadha Yazid, Kadha Ya, Kadha Ya Hilal, I think he says, Crescent Moon, Ain Atashuhu, his thirst, Saad, Sidquhu, his, his sincerity, right? Allahu Alam, they always say Allahu Alam, right? <coughs> Allahu Alam. And then, Wabayna Umar Rijalun Ala Al Araf. رِجَالٌ يَعْرِفُونَ كُلَّ بِسِمَاهُمْ So Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 46, we're told that between heaven and hell, as it were, there's a boundary, and it's called Al-A'raf. And on top of this boundary are men, يَعْرِفُونَ, who know everyone by their markings. So the sort of standard exegesis is that they're Ahlul Fatra, that they're people that um, are between two prophetic dispensations. So they weren't reached by a sound prophetic summons. So sort of in this um, purgatorial, if you will, state, but eventually they'll go to Jannah. And also Yuti says, these are people who have equal deeds, good and evil. So they have to wait till the very end of the judgment and then eventually they go to Jannah, with Allah's mercy. Everyone goes by Allah's mercy. The Shia, they have interesting interpretation. They say these are the Imams, the Imma, the 12 Imams. Because this Ya'rifuna al A'raf is related to Ma'rifa. And Sahara Tustari, a Muslim, a, a Sunni exeget, he also says these are people of Ma'rifa. So that's the more uh, subtle meaning of. of Rijalun al al-A'raf, the people that are on the heights. Jafar <clears throat> al he said, and he's an Imam of Ahl Sunnah. Did I mention this? He said every verse of the Quran has four levels of meaning. Did I mention it? What are they? <laughs> Um, he uses different terms, though. That could be, but he uses different different terms for it. At least terms that we gave in class. Maybe those are terms that we gave. So he said. So remember, E A S R, Ezer. That's how I remember. It's an acronym. Expressions, illusions, subtleties, and realities. So Al Fav, right? Expression for the laity, the Allah. Illusions, isharat, for the ulama. Lata'if, subtleties, for also ulama and also awliya. And al-anbiya, uh, al the prophets. And haqa'iq, realities that are known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an opinion of al-anbiya kilo, haqa'iq, from, from these levels of exegesis. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um... Let's see here. Mm. If you look at Surah uh, Tawbah 123, Ya amanu al kufar. Right? So this is re revealed in a wartime situation. Oh, you who believe, fight those who are around you from the unbelievers. Imam al-Alusi, 
we'll talk about his tafsir. Is an interesting ta'wil of this. So he doesn't reject the apparent meaning, but the way that he interprets this is qatilu nafs fi'innaha talil insan. says, you know, kill or slay the lower self, for it truly encompasses the, the human being. Right. <clears throat> so while well, Islam doesn't have a you know magisterium, so the Catholics believe that whatever comes out of the Vatican is infallible. Right. So that's their it's called the magisterium. It's a teaching authority. So we don't have that, but we do have a strong emphasis on ijma and the ikram, the honor of scholars. So one can make the argument there's no clergy in Islam, but um, it's not necessarily accurate that you know, the ulama are, are there, they're mentioned by the Prophet as being warathat al anbiya, which was important to have a strong connection to ulama. Okay. Another source of tafsir, which is generally deemed as unreliable, is called Israeliyat. Judaica, sometimes called, um, or you can call them, you know, sources of Ahlul Kitab. So, like the Bible, for example, Israelite tradition. So, the Bible, Old and New Testaments, the Talmud, right? So, these were used very little by the Sahaba, much more by the Tabi'in, uh, generally coming from Wahab ibn Munabbi and Ka'ab al Ahbar. Uh, and used even more by the Khalaf. Right? So Imam al-Tabari makes use of them as well. Imam al-Ghazali on occasion uh, will quote something from the Bible in one of his books. So Kitab al-Ilm, right, the book of knowledge, the first book of the Ihya, he will say, he's talking about benefits of knowledge, those who apply their knowledge, those who don't apply their knowledge. And then he says, just as the witness of Jesus, uh, whoever does what they say shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that's, you know, that's not based on a hadith that I know of, certainly nothing in the Quran, but that's, you know, Matthew chapter 5. He's quoting something, or he's paraphrasing something um, from the Bible. So we'll talk about it. You know, when to do that. But generally, the Ulama say it's permissible to quote something from uh, Israelite tradition uh, for the purposes of edification or advice, uh, but used with great caution. And they use the hadith, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa the relate the stories of the children of Israel. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it doing that. But Ibn Kathir, he divides the Israelite tradition into three groups. Israeliyat, Ibn Kathir, he divides into three groups. The first group, he says, those known to be true because, uh, at least in their meanings, their ma'ani, those known to be true in their meanings because the revelation of the Prophet confirms them. Right? So, um, you know, they read something like Deuteronomy 6.4, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the word for one in the Hebrew is echad. And it's exactly the same word as ahad. And this verse is actually quoted by Isa in Mark chapter 12, 29. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then also, you know, major components of the story of, of Yusuf alayhi salam, of Musa alayhi salam, of Nuh alayhi salam are identical with the uh, the telling of those stories in the Torah. So we can confirm those at least in their meanings. Right? The second class, he says, those known to be false because the revelation of the Prophet them rejects them. So if you read something in Israelite tradition where a certain prophet is committing a sin, a major sin, then certainly we should, we must reject that narrative even the Bible itself uh, at times will give a different version of the same story where these things are left off. There's two versions of the story of David and Solomon. 
what is told in First and Second Kings, where all of these horrendous things were attributed to David and Solomon. Really, like, I mean, that have type sins. And then another author uh, telling the same stories, the chronicler, First and Second Chronicles, a little bit later, doesn't mention any of those incidents where these prophets were committing sin. So it seems even within the biblical tradition, there's a difference of opinion about the nature of attributing sins to at least these two persons, David and Solomon. <clears throat> and then Ibn Kathir says the class of the Israelite tradition, those uh, not known to be true or false. So here, la wa la So don't affirm or deny Allahu A'lam. For example, we're told in the Quran that Isa could raise the dead. But we're not given details. Like who was it? When was it? Was this in Galilee? Was it in Jerusalem? When why did, when did this happen? No such details given in the Quran. No such details given in authentic hadith, as far as I know. We read in the New Testament, however, Jesus, peace be upon him, was in a place called Bethany outside of Jerusalem, and they took him to a uh, sepulcher, and it was a man named Lazarus, who was actually one of his friends, and he raised him from the dead. So Allah will whether these details are true or not. We cannot confirm or deny. It could be true, it doesn't negate the Quran. You know, it's not problematic from an Aqidah standpoint. Uh, but we can't affirm or deny. Or like, you know, we're told in hadith that Yahya alayhi salam was martyred, right? We don't know much details about that. We have this full narrative by Matthew, Mark, and Luke about how he criticized uh, the marriage of Herod Antipas, who was sort of the puppet king of Judea at the time, and that he was imprisoned, and eventually he was decapitated. His head was set on a plate uh, and then thrown to his disciples who were outside. Allahu alam. We don't know the details of that. Okay. <clears throat> now what's interesting is the early amount of the Quran, they give us some guidance as to how to deal with the is Israeliyat. Um, so this is mentioned by uh, Uthmani in his text. He uses the example of Surah so Al-Kaf, ayah number 22. 1822, right? So here we have a story that's found in Christian tradition, right? The sleepers of Ephesus, uh, sometimes called the seven sleepers of Ephesus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in meaning, some of the meanings may suggest in this ayah, they say there were three of them and the fourth was their dog. They say there were five of them, and the sixth were their dog. Conjecturing about the unseen. Conjecturing about the unseen. They say there were seven of them, and the eighth was their dog. Say, my Lord knows best their number. None knows them except a few, so do not argue about them. So the argument must say, this is, this is our method when dealing with the Israeliyat. So if we look at this, number one, we learn from this that describing these traditions is permissible. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes what they're saying. Right? He does that in the ayah. This is what they're saying at the Hitab. Some of them are saying there were three and the fourth were their dogs, then some five and the sixth were their right? He describes it. So it's permissible. And then those which have been proven false must be rejected, right? So the first two of what they're saying, Allah says, Rajman bil ghayb, they're conjecturing about the unseen. So it's definitely not those two. The fourth and the fifth was their dog. The fifth and the sixth was their dog. So the lesson here is, those proven to be false must be rejected. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. And number three, no judgment should be made on the version which is proven, which is not proven false. No judgment should be made on the version which is not proven false. Because then he says, and then some say there were seven, and the eighth one was their dog. This is the dominant opinion amongst Ahl al-Kitab. 
the seven sleepers of Ephesus. But Allah didn't say, well, this is the truth. He didn't say that, right? So we shouldn't make a judgment about it. We shouldn't be definitive on it, right? And then the fourth uh, step, insist on that the truth lies with Allah alone. Because right after that, Allah says, my Lord knows best their number. And then finally, no unnecessary debate on this issue. Right? So do not argue about that. Again, the ayah says, they say there were three and the fourth was their dog. They also say there were five of them and the sixth were their dog, conjecturing about the unseen. Others say there were seven of them and the eighth of them was their dog. Say, my Lord knows best their number. None knows them except a few, so do not argue about that. This is how we deal with Isra'a the Allah. This is the ayah that the Allah will use. <clears throat> okay. At this point, I wanted to get into some of the major Tefasir in our tradition, just give you the titles a little bit so you're familiar with them. Classical Quranic exegesis. The oldest uh, available is the Tafsir of Ibn Abbas. Mufassir al Quran, who died 68 Hijri, it's called the Tanwir al Miqdas. Um, however, the ulama, many ulama doubt its authenticity. Right? So, again, with Ibn Abbas, we have to be careful um, about what's attributed to him. Um, this tafsir contains a lot of fabricated hadith, and many of the ulama say a lot of the traditions in this hadith, in this tafsir, actually come from his student Mujahid. Wallahu alam. It's very ancient. Obviously, there's authenticated traditions that come from Ibn Abbas, and so we have to let the ulama guide us on this point. Uh, probably if you consider the magnum opus, the masterpiece of the early tafsir, is by Imam at Tabari. Imam at Tabari, and he died 922 um, of the common era, 922 Miladi. And his tafsir is called uh, Jami ul Bayan fi Tafsir al Quran. Jami ul Bayan, Imam Ibn Jarir at Tabari, also a great historian. <clears throat> Imam at Tabari, uh, his tafsir contains tafsir bil riwayah. Right? Tafsir of Quran with Quran, Tafsir of Quran with Sunnah, Tafsir of Quran with Sahaba, but also contains some Israeliyat as well, some Israelite tradition. There's a 1954 printing in 15 volumes uh, in Arabic. Probably one of the best of the later Tafsirs, about 400 years later, is an eight volume work by Ismail ibn Amr ibn Kathir al Dimashqi. So his tafsir is called Tafsir al Quran al Azim, or sometimes just called Tafsir ibn Kathir, or sometimes just ibn Kathir. Right? You say ibn Kathir says you know that you're talking about his tafsir. And this actually, uh, the last that I heard was translated into English. Right? That's what people are telling me now. Ibn Kathir has more of a discussion on the isnad of many reports. Um, he makes much use of uh, tafsir of the Qur'an with the Qur'an. Um, it's a summary of sorts of Imam al-Tabari. There's more emphasis on sound reports, right? almost a total rejection of Israelite tradition. Uh, there was a muhtasar, an abridgment, made of Ibn uh, Kathir by Imam al-Sabuni, a Syrian scholar, died in 1930. As far as I know, there's no English translation. It's called Safwat Tafasir, Safwat Tafasir, which uh, Imam al-Sabuni, he really is an eclectic Tafsir, eclectic, he brought different sources. Ibn Kathir, he brought Imam al-Tabari and Imam al-Zimakhshari, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. And then you have the tafsir bil ra'i, so the tafsir by qualified opinion is how the next six or so are qualified. Although certainly there's also bil riwaya that's in these, in these tafsir as well. So the first one is called al kashaf, al kashaf. Uh, and the author of this tafsir is Ibn Umar al Samakhshari, 
Azamakhshari, and he died 1144 of the Common Era, and he was actually a Muratazili, he was a rationalist. So theologically, he's problematic from our perspective, from the perspective of Ahlul Sunnah. Some even conclude that his tafsir is madhmum, it should be rejected because he deviates from the, the mainstream opinions when he comes to his aqidah. But this is more of a syntactical exegesis. There's a lot of emphasis on the language, linguistics of the Quran. So he's looking at grammars, at syntax, at balagha, rhetoric. Once in a while he'll throw some mu'tazili <laughs> aqidah into the mix, so one has to be careful when it comes to kashaf. The Urama say, don't start your tafsir studies with his book. But I would say that most people who study tafsir, they never even look at his book. Uh, so emphasis on linguistics, less on sanad. And then you have mafati al ghayb. So the keys of the unseen, um, also known as the tafsir al-kabir, by a great scholar of Ahl sunnah Fakhruddin, Ar-Razi, Imam Ar-Razi, was a Persian exegete who died 1209 uh, Miladi. Um, Imam Sayyid, he says in the Itqan, <laughs> There's everything in this book except tafsir. <laughs> so it's very philosophical um, exegesis. So he looks at the relationship. One of the things he does is he looks at the relationship between the suah. It's called al munasabat Like, why is this surah after this surah? Or even between the ayat, which is now like cutting edge, you know, Quran studies in Western Academy, right? You know, symmetrical structure and in, 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 internal coherence of the surahs. This is something that Imam al Razi was doing way back when, that now people like Raymond Farron and Michelle Kuyper's Carl Ernst is doing and becoming famous for doing. Uh, he also has a section on rudud, rudud, which are refutations. So refutation of you know heterodox uh, or you know incorrect theologies of the jahmiya, you know these different groups, the martazila, the rationalists, the mujassima, the anthropomorphists. The very long tafsir is al fatiha is 150 pages. It's tafsir of al fatiha. Al Fatiha, seven ayat, 150 pages. Um, the third one I wanted to mention is called Anwar Tanzil. Anwar Tanzil. Imam Baydawi. Baydawi. He died 1286 Miladi. This is important because it's really a recension of Al Kashaf. He basically corrected. Imam Zamakhshari's tafsir took out the um, the sort of Mu'tazila uh, material um, and added additional material to counterbalance al Kashaf. Uh, so you know this the Sunni Ahl Sunnah. One of my teachers said he said Imam Zamakhshari's Kashaf you know it just has this sort of there's a, there's a soft spot in our hearts for it. It's such an incredible work. We just don't want to throw it together completely. We want to take from the linguistical aspect of it and sort of downplay the problematic aspects of its, of its theology. Number four I'll mention is Ruh al-Ma'ani. Ruh al-Ma'ani. And this is by Imam al-Alusi. Alusi from Iraq. Imam al-Alusi. The more contemporary died 18... 54 Miladi. And here you have an emphasis on Sanad. He incorporates a lot of mystical exegesis, a deep discussion on grammar, rhetoric, Akida, astronomy, philosophy, mysticism, Ruh al Ma'ani. And then the fifth one I'll mention is called Tafsir al Jalalain. And this is then translated into English. It's a very short, it's kind of a handbook. Some have characterized it as a handbook of tafsir. You know, by 
and it's called Jalal Lane because the authors are two men named Jalal. Jalaluddin al-Mahadi, Jalaluddin al-Suyulti. So Tafsir of the two Jalals. Uh, and Suyuti died 1505, so it's 16th century uh, Miladi, Miladi. And it's been translated. You can also find this online. Uh, an online source that I recommend is called altafsir.com. And usually, you know, you have to be very, very careful about dot coms for reliable knowledge. But this is a good website. I've seen my teachers use it. I've asked my teachers about this website. And they said that it's reliable. Uh, so, you have the entire tafsir of Imam Suyuti in English on this website. Say it again. Al tafsir.com. All one word. <clears throat> so, you have Imam Suyuti. Um, and then there's a couple more in English. I think even Abbas, but again, you have to be careful with that. Also translated. Um, you have, and then in Arabic, you have all of these classical Arabic tafsir, all in Arabic. You know, so if you can access the primary Arabic sources, then I, um, I very much encourage you, recommend uh, tafsir.com. <coughs> and then number six I want to mention is called Al Jami al Ahkam al Quran, or sometimes called Tafsir al Qurtubi. Imam al Qurtubi, who was an Andalusian scholar, he died uh, 671 Hijri, so I don't have the Miladi date for that, but um, when would that be? Um, in 1400 or so. So his, uh, his tafsir is focused on fiqh, he's kind of mawduri, he's focusing on the ahkam of the Quran. Okay. Um, as far as contemporary tafsir, that's the last point we'll make for tonight. Uh, there's a beautiful tafsir in English called Ma'arif al Quran. Ma'arif al Quran. And I haven't seen it here, but I saw it in Salamon last year. Mufti Muhammad Shafi'i. And it's an eclectic tafsir. So, modern day tafsir, they tend to be eclectic, meaning they're taking from different classical sources. And then they're also giving some commentary as to how to make it relevant to our lives. Right? So that's what he does. He addresses some contemporary issues. His tafsir is really a combination of Bayan al Quran, Bayan al Quran, which is by a scholar named Mulana Ashraf Ali Thanawi, Bayan al Quran, and also Tafheem al Quran, Tafheem al Quran by Maududi which was written in Urdu. Uh, so you have Ma'arif, Ma'arif al-Qur'an. You have the study of Qur'an in English. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It came out maybe two years ago, the study of Qur'an. Um, I would use this with, with caution. You know, it's, it's really a monumental achievement. It took them 10 years uh, to finish the work. Um, it's basically a very eclectic <laughs> uh, compilation of tafasir from Sunni, and Sufi, and Shia, and Rationalism, or Tazili uh, traditions. But I would say, and you know, it's a study of Quran. So it, there's something called the Study Bible, which is studied by Christians in college, right? So I would not uh, recommend the Study Quran to lay Muslims or just like non-Muslims, someone converts to Islam, so you read the study of Quran. Uh, because a lot of people don't understand that many, many ayat can be interpreted in different ways, and there are differences of opinion between the ulama. So a lot of people don't, don't really process that very well. How can scholars have two different opinions about the same ayat? Uh, what does it mean? I mean? Nobody knows what it means then. Or they read something that just you know is from a, a Shia source, and they don't know it because they don't know how to interpret the sources. So they'll go with that, and it'll be problematic um, to their aqid, or potentially problematic. And then also, the editors of the study of Quran are perennialists. Um, 
which is a modern philosophy that believes that that basically all religions are correct, right? And that the Quran doesn't necessarily um, criticize Trinitarian Christianity. You know, so they have very strange ways of interpreting Walatakulu Thalatha. So it's not talking about the Trinity, it's talking about people who worship three gods, right? Or, you know, Laqad Kafara Ladina Qalu in Allah or Masih Ibn Maryam. It is a statement of those who have blasphemed who say that God is the Messiah. And then one of their editors will say, you know, the Christians aren't saying that. They're not saying God is the Messiah. They're saying the Messiah is God. You know, so what? What are you talking about? <laughs> is that what you really think it's talking about? You know, so it's it's a very strange, so it's you know problematic at times. I would be careful. It's a perennialist hermeneutic. Some have gone so far as to call it you know, kind of a Trojan horse, you know, something that you kind of bring in to your community and then it sort of slowly attacks you. Uh, but like I said, uh, it's meant for you know college level students. That's why it's called the study of Quran. So you know, my I teach that text at Zaytuna because the students that I'm teaching are college students, and you know they, they have background knowledge and they. And they're firm in their aqidah, and we go through the different sources that are quoted in the study of Quran. And we talk about the differences, so they know how to navigate the study of Quran. But if one doesn't know how to navigate, it's it's dangerous. It's like going into books of hadith, pouring into Sahih Bukhari, uh, just because you're Muslim and you can read a little bit of Arabic, you're going to make major errors in interpreting hadith because you don't know how to navigate. Even though if we think we do, we really don't. <clears throat> so that's that's all I wanted to say, inshallah, for tonight. Oh, so we're, oh. oh. <laughs> so why is it so late? We started late. <laughs> it's almost eight thirty. So next week, inshallah, is our next our final class, and we'll talk about some other miscellaneous type of things like translation of the Quran. What's the best way to translate the Quran? If you can translate um, a history of Quranic translation. History of non-Muslim interaction with the Qur'an, a little bit of that. We'll look at Ijaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, Qur'an and modern science. We'll look at the tahaddi, the challenge of the Qur'an, to produce a surah like it. Very important to understand the nature of the tahaddi. Today I wanted to finish by talking about a translation and uh, the Qur'an, the miracles of the Qur'an a little bit, and then the tahaddi, the challenge of the Qur'an. And it'll probably be a good amount of time for a Q&A. So the translation in Arabic is called tarjama, tarjama. And translations are inadequate, but they're necessary. Um, as I said last week, one of my teachers taught me to say, whenever you quote the Quran in a language other than the original Arabic, you would say some of the meanings may suggest. Because Quran and Arabiya, Quran is in Arabic. And there is a big difference between uh, words chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically means that he shaped nothing like Allah. So whatever we're like, Allah is not like that. Right? Basically, He's completely dissimilar to his creation. So Allah doesn't speak any language, but he chose a language. He chose words from this language to convey pre-eternal meanings of the Quran. So it's very important for us uh, to study this language. Learn different computer languages for dunya. We should learn some Arabic for dunya and akhirah. Some people stop there. The Quran says, right? So we should continue. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana wa qina adal Quran. I mean, so <clears throat> to learn some Arabic, there's an old uh, Italian. 
axiom. It's trans. It's alliterated in Italian, but it's also alliterated in English, so it still works. The, the translator is a traitor. So translate and traitor sound the same. The translator is a traitor. Italian sounds like this. Traditore, traditore. Very similar. So, in other words, all tarjama is tafsir. <coughs> Whenever you translate anything, you are interpreting it because you are choosing the words. Right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chose the Arabic of the Quran. So, we should learn some, some Arabic, inshallah. Um, translations occurred in the time of the Prophet. We have translations of the Quran, Ibn Hisham mentions in his Sirah, Sirah al Nabawiyah, which is the better of the two compared to Ibn Ishaq, even though Ibn Ishaq was slightly before, that when the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba made Hijrah to Al Habasha, to Ethiopia, and uh, uh, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the older brother of Sayyidina Ali, he was the spokesperson for the Muhajirin. He uh, recited some Quran in Arabic, and then it was translated into ancient Ethiopic. Right? So the court of the Najashi, they heard in Arabic. Ethiopic and Arabic are similar, they're Semitic languages. It's maybe the difference between English and Spanish. So you'd be able to catch a few words here and there. It's something of the interpretation or translation. But it was translated into Ethiopic. Uh, the first translation of the Quran into a European language was done uh, from Arabic into Latin by Robert of Chester. His name was Robert of Chester. This was 1143 CE. This was under the patronage of a, a monk named Peter the Venerable, who was the abbot of Cluny, not George Cluny, the Benedictine abbot of Cluny. And Peter the Venerable. And this was during the time of the Crusades. So Peter the Venerable, he actually wrote a couple of polemical treatises against Islam. Um, one was, was called uh, The Summary of the Entire Heresy of the Saracens. Right? Now, Robert of Chester, when he translated the Quran in 1143, he didn't call it the Quran. He called it Lex Muhammad Sutu Prophetes which says uh, the, the law of Muhammad, the false prophet, that's the title he gave his translation of the Quran. So you see how the translator is a traitor. <laughs> he didn't even call it the Quran. So you find this with Western Orientalists, what's known as a hermeneutic of suspicion. A hermeneutic of suspicion. So whenever the Prophet does something uh, in the Sirah, he must have some ulterior motive for doing it, you know. So he marries Aisha, right? He says, oh, he was licentious. Or, you know, the, the Quran at times sounds like the Bible. Oh, he's a forger, that's why, you know. Uh, he's a pretender. So they always ascribe to him the baser motive. But when Isa does something in the New Testament, he's fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, he's pure and innocent. He's, you know, genuine. So when Isa a.s. in the New Testament rides a donkey into Jerusalem, you know, he's fulfilling prophecy, right? According to these Orientalists. Of course, <laughs> Jewish uh, theologians would say that, no, Jesus is also uh, a forger and he's, you know, self-fulfilling these prophecies, and right? Uh, so what it comes down to is the integrity of the prophet. That's what it comes down to. Who do you want to take your information from? The Quran says, O you who believe, when a fasiq, an open sinner, uh, brings you some sort of news, fatabayyanu. Fatabayyanu means uh, it's reflexive, right? It's reflexive, meaning something to the effect of prove it to yourself. Don't take a fasiq's word for it, prove it to yourself. So you might find something modern science is saying, something that NASA says, for example. You say, well, you know, that doesn't seem to square with what the Quran is saying. For instance, well, the 
Quran is the, the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ultimately, the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So we give precedence to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the integrity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We'll talk more about this later, inshallah. <coughs> but with the Western Orientalists, uh, Orientalists, they're, they're guilty of a double standard, unbalanced methodology. That whatever Muslims do, uh, you know, there's a hermeneutic of suspicion. They're doing it for some other motive. But when Christ and Mary do something, it's called a hermeneutic of acceptance. Right? Now, the first translation into English, the first translation of the Quran into English, was done from French, not directly from Arabic. So, Arabic, French, and English. It was by a man named Alexander Ross. 1649, he was a Scottish Orientalist, who wrote at the introduction, newly Englished for the satisfaction of all that desire to look into Turkish vanities. I can say that with a British accent. Newly Englished for all that desire. Actually, he was Scottish. I don't know how to do a Scottish accent. Uh, the first translation into English from original Arabic Original Arabic into English, 1734, George Sale, S-A-L-E, George Sale, also known as the Jeffersonian Quran. Right? So there's a Quran in the Library of Congress that belonged to none other than Thomas Jefferson, the third president. And apparently has some of his notes. Apparently he was learning Arabic. He was not a Trinitarian. Unitarian. Many of the founding fathers rejected the Trinity. Uh, they did not um, agree with uh, a, uh, a mixing of church and state. So that was sort of the vision of America early on, was to avoid what was happening in Europe, especially England at the time. That's why they were basically rebels from an English standpoint. British standpoint, they're guilty of treason, right? Uh, so they were, uh, they were, they were, you know, settlers that left uh, Europe. So America was designed initially to be sort of the antithesis of what was happening in Europe. So a secular society, not a secularist society. There's a difference between the two. Dr. Sherman Jackson will point out difference between a secularist society where religion is completely banished from any type of public discourse. And it's something you do in your house and that's where it stops and stays. To a secular society where uh, one's faith can inform their decision and it's based on what people want to do. So if you want to present, for example, the argument that abortion should be illegal uh, because um, it's against Catholic morality. You could certainly present that argument, like in Congress. It probably won't be successful if that's your reason. Maybe it could be. Uh, most people in Congress apparently believe in God, right? But most likely that won't carry the day. You'd have to give some sort of social repercussion to the ills of abortion. Right? So there is room for religious discourse. So that was the vision of the founding father. So they were deists. A deist, D-E-I-S-T, is someone who believes in God, but does not believe that this God necessarily interacts with creation. So a creator God, you know, a wholly transcendent God, He's, he's too he's he's too high for any type of involvement in human affairs. Right? So they take this idea of you know, caliphate to an extreme level. Right? You are charged with the responsibility of creating justice on earth um, uh, without any type of grace from above. 
So anyway, Representative Keith Ellison was the only Muslim in Congress. He took oath uh, by putting his hand on the Jeffersonian Quran, the actual Quran of Thomas Jefferson, translated by George Sale in 1734. There are major errors in this translation. It's probably because he just didn't know Arabic that well. I mean, that's personal fun, right? There might be something else happening, but in chapter 22, Surah, Surah Al-Hajj, verse 39, this is the first verse revealed uh, to the Prophet wasallam that gives him permission to militarily defend the Muslim Ummah. Right? And if you read that ayah in Arabic, all of the verbs are passive voice, passive, passive, mabni ala majhul. So permission is given to those who are being fought against because they have been wronged. Everything's passive. Permission is given, not he gave permission. To those who are being fought against, not permission is given to those to go fight and to go wrong people because they have been wrong. But Sale doesn't notice the, the passive verbs here. He makes them active. So he says something like, permission is given uh, to those uh, to fight against the other, or take up arms against unbelievers, or something like that. So making the verb very offensive, rather than passive. <clears throat> so in translation theory, there's different ways of translating the Quran. Um, John Dryden, was an English poet, uh, translation theorist. He says there's, th there's three ways of translating. He says the first way is called paraphrase. He called it paraphrase. Uh, modern translation theorists like Eugene, Nida, and others, they'll refer to this as dynamic equivalence or a sense for sense translation. You know, this is the gist of what it's saying. Right? Sense for sense. This is the meaning. This is what the author means. Uh, another way of translating is called metaphrase, metaphrase, um, which is also called formal equivalence. And this is more like word for word translation. So a Yusuf Adi translation into English is more a paraphrase, sense for sense. Uh, where Marmaduke Pichtal is more metaphrase, word for word. And the Urgham not really tend to gravitate more towards metaphrase, towards a more word-for-word -word translation, but with a commentary. Right. So there's pros and cons to both approaches. You know, the sort of downfall of a word-for-word -word translation is that you don't really get the intended meaning. You're just getting exact wording. But what does that actually mean? Right. Uh, and then the downfall of a paraphrase is you don't get any of the linguistic juice. You just you get the meaning, but you don't get that linguistic element. Why this word in relation to this word, or the syntax, the word order, that's all missed, right? And then you have something called imitation. Imitation is, or adaption. What would the author have said if you were alive today? <clears throat> so you'll have some idiomatic expressions in the Quran in the Bible, you know, a camel through the eye of a needle, for example. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter paradise. That's in Matthew. And in the Quran, the camel through the eye of a needle. Mentioned in the Quran. So it's So what does that mean? A camel through the eye of a needle? You can translate that literally. And it, that's what it says. Al Jamal fi samikhayat, the eye of a needle. So that's great. So that's your metaphrase. When you paraphrase, you know, sort of get the, sen the sense of that, that um, it's really, really hard, <laughs> almost impossible for a rich man to go to heaven. That's the paraphrase. And then there's imitation. So use an analogy. That people know that you that people use today. So something like uh, it is easier to find a needle in a haystack than for 
for rich man to enter paradise. <laughs> you, get, you get what I'm saying now. Right? So it's possible to find the illuminated stack, but very, very difficult. Right. Okay. Any questions on uh, translation, translation theory? Probably the first language. Yes? How is the best translation in English? Best translation in English? Yeah. Um, is it? Uh, Abdul Hanim. Mm -hmm. You know Abdul Hanim's translation? I think excellent translation. That's his name, right? Abdul Hanim. Yeah, this is a very good translation. Um, Thomas Cleary is a good translation. I actually like, like Yusuf Ali, to be honest with you, because he uses classical English. And it's not very user friendly for people who don't uh, know English very well, because he uses all these knees and vowels and nine. What does that mean? Right? But the Quran is Fusha, it's the height of Arabic. So I think if you want to translate something, that is so incredibly high Arabic, you have to use high English. So even quoting the Prophet some of the du'at, you know, the people making da'wah, they quote the hadith, they quote the hadith in colloquial English, they translate the hadith into colloquial English for the sake of the Shabbat, the youth. Every time that they do that, I sort of, I sort of cringe, you know, because that's you know, one of the, uh, and they're using bad grammar, that's how the youth speak. Well, instead of you know bringing the language down to the youth, we should pick, try to pick them up, take them to a higher level. Because even if hadith is sound in its sanad, it's absolutely sound in its sanad. But there's a grammatical error in the hadith, it's a da'if. Because the Prophet used incredibly eloquent Arabic. And he didn't make grammatical errors when he spoke. <laughs> Um, language is a dynamic uh, uh, entity, it changes in meaning over time. Yeah. So, over the years, Arabic probably have the same sort of thing. Oh, yeah. So, uh, does that mean people are understanding Quran differently now? Yes, very, very good question. <laughs> yes. Uh, any language that's alive, right? You have dead languages and you have alive languages. The language of Isa alayhi salam is dead. It's Syriac, no one speaks it. There are many dead languages, Ugaritic, Ethiopic, as well, it's still alive. Most Semitic languages are dead. Arabic is flourishing. So the nature of a living language, is, or an alive language, is that it will take on other words called loan words, they incorporate those words. Not only that, words within the language will have new meaning. So it depends on which Arab country you go to. You might find a word that in classical Arabic means one thing, but in the, uh, the colloquial dialect, the lahja, of that Arabic country means complete, something completely different. Right? So the important thing is when we study Arabic, we study Fusha Arabic. We study how these words were, uh, what, what was it, what was it? intended by these words at the time of the Prophet right? So we have to study something of the history of the language. Right? Um, so oftentimes you'll have Arabs read the Quran and make major errors in translation. Just because you know Arabic does not mean you can translate the Quran any more than a college student who's a pretty smart guy give them a Shakespearean sonnet and say, translate this. And he'll say, you know what, this is English, but I have no idea what it's saying. All I know is that it's English. I'll get a word here and there, right? But, you know, classical Arabic, some would say, is a different language than, you know, daddy jab, like colloquial Arabic. It's a different language. And you get that with other languages, other pre-modern or ancient languages that are now spoken in a more uh, colloquial sense, like Greek, for example, 
the Greek of the New Testament, is called Koine Greek, common Greek, very simple Greek, whereas the Greek of Plato, oh my God, and I have experience with this, after two years of common Greek, and I thought I was pretty good at it, and then I took a class in advanced Greek, like Attic Greek, and we read the uh, Republic, and I was completely, I thought it was a different language, a different level. <clears throat> Which is interesting also, I mean, I mean Christians believe the New Testament is the Word of God, but um, the eloquence of the New Testament is not on par with Plato or Homer, right? So Nietzsche, you guys know Nietzsche, he used to quip, he was an atheist, he used to make a joke, he would, he would say, it's so nice of God to give us such a remedial form of Greek write his holy book. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's true though. Um, that Arabic today has you know I'm thinking another example of the Torah. It says the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. That's in Genesis. And the word there for hovered at the time of the composition of that verse just meant to hover. But now that same word in modern Hebrew means a hoverboard. The Spirit of God was a hoverboard. So if someone who's reading that verse of Genesis in, uh, in modern uh, Israeli, for example, would read that and say There's a, there was a hoverboard at the time. Does that word, the meaning of the change, the same word, the meaning has changed. Okay. Uh, the next section here, a short section, the Ajaz of the Quran, the uh, miracles of the Quran. <clears throat> there is a linguistic aspect to this, a linguistic miracle, we'll talk about that. Some have said there's a numerical miracle of the Quran. Numerical and miracle. We shouldn't get too much into numerology. It's called gematria, right? Ardmul I think it's called in Arabic. Ardmul uh, This is something that Imam Basali warns people against getting too deep into numbers, right? Um, there is a sort of metaphysical component to numbers, you know? So, you know, there's, there's things about the number three, you know, the number nine, the number, the number 11, the number 13, the number 33. There's some sort of metaphysical properties, if you will, to those numbers that people who are numerologists who are practitioners of gematria, they know well. Um, so a lot of the things that we do in those numbers is to protect ourselves against the sort of evil counterpart. So we do things at 11, right? Uh, 33 times after every prayer. Uh, for protection, protective purposes. Um, <coughs> but there, Shabir, Dr. Shabir Ali in Toronto, he mentions that <coughs> there are uh, interesting things in the Quran with respect to numbers. The word for man and woman is, is mentioned the same amount of times in the Quran. The word day is mentioned 365 times. Yom is mentioned 365 times. Which is a little strange because that's the solar calendar. <laughs> the lunar is 354, 355. But, you know, interesting. We don't insist on any of these. Oh, that's, you know, you know that's how it is. And, <clears throat> you know, it's definitive. The word month is mentioned 12 times. Shahab is mentioned 12 times. Angel and demon, like Malak or Malaika, Shaitan, Shayatin, they're mentioned the same number of times. Land and sea, according to him, are mentioned the same ratio of land and sea on earth. So like 73 to 27 or something, whatever. There's something about the number 19. You know, figures prominently in the Quran. And this is again, you know, getting into numbers can be dangerous. There was an Egyptian scientist named Roshad Khalifa. I don't know if you've heard of him. Founded a sort of cult, a pseudo Islamic cult called the Submitters, 
I believe that he's Rasulullah, that's what he claimed to be. He claimed to be the final messenger of God. Uh, he was apparently killed in 1990. A very mysterious uh, person. Allahu Alam, but uh, apparently he said that the Quran has this numerical code uh, about the number 19. Um, his appendix, he translated the Quran into English, and his appendices are very strange. It's like you're reading the manifesto of the Unabomber or something. All these equations everywhere. It's, you know, equals 19. Oh, 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 oh. 19, five pages of equations equals 19. A lot more item. I don't, I don't know if he's fudging the numbers or what, but it's interesting. He used to go on tour with Ahmed Didat, actually. They would have a sort of tag team. And in early editions of Ahmed Didat's book, The Quran is a Miracle, he had a dedication page where he thanked Dr. Rashad Khalifa. And then on one of his, on one of the, uh, one of the events, man Khalifa stands up and says, I have an announcement. I'm Rasulullah. <coughs> so, sorry. So, uh, they stopped going on tour. <coughs> you know, you know this in 19 letters. Upon him are 19, different things like that. Yeah, but also, but you know, if you look, if you look, Long enough into something, you'll, you'll find what you're looking for. So, there are a lot of Christians who have this claim about the Bible that there's Bible codes and things like that. You know, if you line up the letters of the Bible, it'll spell like uh, Pearl Harbor or something. So, somebody actually, an atheist actually did this with the, the book Moby Dick um, by Melville, lined up like a crossword puzzle. He was able to find like George Bush, September 11th. Yeah, he was able to. He said he can do this with anyone. If you look hard enough, <laughs> you'll be amazed what you find. You know these crossword puzzles they give in the restaurants to kids? I almost always find my first name in every single one. I mean, it's only three letters long, but these are very small. I was like, Adi, right here. And I told my daughter, look, Adi, she was, oh. You know, so. Uh, so Allah you know. Um, there was there a question? I thought I, I thought I saw a hand up. Yeah. When you said that they did the same thing with Bible, but which Bible? I mean, as King James or you know, the different versions. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they're looking at the Greek. Yeah. So these these are more advanced scholars. I mean, obviously it's done with English translation as well, and you'll find it either one, because <laughs> if you're looking at it, 400 page text, you eventually will find something. <laughs> uh, some Muslims, they go into sort of scientific miracles of the Quran, like hard sciences, natural sciences, sort of in response to new atheism. So you have books by Maurice Bukai, Maurice Bukai, which is spelled B U C A I L L E, he's a Frenchman. I think he's French Moroccan, he was a physician. Converted to Islam, um, or did he? Did he convert? I think he converted. So he wrote a book called "The Quran, the Bible, and Modern Science." An interesting book, you know, very interesting book. Um, uh, and you have Harun Yahya writing, whoever he is, Dr. Jeffrey Lang. I think the, the danger here is that, again, we shouldn't insist on something because science tends to be fickle and change its mind every so often. So if we take a definitive stance and the Quran advocates, you know, globular heliocentric cosmology, that the Earth is a globe, it spins on its axis at you know, 23.4 degrees, it's going a thousand miles an hour, even though you can't feel it. And then it's flying around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, even though you don't feel it. And then the sun is flying around the Milky Way at 500,000 miles an hour. All right. So, well, that's what the Quran is saying. You know, Big Bang cosmology. 
which is I in the Quran, that you know, the Big Bang cosmology, also called the Friedman, the, 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 uh, what is it called? The, the Hawking Hartle um, uh, Lavantre model, standard model, that if you extrapolate the universe backwards, it comes down to a point of singularity, a primeval atom, which exploded for no apparent reason. That this explosion caused the cosmos. So, one of the only times in history where an explosion created something that was ordered. You know, imagine blowing up a refrigerator and then having the parts eventually form a working cell phone or something. Very strange. Um, but that's the sort of standard scientific opinion now. So the early mass, some of them point to verse 21, uh, chapter 21, verse 30. Awalam yara ladina kafaru, do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda kanat ratqa kafataqna huma. Don't they see the heavens and the earth, which is a euphemism for the cosmos. That universe was a single unit of matter. A single unit of matter. Ratqa means like something stitched up. About to explode. And then we clove it asunder. We did that. Right? Some will say this is talking about Big Bang cosmology. According to this cosmology, um, the universe is expanding into infinite, into the infinite darkness, as it were. And it's actually accelerating. It's speed, it's not slowing down, which is sort of counterintuitive because the second law of thermodynamics says that eventually things will go through entropy and slow down, right? But it's expanding, increasing. Science can't explain that. So science, you know, modern science has sort of these catch-all terms when they don't understand something. They'll say, for example, oh, that's just gravity. They say, what's gravity? Here's an equation that nobody understands, except one guy sitting at his desk and scribbling on a piece of paper. Well, they said, how is the universe increasing in its expansion? How is, this, how is the speed increasing? Well, there's supposed to be entropy. And so something is forcing it out. What? Dark energy. This is what they call it. Dark energy. So what is dark energy? We don't know. There's something actively forcing it out. Right? Some of the Urnama point to this verse. At that yet, Surah 51, verse 47. But it says something to the effect that some of the meanings may suggest that uh, we created the heavens, the Aiden, with hands, literally hands. What does that mean, do you think? We created the Sama, the Aiden. The Aiden. What does that mean? What, what do your hands do? You know, somebody like, um, um, what's the expression in English? Somebody says, I'm all thumbs. What does that mean? You ever heard that before? Can't do anything right. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't have skill. I'm all thumbs. I can't even tie this shoe. So we ate it like, with, with skill. We created the heavens with skill. What in the Musirun? And we are expanders. We are the expanders. You know, wasir means expansion. Wasir kursil somewhat. What else? Right? We are expanding it. Not dark energy. Or like, you know, Jupiter is going around the sun. It's called the heliocentric model. The helios, the sun is in the center. 
But according to their calculations, uh, he, Jupiter is just not big enough, even though it's apparently huge, it's still not big enough to sustain it in its orbit. It would just fly off eventually. Or it should, it should have already flown off. So what's keeping it in its orbit? There's something else keeping it there. So the science, scientific community says dark matter. So these are catch-all terms. You know. um, so the more popular opinion in the pre-modern world is called, uh, is referred to as uh, the geocentric model. Geocentrism is that the Earth is stationary and that the heavenly bodies are revolving around the Earth. Now, nowadays, if you even suggest something like that, you'll be crucified, <laughs> basically. Um, not only that, um, there's a growing movement nowadays. And this is not just amongst Christians. This is in the scientific community uh, that the Earth is actually a plane. It's a flat plane. It's not globular. And it's stationary. It's a very popular movement now. You know. And there are some who, I mean, there was a, there was a Saudi Arabian scholar who I think made a critical error. It was definitive on this point and said the Earth is definitely flat. And they asked him, why is that? No, he said the Earth is, yeah, he said the Earth is not moving. He said it was flat. And he said it's also not moving. And so, and he said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, according to their model, if the Earth is round and it's spinning, right? Uh, if you're flying from west to east and it takes you four hours to get there, on the way back, since the Earth is coming at you at a thousand miles an hour, you should get there in half the time, in a third of the time not realizing that those who take the position that the Earth is rotating believe that the atmosphere is rotating with the Earth. Right? So it's going to take you the same amount of time to get back because the atmosphere is being dragged along with the terra firma or the <coughs> crust of the Earth as well. But there are some who dispute this and say that, that uh, there's no evidence of the Earth's curvature very popular. For example, people will, you know how you look out to the horizon, go to a beach or something, and you look out and you'll see the ocean, it'll rise up to your eye level, and then it just stops in their sky. So the scientific community says that you're actually, your, your line of sight has ended because there's curvature in the earth. This is what Aristotle saw. Aristotle believed in geocentrism. He believed that the Earth was at the center. The sun and the moon go around the Earth. The Earth is round, however, according to him. Uh, and he said, well, ships go out, and then they vanish from your line of sight because they're going over the curvature of the Earth. Now, nowadays there are people who buy these, you know, this, this Nikon P900 camera very powerful zoom lens, and they'll notice the ship go, and then they'll zoom in, and the entire ship is brought back. Right? Or you can calculate, according to the scientific community, what the uh, curvature of the Earth has to be per square mile, eight inches per mile squared. So there was a man who took a picture of the Chicago skyline from the other end of Lake Mich Michigan, 60 miles away. According to the scientific community, um, you shouldn't be able to see any of the skyline from 60 miles away across the ocean. Maybe the top of the Sears Tower, maybe, because the entire city should be behind you know, 2,200 feet of curvature. It should have curved away from you long ago. 
He snapped a picture in clear weather. The entire Chicago skyline is visible from the ground up. There's many people that have different examples of this, that they cannot detect the curvature of the Earth. Right? So they have a different model that they use. How about the photograph that you see from space? Yeah, so people don't like these photographs. Every photograph we get is from NASA. And NASA admits they're all composite images. This is something they admit. That um, basically they're different photographs stitched together. You know, everything that we see um, is either a composite image or CGI or a cartoon. Um, so, yeah, certainly, I mean, the, and then the other thing is, like, NASA will release a picture of the Earth every so often that looks completely different. I mean, one of them in the United States is enormous, another one is really small. You'll see, like, they have this sort of animation that they say is real, of the Earth spinning, but the clouds don't move over, like, a 10-hour period. And I say, oh, you know, this is just, it's animated. It's not an actual picture. So there's a lot of distrust of NASA, apparently, amongst this movement, that you haven't really seen the curvature with your own eyes. So their argument is that your senses and experience suggest that the Earth is motionless. That's what your senses suggest to you. Um, and when you go out to the beach and you see the this flat horizon, right? You can see twice as, as far this way and that way as you can this way. Twice as far, but it's always flat. You don't see curvature. And then they say they, you know, independent researchers have sent up weather balloons, 121,000 feet, three times the height, three times the altitude of the, of the 747, and the horizon is completely flat. There's no evidence of curvature, according to their according to the evidence that independent researchers have compiled. And then some, some, of the <clears throat> some of the proponents of this movement, most of them are Christian, but again, not all of them. They'll say that this is what the Bible is saying and what the Quran is saying. They'll actually quote verses from the Quran. Um, right? The one who made for you the earth as a carpet. Or bisa on bust, bust means something that is wide and expansive, flat, wide. Right. So, again, uh, insisting on absurd position is dangerous. Allah will act. Allah will act. I don't know. Right. It's also interesting is that the moon is a very interesting. So, and that you can actually do this if you want to. Uh, what we're being told is that the light coming from the moon is reflected sunlight, right? That's what it is, man. Now, if you're in direct sunlight or in the shade, which one do you think has a higher temperature? Which one? Direct sunlight, right? Yeah, direct sunlight. You're standing in the sun. Now let's say there's a full moon. Where do you think the temperature is higher? In direct moonlight or in the shade? In the shade, it's the opposite. So if the sunlight is bouncing off the moon, that's colder than the moon shade. Is it the same light? So there's another theory, and this is something that uh, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Again, the geocentric model over history was a dominant opinion. It's just since the time of Copernicus and uh, Galileo, I mean, these guys are, you know, anyway, uh, Kepler, Isaac Newton, right? So it doesn't seem like the, it seems like the, the, the moon is emitting its own light. And there are times when you ever see the full moon during the day, you can see right through the moon. The craters of the moon are blue because the sky behind is blue. 
There are people who photograph stars through the moon. You can see a star through the moon. This is a document. People, have, people take out their independent researchers nowadays. They take out their Nikon B900. They can zoom in on the moon and see stars through the moon. So the moon seems to be sort of semi-translucent. It's transparent. It's a light. The Quran calls it nur. It's a light, and the sun is a, is a siraj in the Quran. A nur, like think of a night light in a lamp. A night light has its own light, but it, it doesn't light up the entire room. But a lamp, you turn it on, and everything's lit. So it's very strange what's happening here. Wait, I have a quick question. Yeah. With the whole, like, the world is round or whatever. Yeah. With all this stuff we're giving, why do we ever believe it's round in the first place? Why do we believe it's yeah, round? Yeah, like, we're, now, where's the proof that it is round? Cause That's a good question. <laughs> there are some who say there's no proof. All they have are these pictures which are doctored. But all the astronauts who have gone up uh, up the space station and all that, they say it's, it's round. I mean, yeah, that's what, that's what they say. We haven't seen a picture. I mean, they have these um, images of astronauts working on a space station with the Earth in the background. But you look at the Earth, there's no satellites, which is supposed to be 20,000 satellites. You don't see a single one. You don't see any planes anywhere. And every so often, one of their videos, <laughs> you'll see, like, bubbles come up, which means they're in a pool in front of a green screen, and you can find these videos, you know. Um, so, I mean, how, how does water convex itself? So if the earth is round, water is bending itself. Can I do that? Can I conduct that experiment? I can certainly pour water into a container, and the water will take the shape of the container, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about pouring water out and then making it into a convex uh, sculpture without it, because water always finds a level. But it's the gravity which is keeping it. That's the, that's the whole answer. <clears throat> it's a big catch all, it's gravity. It's gravity. So, how is that? Don't worry about it, it's gravity. So, people are in Australia walking around upside down. Trillions of tons of water are sticking to the earth upside down because of gravity. But a bird flying over the ocean. So gravity is so strong that it holds all this water, but just weak enough for a bird to fly over the ocean. Or a fish to fly through, to swim through that water. Right? So it's very strange. Fickle thing gravity is. It's very fickle. Right? I sit on the earth. I have a big magnet in my hand, and the paper clips on the earth. Certainly the magnetic force of the earth is more than this magnet in my hand, but everything will fly up to my hand. Why doesn't it stick to the earth? It's a bigger magnet. So that's sort of the catch-all. It's all gravity. You know, Sir Isaac Newton sitting, Sir Isaac Newton, right? A knighted Freemason occultist. Sitting around him, an apple falls on him. Oh, there's gravity. What an epiphany. No, it's it's, mutual, it's, it's, relative, it's called relative density. You know, so this foam will drop because the molecules are denser than the air. But if you're a helium balloon, it'll rise. Define gravity. Okay. No, it's just <laughs> helium, helium is, is not as dense as the oxygen. That's the that's Occam's razor. That's the easy answer, not the sort of mysterious gravity. That's that's convexing water. So initially, this sounds like a totally ridiculous notion, right? But those who uh, make this argument again are saying that there's scientific backing for it, and that the vast majority of the opinions of human beings throughout history is that the Earth is geocentric. So if you look at if you look at Polaris, the North Star, it's always fixed, right? And all the other stars are going around it. So all of our constellations have been there for thousands of years. Same stars. The 
perfect circle around us. So if we're moving in 1,000 miles an hour, we're also going 67,000 miles an hour, and then that is going 500,000 miles an hour into infinite space, how is this so perfect? Shouldn't it be chaos above us? It seems like everything is going around us. That's the, that's the point we're making. Everything. The sun and the moon, all of the stars. It seems to be a geocentric model. And if this is true, then immediately people say, there's something special about us. Someone designed this. Because modern scientific opinions is that we're just some backwater planet on some solar system and some corner of a Milky Way galaxy, and just an accident that exploded, and we're from monkeys anyway, so we're not important, so it's not, there's not there's no God. You know. You know, so, you know, the whole thing about gravity, again, is if you can replicate that, you can get a big mass, or you can stick water to the bottom of something, otherwise it's a faith. You believe in gravity. I believe in God. <laughs> Replicate the experiment. So, so if you don't believe the science, or the science is saying about, and then if you don't, then there has to be some way of ascertaining whether it's right or not. And the Quran says that the sun and the moon and the reflected light. And uh -huh. So that kind of tells us, right? I mean, that that's the one way to. Yeah, <coughs> but we shouldn't be definitive. Because if we're definitive on things, and I think it's a great wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us definitive answers. You know, because the scientific community keeps changing their mind. Right? So even if we believe the Quran is correct, even if says the Quran says it's flat, definitely flat, and then you know, for two thousand years people are ridiculing the Muslims and saying, You guys are barbarians, you're crazy, it's not flat, and then two thousand years later they say, Oh yeah, it's flat. Most for for sun, for many, many years, it was not known that sun moves, right? And in yeah. the Quran, Allah says, sun moves. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't know. You know. It well, who are the khalaq al wa wa al-qamar? Kulun fi falaki yasbahun. Yeah. Kulun fi falaki yasbahun. The sun and the moon are moving. All of them are in an orbit. Falaki yasbahun. Also, nothing about the moon is... You never see the dark side of the moon. You never see the back side of the moon. So if it's orbiting, why don't we ever see the back side of it? All it does is go like this. It just rotates like that. It never turns. <laughs> There's no back side. It's a light. It's translucent. You can't land on something like that. But then you don't believe they landed on the moon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, how do you get through the Van Allen radiation belts? <clears throat> Even right now, if you talk to modern scientists, they say, what's the biggest challenge with space travel? So we haven't, we can't even get a low Earth orbit or in, you know, 200 miles from the Earth, and then there's massive radiation belts. We have to figure that out. This is 50 years after six moon land? They, they, they can't go 200 miles off the Earth. But 50 years ago, they went. 500,000 miles round trip, six times. You know, $19 billion. They fleeced from the American public. $19 billion. Actually, Japanese and Indian spacecraft are going around the moon right now, according to what you hear. Yeah, and these are you know, private government owned organizations. 550 astronauts have been in space. 94% or something like that. Freemasons. It's a secret society. It's a fact Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, the first men on the moon. You know, 33 degree Masons. This is a fact. And a secret society keeps secrets. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You heard of this guy? Also a Mason. He's sort of the go to guy of the modern scientific world. They asked him about the, the shape of the Earth. Because you can see Polaris from the, from the southern hemisphere. You can see the North Star 
from the southern hemisphere. So if the world is a globe, you can't see it. You're on the bottom of the equator. How do you see Polaris? So he said, you know what? The Earth, because it's spinning, it's like pizza dough. This is what he's actually saying. This is their guy. This is NASA's guy. Because it's spinning, it's like pizza dough. It eventually flattens out. right? And then, oh, it's actually pear-shaped. So the bottom is actually fatter. So this is the Earth like that. So if you're below the equator, you can see Polaris. So according to the opinion of Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's their scientist, eventually the Earth will be totally flat, eventually. It's like pizza dough, apparently. This is what he's saying. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, so, a lot of, there's definitely a lot of interest in this. There's a lot of people that are when there is a big earthquake, actually you can see the waves in the earth of the crust. So actually it does happen. But earth behaves like a fluid. Like a fluid? Yes, when there is a huge earthquake, you actually can see the waves. Yeah, the wave, yeah, because the tectonics, the plates have shifted, so it creates a tsunami. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the earth is, the earth is round. So that's the main issue is curvature. So if, if you're living on a spherical Earth, let's say this is the Earth, right? This is a helicopter. And you start to rise. As you go up, the horizon will stay low, right? Because it, it's going away from you. It's falling off the horizon, right? If you're going straight up, the horizon does not rise with you. It stays, and you have to keep looking down at it. So if you're at 38,000 feet, you have to look down at the horizon, right? But if the Earth is a plane, a flat plane, and you get inside of an airplane, that's why they call it an airplane, by the way, because it flies over a plane. You sit in an airplane, and you're in the middle row. You just turn your head like this, and there's a horizon. It's right there at your eyes, both sides, as if you're down on the Earth. If you get into a weather balloon and go to 121,000 feet, it's right in front of you, the horizon. So for many, this is a definitive proof that it's a flat plane. This is the proof that the view is. Many experiments are done. We, don't, we never heard of some of these people because they're not, you know, Samuel Robotham, right? And we, we know Kepler and Galileo. We haven't heard of these other guys who conducted an experiment in a river six miles long. So something six miles long is 16 feet of curvature. So something six miles away in a standing body of water, it's six miles away and it's 16 feet high, you cannot see it, according to the globular model. It would have curved away from you. But he looked at it completely through his telescope. The whole thing was there. Many experiments like this. So, again, I'm not saying that Earth is a long island, I don't know. It's, uh, we have to be about our business, right? But the thing is, for a lot of people, if geocentrism is correct, and we are unique and everything's going around us, and suddenly God becomes very important. Who did this? Who, who put us on this pedestal? Why did he do it? How do we thank him for it? Oh, we're just monkeys, right? We're monkeys on some back of NASA just said, we found seven new planets. They're just like Earth. Sure, they did it. I don't think so. I don't know. Anyway, we're out of time. Um, but, uh, again, it's, uh, and there's other things in the part on embryology, you know, I love, you know, something that clings to the utero wall, which is impossible for someone to have known that on a microscope. Quran apparently talks about fingerprints, they're called banan, that Allah will resurrect even the tips of the fingers, which is sort of like your identity card, as it were. The origin of all life is water. There's other ayat that people look at. But we have to stop doing it over time. But I'd love to talk more about this book. This is what's happening right now in, in the world. <laughs>
the event for the class. Uh, if so, please make sure to go out to me. And uh, um, I'll continue with another class soon. Um, maybe related to this or not. Maybe we can do a Tetsuya class or just looking at Tetsuya or something like that. Uh, the classical lens. Inshallah, we can read some Tsuwaro from the study format. It's a good text to have, it's a good text to study, to study with.